So for a bit of background, I am from Spain with family from Italy. This story is 100% true. My dad, my brother, and I are all familiar with camping and nature and all that stuff. We don't get scared easily, and we aren't really superstitious or whatever. This happened in 2010, I believe. I was 8 years old then, and we were on summer vacation in Italy, in the region of Tuscany, where some of our family is from. We were hiking in the country, far away from any towns or any other form of big civilization. We were not very familiar with this route, though. All of a sudden, we stumble across what looks like an abandoned Tuscan farmhouse. Not very big, though. We all look around and yell, asking whether there was someone. It looked very abandoned. The door was missing, plants growing all over the place. Safe to say, no one lived there. So, since we love adventure, and it didn't seem like a bad plan to do with two children, we decide to take a look at the place. As we're going to enter the house, out of nowhere comes a barn owl flying out of the house. So we had a quick scare, but nothing too bad. It's just an owl, right? We enter the house, and we just find the typical stuff you would imagine to find when you're in an abandoned house. Cutlery and plates on the ground, a candle, some old paintings, nothing really valuable though. We see an old wooden ladder that leads up to a hole in the ceiling. It was not a very big hole. My father couldn't fit, and so since I was the oldest of the two kids, I would go up and tell them what I saw upstairs. I went up the ladder and was in a room where I could barely see because the windows were covered with wooden boards. I could make out some things by a few sun rays that would get in through the gaps. I could see graffiti signs, and I saw another room, so I told my father and brother that I would advance and see what was up. As I opened the rotten wooden door, I immediately stood still. A disgusting, rotten smell penetrated my nose. I almost had to throw up. I wanted to know what caused this bad smell. Then, in the corner of the room, I could make out a silhouette. I got closer to investigate what it could be, and I could barely make out that it was the lifeless body of a dog. A big dog. And, spicy detail. The body was skinned. No fur. Nothing. Just pure, rotting flesh in the shape of a big dog. I don't remember how long I just stood there, frozen. But I woke up from my shock with the screams of my brother. Because apparently the barn owl had gotten back inside the house. And it almost hit him. So my dad yelled at me to come back. And I gladly obeyed. When I got back downstairs, I told him what I had seen, and the look he gave me was that of a man who is scared shitless, but doesn't want to admit it in order to not scare his young kids. He just got close to my ear and whispered to run. We ran out of that place and never got back or even close to the route leading to it. I was hiking in the Catskills. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I come up to the Catskills fairly regularly throughout the year because sometimes the Poconos just get a little boring. I started at the trailhead parking lot where I parked my car and began walking up the same trail that I've walked up a thousand times. About an hour later, I started to feel kind of weird. It felt like the woods were a little bit quieter than they usually were when I'd come up here before, but I wasn't initially very concerned about it. After I sat down to have breakfast, I started hearing rustling above me, and some sticks fell right down behind me. I wasn't really worried about this either, as I just assumed it was some squirrels running around or some chipmunks throwing things at me. This has happened to me before. I finished my breakfast without incident and kept walking towards the summit. This was fairly early in the morning, so I would think there would be a lot of birds chirping and a lot of other activity, but things just kept getting quieter and quieter as I ascended. 
This definitely creeped me out, but I tried to push it out of my mind because I've already been hiking for a while at this point, and I'm definitely not turning around. Eventually, more sticks fell to my right, somewhat close to me, and they sounded heavier. These were not the kind of small twigs that would generally fall from squirrel activity. I went over and checked them, and these were fairly substantial. This continued to happen in a higher frequency until I finally reached the end of the trail. On my way back, it happened continuously, increasing in frequency as I descended, until suddenly it just kind of stopped when I was about a mile from the car. When I finally returned to my car, I found all of the doors open, and it seemed like a lot of my stuff had been violently rummaged through. I had a bag in there with some of my clothes in it, and this had been torn up. A lot of my clothes were outside of the car, leading back into the woods. I thought about calling the police, but I live in Philadelphia, so I knew there wasn't really anything that was going to happen. To this day, I still get freaked out when I think about it. I don't necessarily think it was connected, but I do feel really uneasy about both of these things happening at the same time. Then again, maybe I was just robbed. This story happened recently. And for some context, me and my friends are teens that like to explore and do stupid stuff, like normal teenagers do. We found this tunnel that was a drain under a busy road. We had to crouch and sit on our skateboards to explore it, since the height of the tunnel was short. As we were going deeper into the tunnel, it gets pitch black and the flashlights from our phones can only reach about five feet in front of us, so we were blind to what we could come across until we were very close to it. In the tunnel, I remember the wall was painted in all red and had sheets of metal with white handprints connected to clothespins. We decided to keep going until we reached what we thought was a dead end. It was not. On the left was a more square tunnel compared to the rectangle shape we were in. In the distance of the connected tunnel, there was a bright light coming from the outside shining from above onto a red shopping cart with belongings in it. We slowly inched towards the light where the shopping cart was. The light turned out to be a big hole in the ground that we could crawl out of if we needed an escape. As we were about to pass the shopping cart, my friend who was in the lead was too afraid to go forward anymore. It was pitch black five feet from where we were. I decided to take the lead and keep going. I stepped past the shopping cart and stopped. I don't know what it was, but I was afraid. I had a gut feeling something was back there. I slowly moved back. I stopped. I swear I saw something move from the deep dark of the tunnel. Before I could put everything together, a loud echo of someone pounding an object on the walls of the tunnel struck me back, causing everybody to freak out and crawl out of the escape hole. Once we got out, a homeless man ran to us asking what we were doing in there. We told him we were just exploring. He explained to us that there's a man that lives underground in that tunnel, and he would have killed us if we went further. The man was apparently crazy and threw a rock at the poor guy's head before. Luckily nobody was hurt, but even though it was scary and dangerous, it was fun. And I'm glad... I experienced it. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now, for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, 
and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place slash park with flashlights we had on our persons. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door, leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not fond of the idea but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building, but we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, in front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assume was blood and torn beige pants. He did not have any socks on, and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast, he said. Each word with varying inflection and energy. 
This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it, and just before we did, I could see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door, catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sicknesses from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy guy, let's not meet. This took place last year at the beginning of summer. I was with my mom headed down to my nana's farm to visit for a weekend. For some context, she lives on a farm way back in the country right at the foot of a mountain in rural South Carolina. It's a very rural, secluded area, so the roads are badly maintained and barely wide enough for two cars to pass one another. The houses are also spread out and set far back into the tree line from the road so there's very little ambient light besides the headlights of a car. So my mom and I are driving along, her in the driver's seat and me in the passengers. It was around 11pm and we're 15 minutes out from Nana's, deep in the woods with the radio down almost to silent. We come onto this straight stretch of the road in a heavily wooded area, and suddenly this blur of a creature darts out across the road, right at the edge of our headlights. It was moving pretty good, but both me and my mom were able to get a good look at it and both agreed on what we saw. It was a fairly large creature, roughly the size of a person or maybe larger. Neither of us could make out the head, but we both remember it appearing to have a segmented body, as if it were emaciated and its ribcage was poking out. The reflection of light made it hard for me to tell color but my mom said she remembered it to be dark and she didn't see fur or hair. It had long limbs and as it moved across the road, it didn't run the way a dog or horse would, with all four legs. The best word to describe it would be lopping, using its front limbs to pull itself along and it was moving considerably fast. We both said something along the lines of, what the hell is that, as it crossed in front of us. As we got up to where it had crossed, I turned to look at it just as it reached the other side of the road and out of our headlights, and I swear on my life, it stood up and ran. Not like a dog rearing on its hind legs, it was definitely bipedal. I immediately yelled that it had stood up and we both started getting nervous. I honestly would have thought I was going insane had I not had another person in the car with me. My mom has always been a pretty level-headed person and not superstitious, but she was very nervous and made me agree to not tell my nana about it to avoid scaring her, which made me recognize how serious this was. I should also mention that there had apparently been a series of attacks on livestock and horses in the area around the time this happened. People were saying they found wire fences ripped through and their animals attacked. There have been a few other strange instances in the area, but that was my personal experience. I 
I wanted to share an experience I had back in the spring of 2018. I have had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11pm at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging on our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. It seemed like there were hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1am. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There weren't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module, but I'm not sure if it's connected. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair stand up on my neck. About five years ago, I was taking a solo motorcycle trip from Utah to Wisconsin and back, two days riding there, two days back, with about a week between. When I left on the very first day, my plan was to get somewhere in Nebraska, grab a hotel room, and continue on the next day. I didn't make any hotel reservations or anything, more of a, I'll figure it out when I'm tired kind of deal. First mistake right there. By the time I was actually tired, Every highway-adjacent hotel I could find was booked full. I guess this was because Sturgis had just ended and people were heading home. This is what one of the desk managers at one hotel claimed, so who knows. To give you an idea, I was just barely over the Wyoming-Nebraska border when I got tired. I had waited out a storm in Wyoming for a few hours. Going on about 1.30am, I'm still riding through Nebraska just taking every exit with a hotel to find an open one and stopping at a bunch of gas stations to stay awake. It was really only me and semi-trucks on the road. I leave a fairly large truck stop at the same time as some car that I wasn't really paying attention to. We both got on the highway, the car behind me. I get up to cruising speed, right around 7 over the speed limit, and this car just stays behind me. Cut to about 20 miles later, this car is still behind me, but uncomfortably close. Had I needed to hit the brakes for anything major, deer running across the road for example, he'd hit me for sure. So I let off the gas, figuring he'll just go around me and go on his way. No dice. I slowed all the way down to about 60 miles per hour, and he just held it there for a while. He stayed right behind me. At this point, I wasn't really sure what to do about it, so I just sped back up to highway speed and kept going. It was at this time I figured he might just be a cop. Being as nervous as I was, I really wanted to find out. I decided I could afford a speeding ticket, so I got up to about 12 to 15 over the limit for a few miles. Still nothing. Just a car staying right behind me maybe 50 feet back on a more or less deserted highway. We were still passing the occasional truck. Some time later, I'm down to about a half a tank, and at almost 3 a.m., I decide that at the next gas station, I'll take a long break. I see a sign for gas and take the exit. 
Guys, this gas station, no joke, has two pumps and one overhead light. It's like straight out of a horror movie. The car followed me to the gas station. I noped out of there back to the highway. Less than a quarter of a mile. That car followed me the whole time, into the parking lot and then right back out. The next gas station wasn't too far away, maybe 10 to 15 miles. A big truck stop type of deal. The car follows me off the exit and goes around to the other side of the main building somewhere. I stop there anyway, go into the small diner, and sit in a spot on the other side of the window as my bike. I grab a bit of food. I call ahead to the next few hotels available, and luckily one had a room. I reserved it, went back out to the bike, and went on toward the highway. No car in sight. I got to the hotel around 4am with no other problems and finally got some sleep. I still have absolutely no idea who was in the car or what they were doing, but it sure had freaked me out. This just happened. So my boyfriend and I are currently hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in California. It's extremely common to get hitches along the trail, and most people who live in towns bordering the trail are fairly kind, self-seeming folk. Emphasis on seeming. Well, today, we found ourselves a bit lost after trying to take a less traveled alternative trail. After lots of struggling and practically bushwhacking, we made our way down the hill and ended up accidentally on someone's property. This property is big. It's a large ranch with a few different buildings. We tried to skedaddle as fast as possible off the property, but one of the ranch dogs saw us and the owner came up in a golf cart. I explained that we accidentally got lost hiking and apologized, and he said it happens often and he was really understanding. He asked if we wanted a ride into town since he was about to leave anyway. Given how common hitchhiking is on trail and how nice he was, we accepted and he drove us to town. On the ride there, he told us he used to be in the DEA and had participated in more shootouts than people fighting in the army. Weird, but okay. I didn't think much of it. I noticed my boyfriend was really quiet though and I thought it was odd. As soon as we hop out of the car, my boyfriend grabs our backpacks and tells me to check my phone. He had sent me an article about the guy we just got a ride from and how this guy was involved in his girlfriend's disappearance and his suspicious death on the ranch property not too long after. Apparently, his girlfriend went missing after signing property transfers of her ranch over to him. She was never found and the suspicious death on the ranch was a worker who got killed by an ATV. But toxicology showed a meth overdose. Given his DEA background, I found that part specifically suspicious. Also, he's on the sex offender registry for groping two women on a snowmobile tour. My boyfriend and I are 100% okay, but we're just shaken up that we got a hitch from a possible murderer. Be careful who you get hitches from, even if they're friendly. I came here hoping anyone could share similar experiences or give insight. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, USA. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased, but I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late, and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too, 
The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair, looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. I told him I felt the same, and we ran inside. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we still wanted to be outside and relax. It didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions, maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. This happened years ago when I was around the age of 19 or 20 and worked retail part-time at the mall. I was the closing shift that night and left around 10.30pm to head home. I often took the inside streets versus the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty, especially during that time of night. This particular night, I noticed a car about 10 minutes into my 30-minute drive going the same way as me, but I didn't think much of it. As we're approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at that time, the driver behind me starts flashing their high beams and slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panic that they might hit my car. Eventually the car pulls up beside me, and I can now see a middle-aged man who's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning for me to roll down my window. I roll my window down about halfway, and he says something about how my tire looks like it's flattening, and I'm going to damage the rim if I don't pull over soon. I tell him I don't know how to change a tire, but I'm not too far from home so I should be fine. But he's pretty insistent about how it will only take a few minutes, and he's happy to help. I know something is off, because my car seems to be driving fine. I politely say I'm fine, but thanks anyway and I roll my window up. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't have been more than a minute or two. At this point, something feels so off that I'm afraid to even physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best I can, and eventually he slows down and moves behind me again. After a few minutes, we reach a more populated, well-lit part of town, and I see him make a U-turn. I get home and take a look, and my tire is perfectly fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall or what that man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning, and the tire pressure on them was in the normal range. I still think of this night from time to time, and it makes me nauseous to think about how differently things might be today if I had decided to pull over that night. I was working night shift in a gas station slash truck stop in Tucumcari, New Mexico back in the mid-90s. I had another guy working with me who ran the diesel side while I worked the gas side. We had a guy come in around 1 or 2 a.m. and just looked at stuff in the aisles for a while before he left. I didn't really think twice about him. Later, at about 6 a.m., when I got off, I drove home past a convenience store named Allsup's. They're big in the southwest. There had to have been 30 cop cars in the parking lot. There aren't even 30 cop cars in Tucumcari, so where they came from I have no idea. I come to find out that sometime during the night, the Allsups had been robbed and the clerk had been taken into the cooler, tied up, and beheaded. 
I found that out when I was awoken by the state police a few hours later and asked if I'd seen anything suspicious during the night. That guy who came in and left was the only thing I could think of. The police took a copy of our security footage, which led them to a suspect who was later convicted for the murder. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to go to work the next day. We kind of assumed that the guy was going to rob us first, but didn't want to deal with two clerks. So he left and hid all subs instead. On the first day of moving into my new house back in April of 2015, my neighbor came to introduce himself, and it wasn't long before I deduced that he was in the drug dealing business. I initially thought that wasn't so bad. I like a smoke from time to time, and having him next door could be useful. Even if I went back in time right now to warn myself, there's no way I could convey how wrong I was. Now, 2015 was otherwise known as the worst year of my life. It certainly wasn't what Back to the Future had led me to expect. After losing my dad to cancer, my sister having a miscarriage, and my barbecue exploding on my birthday gathering, I was beginning to think my luck would have to turn soon. It was August, the summer was ending, and nothing bad had happened for two whole months. I'd been up late watching It Follows, and not being much of a horror fan, I was suitably creeped out, and slightly high. My girlfriend had to come home from a late work function and had gone straight to bed, and at about 12.30am, I went up there too. It's probably worth explaining that this house has three floors. The ground floor has an entrance, spare room and stairs. The first floor is the kitchen and living room, and the top floor is the bedroom and bathroom. It's one of three houses in a little muse in a leafy Sussex village. I went to bed and was soon drifting off. About 15 minutes later, I heard some banging. I didn't pay it much mind, assuming that watching a horror movie before bed had made me oversensitive. So I started to go back to sleep. The next memory I have is of shouting, lots of shouting. The bedroom door burst open, and a group of large figures stormed in, brandishing crowbars. I remember screaming in that way you try to in a dream, when nothing comes out. I also recall spinning around slightly so as to block my girlfriend, an incredibly sweet and innocent creature who had barely witnessed a crime in her life. I thrust out my legs, kicking one of them in the crown jewels firmly. This led the ringleader to crack me on the legs with a crowbar, telling me in no uncertain terms to not do that again. So now there are at least four men lined up alongside my side of the bed, Maybe five. It was hard to tell. I didn't put my glasses on. My girlfriend is screaming. They're all shouting and I'm incredibly confused. The ringleader then demands that I give him the bag of money. What money? I asked. Give us the fucking bag of money. We know you've got the bag of money. The ringleader repeats several times. I don't have a bag of money, I explained. It's hard to remember the order of events but I do know one thing for sure. Tom Cruise popped into my head. The previous night, I was watching Mission Impossible 3. I do like that film, and I had it on in the background while I was doing the washing up. I remember pondering the scene where Ethan Hunt's wife has a gun to her head. I want to give you what you want, but you've got to do what's right, exclaimed Hunt. Huh. I wonder if the screenwriter had researched this dialogue. Is this what you're supposed to say in a hostage crisis? Well, it apparently so to seed, because I found myself repeating those words. I don't have a bag of money. I want to get you what you want, but you have to do what's right and leave this poor girl alone. Are the words that came, strangely confidently, out of my mouth? Yeah, well we know you sold drugs to my daughter, said the one I considered to be the sidekick. Nah, nah, nah. It was my sister, said the ringleader in correction. This exchange told me two things. One, 
they did not have a particularly good grasp of what their plan was, and two, they were after my neighbor. For my neighbor is a drug dealing maniac, a weird guy from Essex. He's in his mid thirties, about five foot eight, with light blonde hair and eyebrows to match. He's skinny and zany, usually hopping from one foot to the other as he tries to keep his excessive energy in check. He smokes weed from 7 a.m. and boxes on his outdoor punch bag whenever the weed isn't enough to keep his energy in check. Sometimes he can be seen in the communal car park making things, or he juggles balls with his dogs, or he shadow boxes. You know, the usual things you expect to see your neighbor doing at literally any hour of the day or night. Still, realizing that the intruders were in the wrong house, I wasn't entirely keen on sending them next door. As much as I disliked my neighbor, I didn't think he deserved a group of masked men storming in, so I continued to try and talk these people out of my house. I'm not a drug dealer, so I've no idea what you're talking about. There's a couple of MacBooks downstairs, 60 quid in my wallet, an iMac, whatever you want, just take it and go, mate. Hearing this offer, the ringleader realized I was being compliant, and if I was willing to give up a few grand's worth of computers, why wouldn't I just give him the bag of money he was seeking? Slowly, the cocks turned. Is this number 27? He demanded to know. The whole area is... Yeah, but is this number 2, 27 Acacia Avenue? No, it's number 1, I replied. We've got the wrong house, he exclaimed. The realization was startling. They all shouted. One guy had been searching every room, cupboard and drawer. He'd already given up. One or two of the others went downstairs to get him, leaving me and my girlfriend with the ringleader and his sidekick. The guy I suspected was far darker in soul than the guy doing all the talking. Right. You can't call the cops or we'll come back. We know where you live, the sidekick said. Emboldened by the realization that these guys were morons, I laughed. You seriously think I won't call the cops? Best I can do is give you a 30 second head start. He didn't like that so he took my phone. Good, I thought. I'll track that fuck. Sadly, I later discovered he threw it behind my sofa on his way out of the house. The ringleader then apologized. He said they were looking for someone else and there had been a mix-up. I said something along the lines of, well, I'm glad we sorted that out. At which point he shook my hand, told me he hoped my girlfriend would be okay and forced the sidekick to leave with him. I picked up the bed and jammed it against the door, and enveloped my traumatized girlfriend in a big hug, and told her it was over, which it almost was. Little did we know, the morons had decided to try again, this time knocking my neighbor's door in and storming his house, but he was in the kitchen, so they went flying past him, then up to the bedroom where they found his girlfriend, my neighbor, being the type of guy he is, then jumped out of the window, abandoned his girlfriend, ran to my front door and stormed into my home. Chris, Chris, there are people in my house, he screamed. No shit, I responded. Why do you think my fucking door is wide open? I went out to meet him while talking to the police on my girlfriend's phone. He grabbed a knife from my kitchen, the phone from my hand, and then went after them. I decided I was done. I went back to enjoy the barricade of the bedroom. It took the police a while to turn up, because the genius neighbor of mine told them they had guns, so we had to wait for armed response. Eventually, my girlfriend and I cautiously walked down to the living room. The police eventually arrived, but they knew it was too late so they stood outside our houses having a chat and a bit of a laugh. It's likely to be the only time I tell four men with machine guns to shut the fuck up. The rest of the night was a mess of police as they took statements, searched for evidence and quizzed my neighbor about, yes, the bag of money. They were convinced they could bust him for something as they had wanted to for some time. 
Turns out he'd broken his foot when he leapt out from the window, and so he was carted off in an ambulance. As the stretcher went past me in the car park, he tried to talk to me. Chris, I just want to say one thing, mate. I just want to say one thing, he screamed. You're not physically capable of saying just one thing, I told him. The police, who knew him all too well, erupted in laughter. This humiliation would haunt him for some time. Eventually I heard that my neighbor had claimed it was because of an Instagram picture he'd posted on Facebook, and he thought he knew the ringleader, a scumbag he'd recently connected with on Facebook. He gave the police two weeks to charge the guy. To the credit of the police, they arrested him but didn't have the evidence to charge him. About a month later, my neighbor beckoned me into his garage, where he remonstrated with me for blaming him for the ordeal. They terrorized us too, he said. He then told me he'd taken matters into his own hands, dealing with the ringleader himself, putting him in some sort of box and, I presume, torturing him. He tried to show me some sort of video evidence, but I refused to look at it. We have to look after our women, he said. He then said that he was aware I had reacted like a coward when the guys got into my room. A bit bemused by this, I asked him if it was more gutless to scream or to jump out of a window and leave my partner behind. This enraged him, and we haven't spoken a single word to each other since. The only stuff that was stolen was money from our wallets and my Leatherman. Nobody was ever charged with the break-in, and eventually life went back to normal albeit with a very expensive new front door. I moved house this year, so I can only hope I never have to see my neighbor's face again. I know some people find this story entirely unbelievable, but it would appear I've got backup on that front, as one of the responding officers is on Reddit and confirmed the story's validity on my post. The police called it a scum-on-scum -scum attack, and when those inadvertently mess with innocent bystanders, the scumbags are usually apologetic. They even said, don't be surprised if you get an anonymous bunch of flowers. We didn't, but judging by some of the messages I've received on Reddit, it really is something that happens. So I'm going to tell you the story of my brief encounter with a man called Happy. In 2003, I was working at a cannabis dispensary in Venice Beach, a block from the boardwalk. A good 35% of our patrons were unhoused people. Occasionally someone experiencing severe psychosis would try to come in, but if they were screaming or unintelligible, security would not let them in. If they had, and presented the holy trinity of medical papers, ID, and cash, then we were good to go. We had a compassion program, where we'd bag up grams of shake left over from the bottom of jars and give them completely free. One per person per day to anyone who asked. Word about this spread quickly on the boardwalk. Generally these people would be the nicest, most polite and considerate customers, even if they did smell a bit stinky and their money got pulled out of a sweaty sock. No one working there would bat an eye if someone came in smelling like they'd slept on the beach for a week next to a bottle of vodka, as long as they just calmly buy their weed and be on their way like any other customer. It's a foggy, chilly day around the holidays, sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Someone called out, so I was the only person in the back, bud tending. There was another employee at reception and the security guard at the front door. I'm alone in the back room. There are cameras, but no one is actively watching them. This guy walks in after being checked in at the front. He's the only customer at the moment, and I swear, the whole room gets colder as he walks in. He's wearing a very worn in, deep faded, wrinkled, conformed to his body, floor length leather duster jacket and similarly beaten up wide-brimmed leather cowboy hat. It looked like he'd lived and slept in the same clothes for years. 
We did not allow hats, hoods, or sunglasses in the store, so I'm surprised that security didn't make him take off his hat. This man is at least six foot five and built like a boulder. Not obese kind of large, pick you up and toss you like a ragdoll large. The stench that comes with him is unlike anything I've ever smelt before or since. It was beyond B.O., beyond piss or anything else. It smelled like actual death, as if he had a raw, rotting carcass tucked under his thick, long leather coat. I thought I'd been hardened by plenty of nasty body stink before, but this was absolutely revolting, far beyond anyone who hadn't showered lately or pissed their pants. I'm trying not to inhale very deeply, and I say, Hi sir, excuse me, I'm sorry, would you mind taking off your hat? It's just store policy. Big customer service smile, I ask. What are you looking for today? He grunts deeply. He's walking very slow, shuffling and dragging his feet. His voice sounds like he gargles with gravel, rough and wet, raw and angry. I don't take off my hat. At this point, I'm not trying to argue with this man about his hat either. Let's just get him in and out. I glance down and see he's not wearing any shoes. The bit I can see from under his coat one of his ankles is massively purple and black and swollen, melon-sized. The bottoms of both of his feet are bloody and torn up. I realize he's leaving a slight trail of blood as he drags his ragged feet across the concrete floor of the shop. My first thought is how and why the fuck did security let this guy come in? Second is, this guy is obviously seriously injured and that is concerning as a human being. I'm making sure to keep the display shelf between me and this guy, but that's only about a foot of space, like a bar. He gets to me, and the stench gets stronger. I meekly but sincerely ask, Are you alright, sir? His eyes flare at me. What do you care? And I'm like, Well, I tried. Not my chair, not my problem. Great, what can I get for you? I ask. He pulls up one of his sleeves to expose his forearm. It's covered in large round burns, like from a cigar. Some old, healed, and some fresh, pussy and infected. They're not track marks, they're burns. He also has a jagged, homemade looking stick and poke tattoo of a smiley face, a crooked circle, two lines for the eyes, and scabbed up curve of a smile. He points at this tattoo. Happy. My name is Happy. The rotting stink was so strong, I needed to breathe in little gasps. The least possible. I walked here. I walked all the way here from Pasadena. Well, sir, that's a very long walk, I say. Anyway, what are you looking for today? Just for you. His eyes are dark and menacing. He's smeared with a layer of grime, like he lives in the woods dirty. He doesn't look like the average crust punk or disabled veteran you generally see living on the beach. It was hard to guess his age, but he wasn't that old or young, somewhere between 30 and 50. He looked like he dragged himself here from his log cabin, like what would happen if you entangled some quantum mechanics poorly and mixed Ed Gein with an 1800s homesteader then transported him to 2013 Venice Beach. I, of course, had never seen this man before. Once was more than enough to make him unforgettable. He keeps staring at me, and I move as far back as I can to the wall, hopefully out of his grasp if he lunged. I would need to walk out from behind the case and around him to get to the security guard. I'm weighing my options. I decide to grab a bunch of compassion grams and then weigh out an eighth and mark it down that I'd pay for it later. And he's just leering at me, wheezing, heavy, stinking breaths. We actually have a special today, only for people who've walked more than ten miles to get here. This is all for you, on the house. Thank you for stopping by. He accepts the bag, but continues to just stand there and stare at me. Thank you happy, I say. 
It worked. He grunts a guttural noise that's not a word, and slowly turns to shuffle back towards the door. At the door, he turns back towards me and says, I'll see you later. He finally walks out, leaving plenty of his residual stench of death behind. Thank any and all of the gods, I did not see happy later, or ever again. When I asked security why the fuck did they let him in, he said that when he had noticed his bloody feet and said, Hey bro, you all good? That looks like it hurts. Happy had stepped up to his face and threatened to choke him out and threw in some racial slurs too. And since it was just him and two 22-year-old 130-pound girls, he wasn't trying to die tonight and figured hopefully Happy could just get his stuff and leave. He was watching the cameras in the back, ready to call the police and owners if anything got weird. Apparently we had different definitions of weird, but I understood his reaction and ultimately we're all fine, just spooked and creeped out. And now needing to clean the blood off the floor with bleach and gloves, and texting our boss that he owed us free weed about it, he agreed, and we all lived happily ever after. Really not the way I wanted to spend my Saturday morning, but sadly here we are. I'm writing this as I sit down, more scared and anxious than I ever have been, beyond belief. I'm a female who was at my friend's flat. We were with her sister and also another female friend. Lots of good vibes and laughs, just normal girly time. At some point, uh, a trusted nice guy and a bit of a simp but someone we wouldn't feel uncomfortable around, arrived. Women know what I mean, especially about the nice best friend to girl guy. Anyway, he was very approachable at first, very polite and sweet, but I was always told never to trust anyone who is nice on first appearance. It's usually overcompensation for something, or to hide something evidently darker, as I found out later on. He slowly became more argumentative and had a very patronizing, condescending tone, which would rise for no reason. He acted like he was being completely normal, despite being passive-aggressive. It was a quick turn. Moving on, he attempted to take my water bottle and insisted to everyone for no reason when I took it back out of his pocket, which is weird anyway. Who put someone else's Evian bottle in their pocket? He then insisted it was his, and that he brought it with him, and genuinely seemed to believe it was his. This was when I got a weird gut feeling something was just not quite right. We then proceeded to have a back and forth. Nothing harsh said, but I told him he thinks he's the smartest person in the room, and I could see right through him. Quite an assumption to make about someone, but as a human we can sense danger. Then, to top this already slightly alarming experience, he started pulling very vulgar sex faces and hand motions, not even in a jokey way between friends. He did it every time he got the chance. He was pretending to do some weird sex motion. Needless to say, I was very disgusted, as I barely even knew him, and it wasn't in a badger type way where it was laughed off as a little one-off, but he repeatedly did it. He did this to me as no one was looking, and stood slightly behind my friend who was talking, so he could make these ugly gestures to me. He kept asking me to come back to his, and told me he wants to take me abroad, as he needs someone to look after him when drunk. I told him I'm not a babysitter in a bit of a joke way, and he straight away went very stiff and defensive. Slightest things seemed to trigger him. After being in a high alert, abusive situation for many years, sadly you recognize even more so that something in the air just isn't right. Even if you're not 100% of your gut feeling, always follow it, because it's there for a reason. There's absolutely no need for taking chances. Sadly, this world is too unkind. Anyway, my friend had gone to bed. My friend's sister was getting ready to leave but I was very reluctant to be left alone with him for obvious reasons. 
she ordered a taxi and asked him to walk her out to it. He agreed, and I told him very bluntly I'm locking him out, and his immediate response in a very nonchalant manner was, yeah, I would. That for some reason was what made me double down wholeheartedly on making sure I locked him out. Despite my friends maybe getting upset I've locked another friend out, I wasn't too concerned about what they would say, as I knew in my heart this man had ill intentions. I got the vibe he was pre-warning me, a bit like an animal playing with his food before eating. He was enjoying being weird and making me uncomfortable. As he walked out the door with my friend, I immediately locked the door. And thank you, God and Jesus above, that I locked the door, as usually I would forget. But in this instance, I am forever grateful I turned the lock. Thinking I was free of this weird creep, I heard talking at the door, and someone trying to slightly push it open. I told him I was feeling scared and don't feel comfortable at all in his presence. I called him a weirdo and a creep, and his response was, I'm not that weird. But he said it in an inquisitive way, like he was trying to convince himself and not at any point did he take offense to my dramatic accusations and labels. I told him he had suppressed sexual urges, and that he won't be taking them out on me. He then proceeded to say, Oh, but not in a cute way. It was in a very apathetic, weird tone. Even in these interactions, I was panicking more, because instead of just thinking he was a run-around normal creep, I was digging into something much weirder and darker. He proceeded to attempt to open the door again, begging just to talk to me for two minutes, and weirdly enough, I couldn't make out if it was actually him through the door, as I had bad eyes, but I knew it was him, obviously due to the conversation we had. He stood outside for 15 minutes, pretending to book a taxi, and he kept repeating that our mutual friend was gone. He then left, and I was on high alert. I was standing by the door, and out of nowhere, I saw a white guy. The original guy was not white, so I noticed it wasn't the same person. He walked straight over to the door and covered the peephole with his thumb. This made my heart literally quiver. I was genuinely scared for my safety in a way that was very unsettling, and I hope no one else feels that fear. But those that know, your heart just sinks in this horrible way. The door was the only thing separating me from this utter evil predator. What made it so weird is that he was attempting to get a friend to come round and that we should all go out to the town. It's weird as no one was dressed for such outings. But looking back, that second guy who came to the door ever so randomly and covered the peephole Looked like he left something on the floor, but I'm obviously not going outside to check, as I panicked so bad, I don't remember if I saw him leave the little hallway or communal entrance, but I'm not sure if he did. I woke my friend to tell her. She could see I was so scared. I told her what happened, and she said she's never had anything like this happen, and how she doesn't know an older white guy saying that she's a 24-year-old Jamaican woman and just doesn't happen to know any middle-aged white guys. It wouldn't have been so scary, but the way he just came right to the door and immediately covered the peephole, it was like he knew someone would be looking through there. I believe maybe this was connected, because what are the odds of this happening so close to each other in about a 10-minute difference and not have some form of connection? Either way, please remember to lock your doors. It saves lives as simple as it is. If that door had opened when he attempted, due to being unlocked, who knows what I would have endured. I've never had anything this creepy happen, and I live in a big city, and I have a slightly unconventional lifestyle, so I have seen it all. People are very dangerous. Please be aware. If you feel something isn't right, it's not.
We've all had bad dates, right? This is the only date I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll start this by saying I don't go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public spaces. I let either family or friends know where I'm going, and I park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway, this date initially suggested we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks. I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that. I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this, but then brought it up a few more times and said if money was an issue, we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose. Anyway, he turns up in a two-door car and goes into the cafe, and I follow behind and introduce myself. After a polite introduction, things begin to get a bit weird. I order a Coke and he says, don't you want a drink? I was going to pop into a bar and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me confused, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again pissed me off. He seemed to disappear and goes to order a cider from the bar, while I get a table. Anyway, we sit down with our drinks, and the date immediately goes on about going back to his place even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I already stated that was not happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating in his place, and I said we don't have to eat, we can just have drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says he has money, but prefers it if we go back to his place. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer, are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me uncannily and says, You don't think I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say of course not, but really I'm relieved this date won't be going any further. My date suddenly says, Are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make much sense. How about we go into my car? But I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back and I'll drop you off back to your car after. In reality, that made less sense than me following in my car and driving home from his house. The fact it was completely illogical made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point. I said, Look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. My date looks shocked, mumbles something about needing the toilet, and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. Massive bullet dodged in my opinion. Also, the fact his car didn't have back doors made it even more sinister. Because imagine if something happened in the car and I couldn't escape. This isn't an entirely too creepy story, but it is one that freaked me out. For context, I live in a university-owned dorm about a mile from main campus, and they have a shuttle service that takes you to and from campus and this particular dorm. I got together with some friends on Labor Day for a barbecue and had a little too much to drink. I was still pretty coherent, but it would be obvious to anyone that I wasn't totally with it. Around 10.30 p.m., my friend walked me to the shuttle stop and waited for me to get on before heading back to her dorm. As I was on the shuttle, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, but there were about four other people on the shuttle, so I assumed I was just being paranoid as well as drunk. However, that changed when I noticed a guy who was in his 20s sitting on the other side of the bus about two seats ahead of me who kept looking at me. I was uncomfortable but ignored it because I would be home and in my dorm soon. The shuttle drops us off and we all get into the elevator, myself first and the guy second. I push the button for my floor 
and he looks but doesn't press a number, which freaks me out. But I'm still hoping for the best and tell myself he just lives on the same floor. Of course, the other two people in the elevator get off before myself and this guy, and my dorm is the last room on my floor. We both get off on my floor, and I start walking. I look back, and he's deadlocked on me, so I start to panic and walk faster, and so does he. Finally, I pulled my keycard out and practically sprinted to my door as he also began to sprint. I got in and slammed the door behind me and locked it. After giving myself a minute, I look out the peephole and he's sitting across the hall from my door, just staring at my door. He did this for a good seven to ten minutes before muttering something to himself and leaving. I ended up calling one of my male friends to come over to my room and make sure he wasn't still lurking in the hall somewhere. Again, not entirely too creepy or exciting, but definitely scary at night, alone. This happened four years ago after a concert, and yes, full disclosure, I'm a total moron. I lived in a really sketchy town, and the venue was in a moderately safe part of my town, bordering on the less than ideal parts. I'd like to note that this happened around 11pm, and so all the public transit was out of service for the night. We also did not drive downtown. I was with my boyfriend at the time, Marvin. Neither of us really wanted to download the Uber app, so he decided he wanted to call a taxi for some ungodly reason. I was tired and didn't question him. I remember him explicitly telling the guy on the phone we wanted to pay with card, so they said it would be about 15 to 20 minutes for them to arrive. We waited about a half hour, and then a taxi with the same logo of the company we called shows up. Marvin asks if the driver is ours, and he says, yeah, get in, and we followed suit. We explained to him that we're only able to pay with card because neither of us carry cash. The driver seemed pissed off and told us he'd drive us to an ATM. We explained that we talked to the company over the phone and told them we'd only be paying with card. He told us it was too late because the meter was already running and he wouldn't let us out. I started freaking out, especially when he drove the opposite direction he was supposed to. I kindly let him know he was going the wrong way since he seemed to have no idea where he was going. He kept asking me where I lived and what exit he should get off of, and when I offered to route him, he got angry and ignored me. I tried to get his information, but he didn't have his taxi license on display like he was supposed to. I was too afraid to talk back to this guy because he had such a brash demeanor, so I sent my location to my friends and told them what was going on and took a photo of the driver when he wasn't paying attention. Before you say anything, I know I'm an idiot, especially since I have a lot of experience living in the city and taking taxis. Anyway, we finally arrived to my apartment in one piece, but the meter was almost at $30 at this point, so he demands we go to an ATM, even though I wasn't sure if my campus had one, and my boyfriend decided to go look for some reason so I was left with this asshole taxi driver. So, I was just playing on my phone trying to ignore my gnawing anxiety attack. I asked if he'd rolled down the window, and he says, no. The doors were also locked inside, and when he moved up to another parking place, I almost knocked his ass out and ran away, thinking he was trying to kidnap me. But of course, this only gets worse. He starts by asking me pretty general questions and actually isn't an asshole for once. He asks how long I've been in school, what I study, you know, the usual stuff. Then he asks if my boyfriend and I live together. I laugh and just answer, no, since he didn't even live in the same city as me. He asks me if I want to marry my boyfriend, to which I give him a gentle, no. Then he started asking if we were having sex before marriage, 
and I straight up wanted to kill this guy. He proceeded to ask me if I had any experience and how many boyfriends I've had, and he tells me I'm very pretty, along with other highly suggestive questions. Finally, Marvin comes back with money. The fare is almost up to $40, and my boyfriend just gives him two twenties. The driver finally lets me out, but then has the audacity to demand a tip. And of course, my ever so classy ex says, here's your tip, you greedy bastard, and flips him off, and proceeds to cuss him out while I'm literally having a full-blown panic attack. We're both fairly certain that he would have robbed us if we had cash. Also, as a note, we called the taxi place and asked what happened. They said our driver reported that we never showed up. He ended up sitting outside my building for two hours while I was literally freaking out. I'm just glad I live in a high security apartment building. This happened about 10 years ago. I must have been 27. My partner at the time was in a band, and we stayed in this converted garage. It was on a service lane. It's like a street that has businesses down it and the back of houses. My partner had come home very early that morning and gone to bed. His bandmate was living in a bus at the time, which was parked out the front as they stored the gear next to our flat in another garage. I woke up at around 5am hearing screams, mainly from a woman but also very aggressive shouting from a man, saying, I'm going to kill you, and so on. The area we were in is not the nicest, although now the area is very hot property, not far from the beach, boutique shops, that kind of thing, but this was coming from a house that I thought was condemned. Two stories, dilapidated, torn curtains, rotten wood, about five broken down cars out in the front that had been picked apart, Turns out someone was living there. I woke up and went straight to the front door. I saw a man stomping around a parked car on the side of the road, chasing a lady in her pajamas around it, threatening to kill her. She was screaming and crying. Out of instinct, I screamed something like, Oi, what the fuck is going on? I'm calling the cops. They both stopped and looked at me, in my pajamas, standing near my door, barefoot. The man had full leather jacket, pants and boots, half a face tattoo, a tomoko, and even though he was across the street, I could see the whites of his eyes. He was obviously on something and furious. I'm going to kill you, he shouted at me, and motion cutting of his neck with his thumb. When he turned to me, the woman escaped to the abandoned looking house and locked the door. I, being brave, and stupid, replied, Come on then, and grabbed a large plank of 2 by 4 I kept behind the door. I walked outside in my pajamas and leopard print robe with the wood over my shoulder, on the phone to the police. I'm not the smallest woman in the world. I must have been around 80 kilograms and 5 foot 10, but he would have taken me out if he wanted. I think the idea of the police made him second guess. He got the hint and took off down a street. My partner, nor the other bandmate in the bus, got up. I was pretty angry at both of them. I seemed to be the only one who had the balls to do anything about it. Another lady across the road came out also, and we talked about our menfolk not doing anything about it. Anyway, later on that week, a lady came to my house thanking me for helping her niece, that he was some crazy cracked out guy that had fallen in love with her and wouldn't take no for an answer. He had come to her house without invitation, expecting that she would welcome his drunk, cracked out ass with open arms only to get rejected, which threw him into a rage, to which he proceeded to kick and beat her and chase her around the street. About another week later, I was told he was arrested and taken away on my street. He was led away by police, handcuffed with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I was glad to hear it as I was terrified that he would come back when I was alone.
The year is 2018. Three friends and I decided to travel to Bali for about a week, since it was cheap and we had some time, so why not? Our itinerary included sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at a beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience. The country is absolutely beautiful, and the food was amazing. The only issue I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially mushrooms. The streets were filled with druggies dying to sell us their drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. One guy even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two-for-one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off, suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our Lord and Savior. He looked rabid and frantic like he was about to pounce onto me like a dog diagnosed with rabies. I didn't feel too afraid as we were confident that we could handle them, since half of them were not even sober. However, that is only the tip of the iceberg. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. We had an early day the next morning and were exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and it didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which swing inwards, and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock, but it gets the job done, I guess. Everything was going well until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was missing. We looked everywhere for it, but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere. We settled for using a selfie stick, I know, I know. It sounds like a horrible idea, but we didn't have anything else that fit the holes to wedge the door closed. We turned in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything, since we'd already stayed there for six days with no issues. I woke up to strange clicking sounds in the dead of night. I got out of my bed, and I thought that maybe it was one of the guys, so I nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so I decided to investigate the cause of the noise. The ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so I headed towards them feeling extremely confused. Who could be at our doorstep at this time of night, I pondered. I noticed the doors were slightly opened, and the selfie stick was horribly deformed. I took a peek outside, and I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance, and were attempting to push the doors open. I yelled at them, questioning their intentions, as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation, as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day, so there was no reason for him to be there at 3am. The other guy asked if the wooden block belonged to us, as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelled bullshit, as there was absolutely no reason to do that at 3am. I called for my guys, and the three men immediately ran for it. I clue in the guys on the circumstances, and we stayed up until morning came, in case they tried anything funny. We decided to report to the reception about their employee, but the description I gave them were not synonymous with theirs. They told me the housekeepers they hired consisted of only females in their late 30s and 40s. This sent shivers down our spines, as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost, and we got out of the situation safely. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't wake up on that fateful night, as the doors were close to being opened. I was just grateful that it was our last night there. For starters, my parents have always taught me how to be independent. I live 30-ish minutes away from New York City by train, so I was taught not to be afraid of the subway systems. I quickly learned how to find my way around New York City and my town in Jersey via public transportation. 
and was always checking in with my parents whether I was going to practice or a movie with my friends, so it was never a big deal. Anyway, a few weeks prior to the incident, the internet in our house wasn't working, and I needed the computer to finish some research paper. Since the library was closed, my brother took me to this internet cafe a few blocks away from our house. While there, my brother was talking to his friend Charles, and introduced us both. Little did I know, this Charles was about to save my life. Oh, I almost forgot an important detail. This cafe was on the main street of my town, and there was a bus stop a block away from the cafe. A few weekends after meeting Charles, my friends invited me to go bowling in the city. My parents said okay. I was 14, so obviously I had to ask for permission, and I was on my way around noon. We bowled, got pizza, talked about my friend's new puppy. Typical girl things. Everything was fine, until I was making my way back home. 3 p.m. There are delays with the subway system. Instead of waiting it out, I decided I could just take another subway home. It would drop me off at the Newark Penn Station, and I would be one bus ride away from home. No problem. 3.15pm. I'm on the subway, and I notice that this older man is staring at me. It creeps me out, but it's nothing new in New York City. I ignore him. 3.50pm. I arrived at Newark Penn Station, and this man sees me get up to go. He makes eye contact, smiles. He hurries behind me. Mind you, I'm a young, small girl at the time, so I'm an easy target. He's creepy, so I decided to walk fast and get lost in the crowds. Doors open. I speed walk through people. This guy must have had 20-20 vision, because as soon as I arrived at my bus stop, he was right behind me. Around 4pm-ish, I'm sitting next to an elderly-looking lady at the bus stop. The creepy guy is pacing back and forth less than 10 feet away from me. He's looking at me, smiling, pacing the floor. Every part of my young body is saying, Run. Now. He's bad news. But there's nowhere to go. And somehow sitting next to this older lady made me feel safer. I take my phone out to text my mom. It's dead. Wonderful. Thankfully, more people have arrived at this bus stop, and I feel better. There are witnesses around. He can't do anything, but he's still staring and pacing back and forth. 4.15pm. The bus arrives, finally. I quickly get in and sit as close as possible to the driver. I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver what was happening. I was young, scared, naive, and didn't want to burden the driver. Stupid, I know now. My stop is the very last one, so I thought, the creepy guy has to get off the bus before me. There's no way he's going to stay until the end. Many, many bus stops later, this guy is still on the bus. He did this creepy thing. Whenever the bus stopped, he would get up with everyone else, and instead of getting off the bus, he would sit closer and closer to the front. There are fewer and fewer people on the bus, so I realize this guy is getting off whenever I get off the bus. This means, if I get off at my stop, he can follow me home, find out where I live, or maybe I'll never get home. 5pm-ish, there were only two bus stops separating me and my house. This guy... A lady and I are the last ones inside the bus at this point. I decide I'm getting off early because I'm not having this guy know where I live. I get off a bus stop early. He sees me and follows me. I pick up speed. He picks up speed. Fuck it. I run. And now he's running after me. In mid-panic, I remember the cafe. It closes soon. I'm a block away. I run for my life to the cafe, and this guy is right behind me. As I'm approaching the cafe, I see Charles outside, locking up the place. 
He sees me and knows there's something wrong. I guess he sees the fear in my face and this older guy running after young me. I get to him and Charles immediately pushes me inside the cafe and locks the door behind us, therefore locking the creep outside. My heart is pounding. I quickly tell Charles that this random guy's been following me across three towns and that I was scared. He calls the cops. The guy is staring inside the cafe, and I'm staring back at him, protected by the locked, yet clear glass door. I had to remember him. The creepy guy smiles and walks away as if nothing had just happened. Little did I know that Charles' uncle is a cop in our town. A few minutes later, the cops show up. After describing him in vivid details, it takes them minutes to catch this creep still walking down the main street. We later find out that this creepy guy had a warrant out for his arrest for armed robbery, and he had prior accounts of sexual assault. Had it not been for Charles, I don't know what would have happened to me that day. Thanks for saving my life. And no, this did not deter me from public transportation or from exploring the city alone. My parents did freak out and got me mace though. As an adult, I traveled all over the world, sometimes alone. But I'm hyper aware of my surroundings because of what happened at 14. Years back when I was 20, I was walking back to my car from the library in the city. I was on a side street. It was about 10 p.m. I had my backpack on. It was full and I had my laptop in it. So, I'm on a pretty dark street. There are street lights, but they are very far apart, so it gets very dark in between them. I come across this man walking his big pit. He came off as really nice at first, smiled and wanted to chat. I stopped, and we're talking all normal, and I'm asking about his dog. So after 30 seconds or so, he sort of steers us into a dark spot under a tree without the street light. I thought strange, but okay, maybe for his dog. Then he moves so he and his dog are both in front of me, and I'm cornered into the house behind me. I start to get this bad feeling. This whole time he's being friendly and smiling but at certain points he would get serious, almost like he was thinking of his next move, and moving closer, also while fidgeting with his other hand in his pocket. So he's very close to me at this point. I had nowhere to go. My back is against the angled window. I'm literally in the corner, backed on all sides by him and his dog, and the house behind me. So my internal siren is blaring at this point. I'm a very nervous person anyway, but I'm shaking at this point and feel that I'm cornered. It's pitch black under the shade. I decide to spring out from being cornered against the house into the street. He looked surprised, almost like, where'd you go? He begins walking towards me, and as I get to the middle of the street, I took my backpack off one shoulder and grabbed my apple carving knife, and he stopped walking towards me. So I get to a more busy area with people and hop in a cab, and the cab driver notices that I'm shaking. I told him I was just about to get robbed, and asked him to tell the police. Once I got to my car, I drove near where I was, and saw three police SUVs with their sirens on going towards that area. Later on, I heard there were a bunch of robberies that happened in that part of the city. This happened back in 2010 when I was 21. My best friend and I had blown off any sort of responsibility for the whole summer and chose to just party instead. It's probably no surprise that by the end of the summer, we were both evicted and now condemned to our parents' houses until we got our shit together again. One night, we were at my mom's place playing Left for Dead until about 2 a.m., when Cam decided to call a cab and head back to his mom's place. 
He had to use my phone to call the cab company because he forgot to pay his bill. This was also the days before Uber and Lyft, so you'd have to call the station and they'd send a cab. About 15 minutes later, we could see the cab waiting outside and he got in and left. About 10 minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone from the cab company. I knew the number by heart, so I knew it was coming from the central station. When I answered, there was a woman on the line whose voice immediately sent shivers through my body. This is Badger Cab calling for Cameron. His cab has arrived. I was confused and responded with something like, Uh, what? She said, Tell Cameron to come outside. The voice was echoey and distant, like it was an auditory house of mirrors bouncing around a fog-drenched void. I wasn't sure why the voice was creeping me out so much, so I tried pushing it aside and just told her that he already left like ten minutes ago. I glanced out the window and saw a car idling outside on the street. It was parked a bit to the right of my house, so all I could see were the brake lights. I figured dispatch probably sent an extra cab on accident, but the woman responded almost like she didn't hear me the first time. Tell him to come outside, she repeated, but this time with a rigid bite in her tone. He was already picked up, I repeated. There were a few weird noises for a second, like the wind was blowing into the microphone, and then the call dropped. I redialed the number to the cab company, and a man answered. I told him what had just happened and let him know that they must have sent two cabs on accident. I don't have any female cab drivers out tonight, the dispatcher told me. I thought to myself, maybe it was a guy with a high-pitched voice. The dispatcher told me that the driver picked up my friend just fine a while ago and that a cab driver wouldn't be calling through their landline like that anyway. When I told him there was a car idling outside, and reiterated that there was a hundred percent a woman calling, telling my friend to come outside and get in her car. He started getting very creeped out and worried. We both figured that someone had to have spoofed the cab company's phone number. It's pretty easy to do, but that didn't leave us with any comfort. Why was someone spoofing a cab company's phone number and waiting outside their customer's pickup location? How did she even know that Cameron had called for a cab? The dispatcher radioed his driver and made sure he had Cameron and that everything was fine. Then he let me know that he was safe and almost to his destination. The dispatcher and I talked on the phone for a couple of minutes, brainstorming what the fuck could possibly be happening. From his perspective, it's almost like someone is following and trying to lure a customer into their car, which is probably not good for business. After Cam made it to his mom's crib, he called me on the landline there to ask what was going on. The only logical explanation he could think of was that it was this stalker he's been dealing with for several years. He had a restraining order on her because she would follow him, break into his apartment, and wait for him to come home. She would do all sorts of weird, creepy shit like that. I'm not totally convinced that's what was happening though. How would she have known he just called for a cab on my phone? How would she have known where I was living with my mom? If he were leaving my actual place or the place of one of our close friends, then that would be plausible. But we were pretty tucked away on the outskirts of town in a suburb, and my mom has a different last name than I do, so she couldn't have googled it. But it's the most logical explanation either of us could come up with, so it's the one I'm betting on, until someone throws out a better theory. Recently, I was living in a women's shelter, and I'd made some really good friends there. We used to sit at this park across from a temple at night and drink and smoke whatever. We'd be there for hours listening to my music, just having fun and talking about our lives. We were all quite young in the group, early twenties. I should say we were all there due to an unfair amount of trauma in our lives, and we connected through that a lot. One night my friends and I went to a party in the city where we'd been drinking for hours. We weren't tired when it was over, 
So when me and my closest friend there got back to the shelter, we decided to go sit in the park and watch the sunrise and drink a bit more. We're there for a little while, and we suddenly hear R&B and rap music coming from the temple across the street. I might add that we're both mixed black girls, and we were very tipsy, so we thought it would be a strange adventure to go over there to see who was playing my favorite song so loud in the morning. Could it be a potential friend? Or maybe we'd learn about the place. It was a beautiful temple. We walk over and the gates were locked. We were disappointed, but a man comes out to greet us and said we could come in to see the temple. He said it was his music, and he loves that we like the same music. We go in and he shows us around the temple. It's beautiful in the bottom, but we notice a lot of rooms with beds, and he tells us if we ever wanted to rent rooms, we could for unbelievably cheap. We thought, being homeless girls with not much work, that it was an amazing opportunity. Almost too good to be true. At first I felt nothing but positive vibes. He showed us his computer that's playing the music and asks what songs we would want to hear. I get comfortable with this guy. He was funny and we all got along well. Anyway, we're talking about recreational activities. We had some and we offered it to him because he was just so cool and chill. He says he will pack ours with our stuff. That will be important later. I should add that he was constantly complimenting me specifically. My hair, my skin color, and he was saying really forward compliments that made me uncomfortable. He started asking if I liked Asian men, and if I'd ever been with one. He then went on to ask more questions about my sexual preferences and then told us he would give very bad drugs to girls to smoke, and then do stuff with them. Drugs no one should ever do. He said he sees us sitting at the park sometimes through his window. All of that was becoming a pile of red flags. He then said as we were smoking that if we have another friend, we can also take his room because he's moving soon. That was when I got a weird feeling so I decided to ask him why he was leaving if the rent was so cheap. He wouldn't answer, just dodging the question, and my intuition was telling me something was wrong. It's ridiculous it took so long. I asked if I could get some water, and he said to get one out of the fridge. I went out, and there was another guy there, and he was nice and offering me the water, but I decided to get a glass and use the tap. He runs out the room my friend was in and says, No, the one from the fridge. And I say I'm fine with this. He walks me back to the room and I sit back down next to my friend. He then went on to say, I'm moving because I hear people screaming and having orgies at night. Noises banging on my door. Sounds of people being tortured and hurt. And it disturbs my sleep. I was so alarmed. It was almost like it accidentally slipped out what he had just said. I almost thought it was a joke. I asked him if it was nightmares, ghosts, or even real people that are making these noises at night, and he continued to dodge my questions. I asked why on earth he didn't tell us this earlier. We were honestly in disbelief, and he continued to ignore what we were saying and acting strange. I then noticed he had closed the door when I came back in earlier. I started to think we needed to get the hell out of there. He then said, You have to listen to this song. You'll love it. It gets worse. He puts on this terrifying chant or Viking-like song and plays it loud, too loud. And he's chanting this song so loud, we're yelling at him to turn it off, but he doesn't listen. The video is Viking-like people killing others, as we're begging him to turn it off because it's scary, and why would he or anyone like that music? He turns his face to us fast and screams maniacally with his teeth showing, his tongue out, and his eyes wide. It was the most distorted face I've seen in real life. He didn't look human. No sane person would act this way. My fight or flight response isn't really good, so I sat there laughing it off, frozen in fear. My friend, on the other hand, was in fight mode. 
She threatened to beat his ass if he didn't let us out right now. I ran to the door, and he ran at me. So I froze in front of him, and he went to open the door because it was locked. We started running out of the house while he laughs maniacally, speed walking behind us. We bolted out, and mind you, I'm still trying to laugh it off, but it was the beginning of the worst panic attack I've ever experienced. If my friend wasn't there in fight mode, I genuinely don't know what would have happened to us. I know it probably doesn't sound that scary, but this terrified me to my core. The way he changed so quickly, his movements and mannerisms, the way his face just didn't look human anymore, and how naive we were to go in there in the first place, because it seemed like an innocent temple. We didn't get many answers from the situation because we were too scared to go back or cause any problems, which is stupid. We don't know if he was truly troubled or if there were actually people there getting hurt, killed, tortured, or having orgies. It scared me as well to think about the fact he knew we were homeless, vulnerable girls at the time, that he may have lured us in with the music he hears us play. We also were completely tripping balls because he laced our stuff. I don't think I can say on here what my friend believed it was, but it was the worst experience ever. And I highly doubt those girls he spoke about in the beginning were there consensually. For some context, I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car, and the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike, didn't have a profile picture, or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't alarmed at all. I was almost amused, like, oh wow, guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then a full 30 minutes passes, with no driver movement on the app, and at this point, I'm thinking maybe something is glitching out, or the driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option, and they end up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever. Now is when it starts getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was. They're also on a bike, also have no profile picture, and have no prior deliveries as well. And this driver's name was... Laurie. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but there was no response. All this time, I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing some issues, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about canceling the order at this point because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following. Hello, have your food. What's your phone number? I responded right away with, I'm not really comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded with, What's your number? Be there in ten. How old are you? And at this point the alarm bells are going off. I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team, who informs me that the order has been cancelled. I'll be refunded. 
they start taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the information she needs, I'm starting to calm down, thinking this was just some creep or something. And that's when I hear a man's voice at the door. Miss Joanna, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and says, Is that him? We cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open. The metal screen door was closed and locked, but it did allow us to see each other. I got a look at him, and when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with. And at this point, I started asking him to leave because he was making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. He starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting. So basically, I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door, and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that, and back up to the sidewalk. And for a moment, I thought he fucked off, so I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman, so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They told me if he came back to call again and they would send out an officer. I did end up having to call them again and give a full report and description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat, and they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So basically, there was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone has ever experienced anything like this, because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up, and I will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. So, strange Uber Eats driver who asked me for personal information and then proceeded to try and break in, please, let's not meet. I was backpacking with my dog and about 12 miles from the road and trailhead, so pretty far from people, though popular enough that other hikers might be around, though we saw no one all day. About 2am, my dog started this really deep growl and wakes me up. I turn on my headlamp and see his teeth showing and he's right on top of me. I hear heavy footsteps near the tent, maybe a black bear or a moose. I leash my dog so he doesn't tear through the tent, and the footsteps move further away, but keep circling my tent. All of my food and toiletries are hung in a tree in a bear bag. There's nothing in the tent to draw a bear's attention. I clap my hands. Something is still slowly circling. Not something a moose would do, and a bear might if he wanted food, but I've got nothing and a really big dog with me. I decide to step out of the tent with the leash in one hand and bear spray in the other, yelling, Hey bear. The footsteps stop. My dog's nose is in the air telling me to look right, but there's nothing in the light of my headlamp that I can see. I didn't hear anything run off, but it's quiet. I give it five minutes or so, get back in the tent, and it starts up again slowly circling maybe 50 feet from me. Maybe an hour later, I hear the footsteps wander off into the woods. At dawn, 
I take the dog and bear spray, and I start looking for tracks. I find a clear path in the leaves that have been trampled, but no tracks. The dog's nose is on the ground, and I follow his lead, and he follows the loop around our campsite. We finally see a few human footprints. Not shoe tracks, a regular size bare human foot. And we also found that he used the toilet and some toilet paper. Some asshole was wandering around the middle of nowhere, near the tent and circling my tent for an hour or more, and used the bathroom for me to find. In August 2012, five friends and I rented a penthouse and stayed in San Jose del Cabo for a month. On our second day there, we rented a speedboat for a much anticipated wakeboarding excursion. The majority of the ride was fantastic, dolphins and whatnot. We had a blast. We followed the shoreline from San Jose del Cabo to Cabo San Lucas. Midpoint in our trip, we went to flip a U in a harbor close to the Holiday Inn. Then, all hell broke loose. At the apex of our turn, we lost power. This means the front end of our boat was facing the beach, the back was facing the ocean. Now, if you're not familiar with the Mexican undercurrent, it's fast and the water deepens very quickly. The tide pulled us into the waves. With every surge, the water pushed the tail of the boat up while tilting the nose down. And as soon as I noticed that tilt, I knew impending doom was coming. Surely enough, the next push of water tilted the nose far enough down to be caught by the undercurrent, thus throwing me straight up into the air. At this point, the boat hadn't flipped yet. When the receding wave brought the boat back level, gravity returned me to my seat on the boat. I landed on my feet, but felt a shock up my back and an immediate, smashing warmth in my spine. Then bam. I fell forward in between the seats and couldn't feel a fucking thing below my chest. Meanwhile, the boat is on the verge of being flipped vertically. My friend Katie jumps on top of me and holds onto the railing with all of her strength so I don't fly off or get dragged away. Another wave pounds. This time, water slams into the boat, smacking Katie in the back. The force of the water pounds her nose right into the back of my head breaking her nose. When this happened, I think I blacked out for a second. I'm a very strong swimmer, so when I finally felt the boat getting sucked out from under us, I remember thinking, I have to swim as hard as I can or I'm going to die. So I did. A local surfer, Juan, saw it all happen and swam out with his boat and helped me to the shore. My friend lost her wallet. I lost my re-entry visa. I lost my favorite dress in that damned accident, too. I spent the rest of the month and my budget for what would have been fishing, golfing, drinking, stuff with my friends, on food, tequila, hour-long massages, and Mexican over-the-counter pain pills. The doctors there were fantastic. I had a T5-7 to compression injury with bruising in my lumbar. He said I was extremely close to a serious injury. I still feel it five years later. I have PTSD from the accident, for sure. Boats make me sweaty. This happened to me around six years ago. My family owns a flower-slash-produce shop and we travel to farmer's markets sometimes. Most of the family are not well enough to pick in the garden or do heavy loading, so we often hire people for the summers. My uncle hired this guy, Kevin. Kevin was in his late 30s, maybe early 40s. He was down on his luck. He was going through a divorce and needed some extra income. He was very nice. Almost too nice. He was actually camping on our land, because his ex-wife-to-be was to have their house. At this time, I was 16 to 17 years old. 
Well, one day, he found me in an alcove type spot where no one else was around and gave me his card with his personal number in case I wanted to ever hang out. He was very insistent that we should do it that day after work and kept pestering me for my phone number. I was immediately creeped out by this and politely told him we would see just to get him away from me. I immediately told my mom who kind of brushed it off but he gave me off vibes. A few days after this, he didn't show up to work. He was called a few times. After no contact whatsoever, we read in the newspaper a day or two later that he crashed his ex-wife's birthday celebration and tried to kill her. She drove to the nearest police station and he gave chase. Actually crashing into parked police cars in his haste, he's still in prison and I'm just really glad I did not have to hang out with him. Back in 2020, I was living with my ex, and we lived in a shitty apartment. But later that year, he achieved his dream of being a homeowner, and we began the process of moving into the house. Well, one night he came home from work and decided he was done with the apartment and we should pack what we had left and just move into the new house. So we packed up our pets and the rest of our stuff and then moved in. This is where it gets creepy. It was probably about 9pm or so. My ex was inside the new house setting up the internet and I went out to the trunk of the car to get some stuff when I heard a woman screaming and calling a name. At first, I thought she lost her dog, but as she got closer, it sounded more like a kid's name. She was also frantic and then said the words, come to mommy. So that's when it hit me, she had lost her kid. As she finally got into my view, I could see she was a woman with blonde hair. She was carrying a lawn chair and she was crying. At this point, I was making no attempt to conceal myself from the driveway and instead stared straight at her. I expected her to ask me for help since her kid was lost, and that's what I would do, but she didn't. She looked at me for a moment, then kept walking down the street, still crying and calling his name. I ran inside and told my boyfriend what happened. Apparently he could hear her from all the way inside, and he called the police. The cop wasted no time in getting there, but still, she walked fast, and by the time we saw the cop car, we couldn't hear her anymore. I don't know what happened after that. It was a strange welcoming to our new home, and it never happened again. I'm still not sure if she was really missing a kid or was just crazy, but her panic seemed genuine. What really creeps me out is how she didn't ask for my help. She just walked past me like I wasn't there. If you lost your kid, wouldn't you be asking someone to call the police at least? I do wish I knew what happened. Hopefully she got her kid back, or got the help she needed. Growing up, we lived in the projects. Our grandmother lived in the project's area, probably about a mile away from us. My younger brother and I went to take something to her, and then when we were on our way back home, it had started getting dark. We decided to take a shortcut, which meant walking through a dirt road, with a factory on the right and a wooded area on the left. There was almost no light in the area, so imagine an 11-12 to 12 year old boy and his 9-10 to 10 year old brother working up the courage to walk through the darkness to get to the main road. We started off walking quickly to make it through there, and I was pretty much holding my breath the entire time, because I didn't want to make noise. I didn't want whatever was out there to hear us. Finally, we made it out of the wooded dirt road and we turned right onto the sidewalk of the main road. We make it about 10 feet, and suddenly we hear something behind us. I look back, and my brother does too. We see someone come out of the same dirt road we just come out of. We turn around, my heart pounding, and I say to my brother, They're following us. 
We need to hurry up. We still had a way to go to get home, and the only street light that we could see was down the road. I say to my brother while holding his hand, walk faster. We hear the footsteps behind us start picking up speed as we are practically running. Once we notice this, I whisper, we're gonna run. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. Run. And I start running, almost dragging my brother behind me. It's probably all in my head, but I swear I hear the person behind us running too. We run past two cross streets and run up a little hill and make it to the traffic light. We stop and look back quickly. It's so dark, we don't see anything. We still think we're in danger, so we run across the street and have one more street to cross, and the project's area would be in front of us. We run the remainder of the way home. We don't want to be told we can't go anywhere again, so we don't say anything about being frightened and running all the way home. Thinking back to that time, our imaginations probably got the best of us. Or maybe we did escape. We'll never know. Okay, so this happened about 15 years ago. My sister-in-law Rose and her husband Bob had been married for around 17 years. They had two sons, Stuart and Michael. They lived in one of Scotland's new towns. One September day, I got news that Bob had died. It was sudden and totally unexpected. Of course there was the funeral. Then things settled down and we all got on with things. But this is where it gets strange. I was in bed one dark winter's night. They're pitch black dark at that time of year in Scotland, and sometime between 1 and 2 a.m. I woke up. As clear as day, Bob was standing next to the bed, short sleeve checked shirt and all. He often wore these. Anyway, I looked at him and he looked at me and said, I don't want to be here. Then he shrugged his shoulders. He then said, Tell Rose I love her. Tell the boys, too. I never saw him vanish into thin air or anything like that. He simply wasn't there after he said it. I never did tell her or give her the message, because she would have thought I was mad. The thing is, that was the third time something similar had happened. Weird, right? Was it really him, his ghost, or was it my mind playing tricks? For me personally, it was very, very real. This was a couple of years ago. I think I was 19 at the time. I was a cashier in a small grocery store. It was late, about 30 minutes until we closed, and there were only three other employees besides me. I was alone on the front end register, and this younger guy comes in and buys some produce. This guy is the only customer in the entire store, and I have no clue where my co-workers were. He ends up hanging around my register and eats some of his produce while he makes small talk with me. At first, I thought he was kind of funny, just a weird guy, but then he asked me if I had social media. I said no, because I'm not going to give this guy my contact information. He was like, why are you lying, and giggling a bit. I told him I wasn't, and then immediately his face grew stern and he said, why are you fucking lying, Jessica? It made me so uncomfortable. He was so aggressive about it. I just said I wasn't, and then he changed the topic. He started talking about being in a criminal organization in some South American country. I can't recall which, but he talked about smuggling drugs and people. And then he went into detail about how they would chop people's hands and fingers off. By this point, he was back to being giggly. I had an awful gut feeling, and I felt so scared. He kept getting closer and closer to me as he talked, and eventually he was on my side of the register, and I had moved away from where I was originally standing. He kept talking to me for about 30 minutes, and the entire time I was completely alone. No other customers came in, 
and my co-workers were not on the floor. I tried making an excuse to call my manager to come down to me, but he literally told me he was busy and hung up on me. This guy was so creepy and he kept trying to get personal information from me and wouldn't leave me alone. I was so afraid to say anything that would make him notice I was uncomfortable because I don't know what his intentions were or how he would react because he was clearly unstable. Finally, after what felt like forever, my manager came down to close the store and I ran so fast upstairs and just started sobbing because I was so scared. I never saw him again, thank God, but I had a bad gut feeling that his intentions were not good. The way he was trying to corner me, pry for information, and weirdly gloat about violent crime he partakes in. A few years ago, I was finishing up my masters. One night, before a particularly horrid evening class, a friend from school and I decided we would grab some ice cream beforehand to help us get through the class. I picked her up from her apartment, and we went to a cold stone just down the street from the building where our class was. It was a busy, albeit small, strip of shops. We got our ice cream and came out to sit in my car to eat it, as there was nowhere to sit outside. As we're walking back to the car, we hear a man call out from behind us and say, Excuse me, in a somewhat panicked voice. We turn around and it's a man in a suit. He's probably in his 40s. The suit doesn't look like it fits him very well. He had no backpack or laptop bag, and he looks panicked and hurried, but he was clear-eyed and fully aware of his surroundings. He says, Do you girls know where the train station is? I'm supposed to catch this train in 20 minutes. We tell him yes. The train station is about a 10-minute walk from where we were, and we gave him directions. Now, mind you... We're in a very busy area, full of Ubers, and Lyfts, and cabs, and we're in a busy parking lot where tons of people are coming and going. His walk, at a leisurely pace, would be ten minutes, so he's got plenty of time to get over there, and he wasn't out of shape at all. We turn around and start walking to the car again, and he said thanks, and it seemed like the conversation was over. The next thing we know, he's following us to the car, and when we turn around to see if he's still there, he says, Could you girls do me a favor? If I promise to be nothing but an upstanding gentleman, could you take me to the train station so I don't miss my train? Now, a few things don't add up here. This area we are in is known for all types of white-collar business, but everyone has a bag of some sort, especially if they're taking mass transit. Also, he looked out of place in the suit, and the way he asked us for the ride made our red flags go up. Why do you need to preface that you'll promise to be an upstanding gentleman if you are one? While he's asking us about the train station and for the ride, several single men walked to their cars, got in and left, including one of the cars next to ours where we were standing. Why didn't he approach one of them? The whole situation felt off. My friend and I were definitely on the same page, and unlucky for this guy, we're both master students in forensic psychology, so we're about to go to a class where we talk about people, mostly men, luring, assaulting, torturing, and killing people, in attempts for us, the student, to better understand their psychological mindset. So, even more so than the average person, we're going to have our guard up about strangers approaching us. We unsurprisingly told him that sorry, we couldn't help. We had to get to class and that he could grab an Uber, Lyft, or cab pretty quickly, or walk, and we'd hoped he'd make it. Instead of saying thanks and walking off, he hung his head very dramatically in defeat and said, I shouldn't know. If you were my daughter's, I wouldn't have wanted you to give me a ride. And he walked off in the opposite direction of where we told him the train was. 
I often think about this whole scenario. Maybe he was just late, and panicked asked the first people he saw, got nervous about asking us, and therefore asked poorly. But so many red flags piled on, and my friend and I both independently thought the situation was very odd when we talked about it afterwards. If he was up to some shady behavior, the audacity to try for two women at once in a busy parking lot in broad daylight was disturbing to say the least. This story happened to me back when I still lived at my parents' house. I was commuting to college at the time and had three siblings that also lived at home. My brother and two sisters. For some context, we lived on five acres in rural Ohio, surrounded on both sides by woods and farm fields. Additionally, during the week, my dad normally left for work at 2 a.m., so I always felt like it was my job to be the man of the house because he was gone during the times when you would imagine something sketchy happening. However, on this night, because it was a weekend, my dad was home. I woke up to the sound of my brother's voice trying to get my attention. We had separate rooms upstairs, and coming out from our rooms, you could look down over the banister and see our front door. When I woke up, it took a few moments to get out of the haze and realize what was going on. I looked at the clock, and it was around 2.30 a.m., and my brother told me there were two men at our front door. Of course, now this is a real wake-up call. We quietly walk out of my room and peek over to look down at the front door. When we looked down, there was no one at the door, but I noticed my parents off to the side out of view of the glass on the front door. I whispered down to my dad, and he told me there were two guys who'd been talking to each other and knocking on the door. Hearing my dad say this freaked me out even more. I went back into my room and grabbed my pistol, quickly shuffling down the stairs after looking to make sure they weren't at the door. If they had been, they would have easily seen me coming down the stairs as it is in direct view of the door. My brother is right behind me as we head over to where my parents are, whispering to try and find out what is going on. My parents had woken up to our dog barking and come out to see these two men knocking loudly at the door. At this point, we see the men return and they begin knocking again, despite the fact that no one had come to the door and our dog is still actively barking. The fact that they were there at this time, in a location where houses are spread out hundreds of yards, and still knocking while the dog was barking, made the situation even more terrifying. After a couple of minutes, the men walk away, and we all shuffle across the kitchen into the family room to peek out of the windows into our driveway, which is lit up by our outside light. There was a black Cadillac sitting there, but no one was inside from what we could see. Immediately the question was, where did those guys go? They weren't in their car, and they were no longer at the front door. Unfortunately, we figured out the answer when the handles on our back French doors started jiggling. They were actively trying to enter the back of our house, which enters the kitchen. At this point, I just remember my mom frantically saying, David, as pure terror overwhelmed her. At this point, two things happened. Adrenaline filled my body as I prepared my handgun, horrified at the very real possibility that I might have to shoot these men. Secondly, my dad finally grabbed the phone, called the police, and calmly told them what was happening. Thankfully, after a minute of jiggling, they stopped at the back door and disappeared again, only to return knocking at the front door. However, at this point, several minutes had gone by, 
and suddenly we saw the local police fly up in multiple cruisers with their lights on. As they whipped into our driveway and front yard, the two men bolted away, attempting to run the long way around the house across the driveway. One of them disappeared out of our view, but the other one was intercepted by an officer yelling for him to get on the ground. He didn't, and he was immediately tased, and then proceeded to fall on the ground. Some of the officers went around the house after the other guy, and one of them came to talk to my dad and I as we came out the front. They ended up finding the other man hiding in my sister's little playhouse in the backyard. It appears both of them were drunk and or high, as one of them had cocaine on him. While they were both arrested that night, we never did find out what they were charged with or what happened to them. Needless to say, the whole experience wasn't fun. So random men at our door in the middle of the night. Let's not meet again. I used to be a district court prosecutor in my rural county. Sometimes it's stressful, but almost always entertaining. To set the scene, on a normal court day, I would call 40 or so scheduled cases before the judge for things like charges of plea, sentencing, probation, violations, and other matters. With 40 defendants, onlookers, police, court personnel, and a gaggle of lawyers, it was always barely controlled chaos. I always tried to make it as efficient as possible by calling cases that would take the least time first. Occasionally an attorney would whisper in my ear that their client needed to be called quickly. If they didn't abuse the privilege, I would accommodate. Usually their client had health issues, needed to pick up kids, and that kind of thing. The day in question, I was at the start of the docket, and I heard a ruckus through the doors to the hallway. Not common, but also not unheard of. A lawyer comes up and says his client's case needs to be handled right away. No other explanation. Enter the meth addict. I've been doing the job long enough to recognize the signs of its use. This guy had all of them. Scrawny guy with small open wounds on his face. Sunken cheeks. Darting eyes. The whole enchilada. I called his case. The guy's obviously physically tense, extremely agitated, and overly loud. Great. He's on meth right now. Flashback. Unbeknownst to me, he'd been wandering around the building with no shirt on, shouting nonsense to inmates behind the security windows. The security deputies knew he was a problem, so Deputy X escorted him into the courtroom. The scene of the crime... Deputy X stations himself between the addict and the judge's bench. The addict starts shouting and cursing, and the newly elected judge is having trouble keeping order. The shouting continues, and he starts telling the judge, Fuck you. Fuck the police. While coming around the table. Deputy X is 220 pounds of middle-aged country boy. Body armor, weapons, and gear. This isn't his first rodeo. He tells the guy to step back and shut up. He complies, then strangely calmly pours himself a glass of water from the table. We talk about his case a little more, and he ramps back up in agitation and comes around the table again. Deputy X steps up to him, and the addict throws a glass of water in Deputy X's face. Deputy X looks like a bear that had just been poked with a stick. True to form, he bear hugs the water assailant and gets him cuffed surprisingly quickly, considering the thrashing and yelling. He begins manhandling the guy out of jail for felony assault on an LEO and calls for backup. Deputy X and Deputy Y get him out of the courtroom, and I continue on with another day in courtroom two. The attempted swan dive onto Marvel. This part was later relayed to me by Deputy Y. After getting him out of the courtroom, Deputy X and Y are dragging the guy past the balcony 
that overlooks a 20-foot drop onto a wide marble staircase. He rears up and attempts to flip all three of them off the balcony. It's 130 pounds of meth-fueled rage against 400 pounds of deputies that don't feel like having their heads bashed in after a swan dive into marble. Deputy Y sweeps the guy's legs, and he does his best impression of a pancake with 400 pounds of pissed off deputy on top of him. It's honestly amazing no bones were broken. Then they escort him to booking, and here's the aftermath. After two weeks in big boy timeout, thinking about what a naughty boy he's been, the guy returns to court under the watchful eye of Deputy X. He'd already been charged in superior court for felony assault on an LEO. The bailiff had thoughtfully removed the water pitcher from the table. The guy is much better behaved this time. As I talk to the judge about his case, I casually pour a glass of water on my separate table and gently nudge it in the direction of the attic. But it's well out of his reach. I lock eyes with Deputy X, and with a stone face, he gently shakes his head. No. After court, Deputy X in private says, You asshole. With a laugh. Innocent is plausible, I said. What? You look thirsty. In the end, the guy pled down the felony assault to a misdemeanor, and did some time for it. As far as I know, he's still out there doing shirtless things. Thanks for listening. I hoped you enjoyed a little slice of my life as a rural prosecutor. A few years ago, I was house-sitting. Well farm sitting for the family of a friend of mine who's one year younger than me. She was moving to college at the north end of the state, and the whole family was going to move her into her new dorm. The family is mom, dad, her, and five younger siblings, so this relatively small farm is usually well staffed. They easily have eight to ten acres of usable land in southeastern Indiana, with horses, a large garden, chickens, goats, rabbits, and whatnot. Oh, and like four dogs, one of which is a huge mastiff mix or something like that. This dog is huge, like literally the size of a full-grown bear. It's the same color and isn't friendly with most people because he's very protective of the land. Herein lies part of the reason I was watching their house. For whatever reason, this dog loved me and I was willing to come out to their place a day early to learn all of the daily chores that I would need to do. To help develop an image of this place, you can see the house of their nearest neighbor from their front porch, but it's across the horse pasture up the gravel road you come in on, and easily a kilometer or two away. I think it would probably take a solid 15 to 20 minutes to diligently walk there. Anyway, so I spent one night there with them after spending a day learning the do's and do nots, and that was fine. They left early the next morning, and I got to work, which took about two hours on my own. The job was honestly really easy once the daily chores were finished. Pretty much just sit around and relax, accompany the dogs, bring in the mail and whatnot. The first night came quickly, and I'd heard their drive went well so I spent the evening on the couch watching TV with the dogs. My sleeping arrangements were also in the living room on a futon, so I was half-sleepily lounging around and, at some point, I must have dozed off. I woke up to the beast of a dog laying his head on my chest at about 3am in the pitch-black dead of night. My first thought was he needed to go outside, so I got up and put on my shoes, but that's when I noticed he'd gone from my side to cowering and whining in the corner of the house opposite the front door. I stood up to check on him and then realized it was really cold, especially for a college-aged guy my size wearing pajama pants and a t-shirt in early August. This chill was accompanied by the most eerie feeling of dread that I've probably ever experienced to this day. I found it physically difficult to walk as it felt like time was moving slowly. However, I eventually made it to the dog and pet him a few times to try and calm him down, 
but he seemed inconsolable. I walked to the thermostat in the hallway and read 37 degrees Fahrenheit inside, even though the outside temperature was easily still in the 70s. I moved towards the front door and peeked outside through a window, but there was a light cloud cover and it was so dark that I couldn't see anything, so I flipped on the porch light. The light wasn't enough to see very far into the pasture, so I wasn't too concerned that I couldn't see the horses, but I could see much of the driveway area, and right in the midst of it stood a cloaked humanoid figure that seemed completely unfazed by the porch light. I froze. Whatever it was didn't seem aggressive and wasn't carrying any obvious weapons, but I'm thoroughly convinced after staring at it for five or ten seconds that this thing was not human. The father of my friend is low-key one of those doomsday preppers, but more realistic in that he prepares for things like EMPs, nukes, solar flares, and whatever else. Nonetheless, he has a shit ton of firearms around the house, all thoroughly locked up outside of my use, except one fully loaded 9mm pistol in the master bedroom that he gave me the key for and told me it was for emergencies only. I ran to the room as fast as I could and got the pistol, but by the time I returned to the door, the figure was gone. I saw that the dog was still in the corner but he'd stopped whimpering for the time being. I turned on a bunch of lights in the house, still carrying the pistol, and returned to the couch where the dog had moved to while I was walking around. I was still shaking and completely unsure of what to expect next. But then, just as suddenly as everything else happened, the feeling of dread subsided. The dog wagged his tail a couple of times and licked my hand, and the thermostat now read a comfortable 72 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the heater had never kicked on. I managed to gather my thoughts and lay down again after about 20 to 30 minutes of deep breathing. I eventually fell asleep again. I woke up to my alarm at something like 8am and realized what I hoped to be a dream couldn't have been because all the lights were still on, and the pistol was sitting on the coffee table with the safety off. I eventually worked up the courage to step outside and start my chores, but I couldn't help to investigate the driveway a bit, near the place I thought the thing would have been standing. I found the shape of two bare feet, with no footprints leading to or from it, and no other marks one would expect in a footprint. I have no idea to this day what it was that stood outside the door that night, nor do I have any explanation for the entire event. All I know is it spooked me enough that I invited my brother to come spend the subsequent and final night with me, where luckily nothing happened. I never told my friend or her parents because I thought for sure they'd think I was crazy and stop associating with me. Unfortunately, I've sort of lost contact with them now anyway. Maybe I'll reach out to them sometime, but I don't know. I really discovered a love for walking over lockdown. There were days where I could spend hours out traveling the country roads, across fields and through the woods. I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Ireland, so the walks were a great form of exercise without using a gym. It started with me and my dad going out for about an hour every day, but he knew I wanted more and told me to go on my own if he wasn't up for it or if I wanted to go further than usual. It was around July of 2021. I was 14 at the time, and even though lockdown was starting to ease, I still went walking. I decided to walk through the fields instead of the roads, because having to stop for cars really irks me. I came to a plot of land with trees planted and decided to splash the boots before turning back. I was almost finished when I started hearing laughter from behind me. I pulled up my zip and buckled my belt to face whoever was there. I was surprised to see five people. None of them could have been much older than me. 
One of them waved and I walked towards them. They were between me and my way back home, so I sort of had to. The group had been talking amongst themselves, but stopped when I met them. There were three boys and two girls. They all had bags or backpacks and were all similarly dressed in dark graphic t-shirts and black cargos with funny looking keychains. A bit of a weird sight considering things like skate culture aren't really big where I'm from and anyone who's ever owned a nice piece of clothing wouldn't wear it out in a place where they could trip up and cowpat. The guy with the thrasher t-shirt smiled and asked, what are you doing out here? I realized it must have been a bit weird to meet a stranger in the absolute asshole of nowhere, so I just said, I'm taking a shortcut through the back road. Another boy chimes in and said, don't lie, Colchi. Well, I saw you taking a piss in the woods. It dawned on me that they were both too well-spoken to be anyone local. I felt a bit intimidated, so I just told him. Nature was calling as jokingly as I could, to which they all laughed. I wasn't sure if it was my accent that they found funny, or the fact that they'd caught me, and I was made visibly embarrassed. One of the two girls breaks from the laughter and pulls a face of disgust. Oh, for fuck's sake, what are you doing with that necklace? Referring to the cross necklace I was wearing. It didn't really scan with me how serious she was, so I just let out a chuckle but the four others stopped laughing. The girl who spoke pulled out a book from the tote bag she'd worn over her shoulder, and she said, You've probably already ruined this by pissing on the ground too, as if I was supposed to know what this was. The five of them all genuinely looked gutted, as if I genuinely ruined their day. I just responded with, I don't really know what you mean and a bleeding noise came out from the thrasher guy's bag. I looked at him, and the group starts to act skittish. The girl with the book says, let's just look for a good spot, and they walk past me. I turn and see the thrasher guy's backpack look sort of lumpy. At the time, I really didn't know what was in there, but as I was nearly home, I walked past a field with sheep and I realized they stole an animal from one of the farms. I told my parents later that day I was away cycling. I took the bike as far as I could and jogged to where I last saw the group disappear into the trees. I looked around. There was a dead lamb with several shallow gashes all over it, with some of its wool almost pulled out. The number five and blue spray paint was still partially visible. I'm guessing that they left it there after cutting it, and it bled out and died. I don't believe in that satanic, panic antichrist thing, but I know they were probably sacrificing the lamb for some reason or the other. I was helping my friend, who I told this story to, with farmhand work the week after, and all of his livestock were accounted for, meaning I have a rough idea of which field they got the lamb but I didn't want to ask the owner, in case he thought I had something to do with it disappearing. Me and my friend went back to the wooded area because I didn't want him to think I was messing with them, but I haven't gone back since. We were leaving a wedding we had attended that was held about three hours from home. My boyfriend had stayed sober in order to drive us home. I was pretty drunk. As we were driving the dark country back roads to get back to the city, I was half dozing and remember squinting because there seemed to be bright headlights washing over us. And then my boyfriend, who was driving, started screaming. Like full on screaming, I've never heard him do so before or since. It wasn't a loud, high-pitched screaming, but a deep-in-the-throat screaming that broke in and out and that left him hoarse. He swerved our car sharply to the side of the road, nearly into a ditch. I fully woke up and asked, What? Are you okay? He said that he saw a truck coming full bore towards us in the dark 
and honestly thought we were going to die. I looked behind us, a long straight road with no houses or streetlights. There was no sign of a truck or any kind of vehicle, no rear headlights on the road or any light from a truck's headlights, which we would have seen. No sound of truck or car or anything, but he was shaking, and I initially brushed it off as him maybe falling asleep at the wheel, which is already scary in and of itself. We were on a narrow country road. There was no way a massive truck could have gone by us without hitting our car for one, and I don't remember feeling the rumble and vibrating of our car that would have happened if a truck had narrowly missed us. So I dismissed it. He still swears that he saw a massive truck coming towards us. However, I do remember a flood of headlights hurting my half-closed eyes just before my boyfriend freaked out. This happened when I was in downtown LA. I was crossing the street and just came up onto the sidewalk. Some guy in a Ferrari steps out of the car, walks up to me, and tries to swing on me in broad daylight. I sidestep the guy and he spun around to try and hit me again, calling me a motherfucker and not to dodge. I caught him with a nut shot with my foot and doubled him over. His buddy hops out of the car, and another of his buddies gets up from the side of the sidewalk and are both yelling at me. I'm like, oh fuck, I'm not ready for this. These absolute legends who had been watching all this shit go down just appear out of nowhere and jump these guys for me like six different people from out of the wet work. Nutshot and Scrub, the Ferrari guys, hop in the car and just take off, scraping the car and taking the right side view mirror off. Their other homeboy gets left behind, but he tries to stumble fuck his ass away after having taken a couple hits to the head. One of the guys who helped me jogs up and punts this guy in the side, right after he falls over, doubling him over. Meanwhile, Everybody else is checking on me and making sure I'm good. The cops show up, detain us, figure out what's going on, let us go and arrest the guy that couldn't get away. I come to find out that these guys had been doing this for weeks, and the people who'd helped me were local residents who'd been on the lookout for Nutshot. The guy that was arrested later squealed, and all the guys involved got a couple of years for aggravated assault. This happened around summer 2000 in Midwest USA, and I was a 12-year-old boy. I was shy and never did well with confrontation. Anytime I was scared, I'd feel myself shaking. One day, my dad and cousin were weightlifting in the garage and it was open. I then decided to grab my bicycle out of the garage and ride it up and down the street while my dad and cousin lifted. As I'm pedaling away from my house, I see another kid riding his bike probably five to six houses down from mine, but he's just kind of going in circles. I maybe get like 20 feet near him, but that's it. No words were exchanged, not even a wave or a nod. I just kept my head down and kept pedaling. On my next circle back down the street, that's when things got weird. I get near the area where the kid had been riding, and he's not around anymore so I guessed he went inside wherever he lived. Right as I'm about to turn around and head towards my house, which is probably 80 to 100 yards away, I hear a man yell, Hey! in an unsettling tone. I look up, and a man is standing in his front doorway, probably 25 feet away from me. As I'm paused on the street with my bike, he's one of the creepiest looking guys I've ever seen in my life. He has on a ball cap, and he's wearing these thick, Jeffrey Dahmer-looking glasses. Tan, burnt orange, dirty-looking, wrinkled skin, and he had to be in his forties, probably. He looked straight out of a horror movie, and he just had this sinister, angry look on his face. He then says, If you say anything to my son again, I'm going to run your ass over. At this point, I was crying and frozen with fear. 
but then I started biking home faster than ever. I'd never been in a situation like this in my life. I couldn't believe what happened because I never said anything to that boy. So I get to the open garage where my dad and cousin are still lifting. I tell them the story and they decide to go to this guy's house and address the situation that just occurred. My dad and cousin had a few beers and are pretty jack, so they were ready to tussle if needed. My dad goes straight to this guy's door with my cousin behind him and knocks loudly. The man opens the door and has this huge Rottweiler by his side, barking and going crazy at my dad and cousin. He threatens to let the dog loose, but my dad and cousin aren't cowering one bit. After a bit of bickering for a minute, the guy goes inside his house and shuts the door. Nothing else happens that night, and we walk back home. A few days pass, and now I'm about to get to the creepiest part. During the summer, when my parents worked during the day, my grandma would come over and babysit my little brother and I. We were about ten minutes from downtown, and my grandma was going to take us there to grab food at Sonic. We get in her car and start driving down the road towards that creepy guy's house. This made me feel uneasy, but that's the direction we had to go. As we get closer to the house, the hair on my neck starts to stand up again. As we go by the house, I see him. He's sitting in a red truck in his driveway, facing the road like he's about to pull out. I don't remember well, but I think he might have even had a grin on his face when we drove by. We pass the house and he pulls out behind us. I start freaking out a bit, so I tell my grandma the story about the man driving behind us. At first my grandma was chill about it, but then I noticed she seemed a bit shaken. This is because she'd made about six to seven turns to throw him off our trail, but he kept following us. Every little turn. At this point, me and my brother are in the back seat with our heads down as he follows us but luckily we made it downtown where it was quite busy. We're close to the police station, I believe, and take another turn. Then he finally just passes on by. I never saw that man again. My mom and dad split up, and we left that neighborhood two years later with my mom to move to the country. My dad still lives at the same house, and I wonder if that guy stuck around for a while, or even still lives at that same house. What was his intent? Was it just a coincidence? Or did he plan on following us? It was so weird how it looked like he was just waiting in his driveway for us to pass by. So the other night I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks up to check any and all personnel that do try to enter the facility. Both roads that lead to my gate were blocked off less than half a mile just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights will just be visible down by me on my cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee and trying to keep myself awake. I'd hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on camera, and as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck until I opened my eyes a bit wider to focus, I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe somebody was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm looking out, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on screen the silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera, and as I'm doing this in live time, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the other two guards, asking if they'd let any personnel get through their checkpoints, 
I get a negative response back, asking me what's up. I told him to stand by as I review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watched, stunned. As the truck comes pulling to the north guard shack, its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouette figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. The man looks towards the truck, does a double take from me to the truck, and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything about that night or anything to the guards coming on shift and I played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped and saw exactly what I did without me pointing anything out. This is a regular occurrence. Out here, most of the guards that have been here a while have seen things and have stories. I just got what I've been waiting for. Solid proof for myself. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers, and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. The mall is a single loop with probably around 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep them all operating. Half of this staff works admin, the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40 hour a week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security. Having them escort me to the bus stop, on the occasional night inventory had me working late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became acquainted with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus during which he was quiet, but polite. A schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on evening shifts, and put Mark on day duty. Not the end of the world, just kind of sucked no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in when customers get unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts, and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store, and it helped him out a few times with shoplifters. But beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation or anything. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down and then remarked, This is gonna be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue in the men's washroom. Someone passed out in a stall or something, so I asked him, Oh no, why? Because I'm nosy and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes and said, My doctor advised against heavy lifting. And then he winked at me. I ran into the girls' washroom and texted my manager, freaking out about what he just said, knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands around six foot two. I'm a tiny five foot seven girl who was about twenty at the time of this. 
It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he'd been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I'd heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening, with about 15 minutes left before we closed for the day. I hear someone enter my store and look up to see Mark walking towards me with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone, so I stepped into the back room to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door to my back room open and stood there, screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job, how I'd ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made as a joke and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed for a few minutes, and the second he paused for breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store, and a moment later Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, Where the fuck did he go? And I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statements to the police and mall security. Mark had been fired after my report, but security was adamant that it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from mall premises the day he got fired and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now. A few days ago, my girlfriend and I were on the home stretch of a big road trip with our dog. As it had been a while since we last stopped, we pulled into a rest stop off the freeway to stretch our legs and let the dog go to the bathroom. When we pulled into the rest stop, there were no cars and three big semi-trucks parked in a line. Immediately my girlfriend got out to go to the restroom. I leashed up the dog and stood next to the car. And as she was walking towards the entry door, I thought I heard someone yell behind me. To my surprise, it was a trucker in the driver's seat of his truck with a window rolled down, trying to get my attention. Now, I'm generally pretty friendly towards all people, whether they seem shady or not, generally willing to help a hand. Behind me in the truck was an older gentleman, large, with gray hair and sunglasses, his truck was so loud, I couldn't hear what he was yelling, so I yelled back, What? The trucker yelled something inaudible three more times as I asked him, What? While shaking my head and holding up my hands to inform him, I couldn't hear him. At this point, he seemed visually annoyed that I said, What? Four times. Okay, understandable. I wanted to see what the deal with this guy was, so I walked between the car and the passenger side of his truck. What did you say? I asked. Can you help me look for my phone? I lost it somewhere, the trucker said. At this point, I was caught off guard, as this had all unfolded within 20 to 30 seconds that we parked at the rest stop. To me, it was weird that a trucker was asking a random passenger stopping at a rest stop to help look for their phone, but maybe he just wanted me to call it. Where did you lose it at? I asked. I lost it in my truck. Can you come up here and help me look for it? The trucker replied in an unnerving tone. In that moment, I was sketched the fuck out. I thought I was about to be abducted. Phone call I could do, but there was no way I was about to get into this trucker's cab to look for his phone. Yeah, no, I said sternly, but half-heartedly, 
as I almost thought this guy was joking with me. After a few moments, the trucker then says, You won't help me look for it. My adrenaline was pumping, so I yelled back, Get out of here, in a threatening tone. Knowing damn well I had nothing to defend us, should something go wrong. I put the dog back into the car and pulled out my phone to pretend I was calling the cops, while he slowly drove and stopped again to ask if I was going to help. I then screamed again, No, get the fuck out of here, I'm calling the cops. After that reply, he stepped on the gas and exited to the freeway. I stood and watched. When finally my girlfriend exited the rest stop, wondering why I looked like I just saw a ghost. I don't know if it was an overreaction, but it sketched me the fuck out that he asked me to get into the truck. When I was nine, we were traveling from our cabin back to town with an open boat. This was right before Easter, about a 45 minute trip. The seas were rough and the boat had a built in flaw that caused it to break into two pieces due to the pounding on the waves. I sat face towards the back so I didn't see it break. There was just suddenly water up to my waist. When I turned around, the nose was floating a couple of meters away from the boat. My mom's husband at the time just said, jump, and so we did into the black two-degree water of the North Sea, as far away from the boat as possible. This was by far the scariest moment. Her husband managed to launch two emergency rockets before the boat vanished below him. He was a very poor swimmer, and even though we tried to hold on to him, he was separated from us due to the large waves constantly covering us. After that, it was about 10 minutes of trying to swim to the shore, which was about 400 meters away, before realizing we were never going to make it. After that, we basically dodged waves and made bad taste jokes. We saw people on the shore, cars stopped on the highway. The last thing I remember before blacking out is a boat approaching. Then I woke up in the hospital, basically thrashing around from the cramps of my body trying to warm up. Apparently I had a temperature of 27 degrees when they brought me in. My mom was awake the whole time. She lost control of her limbs right after I blacked out and gripped a rope from my life vest with her teeth so I wouldn't float away. Even though this was scary to me, there are some awesome elements to it. An old fisherman in a house by the shore saw the whole thing. He was desperately trying to get a hold of rescue services, but no one was where they were supposed to be. His wife, having lost both her previous husband and a son at sea, had some kind of health issue while watching us swim around, so he had to take care of her and try to get us some help. The most badass part of the story is how we got rescued. One of my mom's husband's friend got a call about what was happening. He got in his boat with his eight-month pregnant wife and went full speed to our location. The boat he had was not designed for high seas, it was a summer type cab cruiser, so he had to steer it towards the waves at all times. His wife then proceeded to pull three fully clothed people back up to safety, including an unconscious me. If anyone has ever tried to pull someone out of the water, you know how difficult it is. We all survived. I was totally fine, aside from my ball swelling up to three times the normal size for a couple of days. My mom tore a bunch of stuff in her back and her husband swallowed about four liters of salt water and was sick for about a week. I lost my mom to cancer a couple of years back. Well, a couple of years after, my brothers and I were visiting my dad in their house over the December holidays. It's a small place, so since there wasn't much sleeping room, I was to sleep in the lounge area. The front of the apartment was open plan and connected to the kitchen, and in the kitchen, on the fridge, was this little Pikachu fridge magnet, which is still there, and when pressed on its belly, 
it would say Pikachu. It's more than 15 years old, but still working. I was a Pokemon fanatic as a kid, so, in the middle of the night, with everyone asleep, this thing starts going off like crazy. At first, I thought it had to be my brothers playing some stupid trick on me, so I sit up straight and look over to the fridge, but there's nobody even near it. I get up to go check it out, but as I get closer, it stops. I'm still groggy, so I'm like, whatever, and I head back to bed. I fall asleep again, and a while after, I'm woken up by the sound again. This time, though, as I sit up, there's the figure of a woman wearing a nightgown standing at the foot of my bed, one just like my mom had, and there was an icy cold hanging in the air like almost burning my face cold. She looks at me and in a confused voice says, This is my house, right? Which makes sense, because she was very confused during her last couple of months. Her personality deteriorated very fast. I completely froze. But at that moment, I hear footsteps from the hallway side, and she vanishes. As I'm sitting there trying to process what just happened, my brother walks into the room, turns on the light, and sees me pale as the ghost I just saw. I apparently asked him if him and his wife were trolling me or something, but he actually got up to investigate the sound too. His wife was fast asleep. Now, being the logical guy I am, I did kind of figure out a scientific explanation for what happened. See... My older brother's kids had been over that day too, and they played around with the Pikachu. Also, all this went down in the summer, while it was very hot outside during the day. But when the sound started at night, it was cold as hell, so maybe the Pikachu's belly expanded during the day, and then shrunk to a point where some switch inside was making contact. As for my mother... We were spring cleaning that day and put up our favorite curtains that I remembered from when I was a kid. We also went through a couple of her heirlooms, so there's no doubt she was in my mind a lot. And I might have just been very groggy. But you know what? It just doesn't feel like one big coincidence. So last year, I was working as a line cook at a popular chain restaurant. I used to be done with my shift at around midnight, and I would promptly walk home because I only lived 20 minutes from my job. I live in Canada, so it's generally been no issue if I walk home by myself at night. So I'd been walking home by myself for two months, when one night I decided to go to the grocery store near my work. As I was walking there, a homeless man was hovering around me when I was waiting for the light to turn. He was close to me, but thankfully he kept walking in a direction opposite to where I was going. Unfortunately, when he was hovering around me, I was talking to my boyfriend and telling him I'm going to the grocery store. I got to the grocery store and didn't see him. After I finished my shopping, I see the man from earlier hovering around the grocery store entrance. He didn't go in but he was waiting outside in the rain. When I looked at him, he stared back at me, so I decided to take an Uber instead of walking. As I waited for my Uber, I tried to hide behind some soil bags in the grocery store entrance, but then he found me and started to stare at me again. Finally, my Uber showed up and I got in. After that, I was too scared to walk home alone, so I got my boyfriend to walk me or I would get a manager to drive me home. A few days later, my boyfriend and I are walking home and we're leaving my workplace's parking lot. There was one big black van parked perpendicularly in the path I usually walk through. No other cars around. We see a man hovering around this car and his side sliding door to his van is open. He's hovering around the door, so I found this weird. I make my boyfriend walk with me over to the sidewalk of one of the big stores. When we have our backs turned, he starts to follow us. I see this and I tell my boyfriend we need to run. We manage to run some lights and I didn't see him follow us. 
After that, I started taking Ubers or getting my managers to drive me home. Every Saturday night for five weeks, I would see a black van parked near my work, and it would leave when it saw me leave with my manager. It would also leave when it realized that I saw it. For example, I was helping the bartender clean, and I decided to look out one of the windows when I saw that damn van again. When it saw me staring back at it, it left, thankfully. This scared me a lot, so my manager started to give me the morning shifts, and when I had to go back to university and take late shifts again, I didn't see it anymore. Next time I do, I plan to go to the police. Not only that, I was already on high alert because one of my ex-co-workers had been showing up outside of my work. When I worked with him, he would blatantly stare at me and at one point brushed his waist against my arm when we had to work together on purpose. He would also stand very close to me at some points, almost touching me. I wasn't that worried about him because he's almost a decade younger than me and mostly just watched me. However... He was why I was paying more attention to my surroundings. Hence it helped me look out for the other creeps. I grew up in southern New Hampshire. I had some interesting times in East Derry. I grew up on a cul-de-sac with a police captain and a detective as my neighbors. A lot of weird and strange things happened while living there, most connected to the house itself. I had a type of shadow person. It would take the shape of my family members, and years after moving from that house, my older brother would tell me, whatever it was liked you. Which brings us to one of my many stories. My best friend lived five houses from me, and her parents owned a pop-up camper. It was located to the side of their porch, which had the door that the family used as a main entrance. Being the young 12 to 14 year olds we were, we had many sleepovers in it with other kids in the neighborhood. We had a few experiences, and I will tell you the most haunting one of them. This night, it was just her and I. We're both girls, and at that age where we would bicker over the dumbest things, this night, it was her throwing a piece of gum to me, and it getting lost between one of the mattresses and the lining of the camper. She wasn't willing to give me another piece, which led us to butting heads. We were bickering back and forth about her giving me another piece when we both went dead quiet. All of a sudden, we both heard what sounded like footsteps walking around the camper. Then came the talking. I don't know how to describe it other than being right there, like a whisper but sounding so distant. It was a male, and we could not make out what it was he was saying. Whatever it was was in another language. We looked at each other with concern, and I remember her taking off her socks and us just making that 15-foot sprint to that side door, inside, and up the stairs to her room while grabbing the house phone on the way. Her parents were drunks, so we didn't wake them. Instead, we did the only rational thing and called my house. My mom ended up driving around the neighborhood two times, only to call us back and tell us she saw nothing. We were so freaked out that we slept on the floor next to each other. Where we slept was under the window that overlooked her front yard. I'm not sure when we fell asleep, but before we did... We both remember hearing the sound of raking and digging. This is a story going on almost 20 years ago now. I am, to this day, still friends with my childhood best friend. A lot of weird stuff takes place in Derry. I live in the deep woods in southern Missouri. The nearest civilization outside a trailer house down the road is a gas station town a couple of miles away. I've lived here since I was six months old and spent my days in the woods. I don't remember a time where I didn't know the winding paths and clearings like the back of my hand. 
there were always stories of something in the woods. A local tribesman told the tale of a spirit that wandered the woods at night. I was deeply invested in stories of ghosts and monsters and that sort of stuff, so the tribesman's tale was pretty run-of-the-mill. I didn't think much of it until a few years ago. One night in 2010, I was walking the usual trail and got a feeling that something wasn't right. It was like I was walking three feet behind my body. It was the sound of a snapping branch that brought my body and mind back together, but it wasn't a twig or small limb. It was a large oak branch about as wide as me. It hit the ground with a hard thud. After that, the woods became completely silent. No owls or coyotes howling. Not even the night breeze. The only sound was my own stunned breathing. Out of the darkness, two glowing yellow eyes looked directly at me from the shadows. They were several yards down the trail yet still seemed several feet off the ground. A low thundering growl came from the same direction. It was like the growl of a tiger mixed with a bear. I wanted to run back home, but my legs wouldn't budge. My breathing picked up and became more and more like gasping for air. The growling stopped as the creature started to turn around and go deeper into the woods, showing me its form in the moonlight. It didn't seem of this world. I can only describe it as a black mountain lion with a head and body the size of a grizzly bear. It looked like it hadn't eaten in a month and was nothing more than skin and bones. Only when I was alone again in the woods would my legs let me sprint back home and lock myself in my room with a survival knife. Occasionally, on the quietest nights of the year, I can hear it outside my window and the same eyes from that night appear out of the darkness. I never go outside without my knife anymore, even during the day. I've had several friends that have come over for the day go home that night and tell me how they feel like they're being watched from outside. I went to college in a historic, mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time lived in a duplex town, maybe three blocks from campus. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large, historic homes near me. This all happened around five years ago, for a bit of backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night, only one of my roommates was home. We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but only really spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main door locked, and they did a good job of doing so. So me and my flatmate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked, and we smoked a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door, and quickly realize the girls upstairs had ordered a pizza. Later on, it becomes evident that they never locked the front door after receiving their pizza. So we finally go to sleep in our rooms, and since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I fell asleep, I woke up to a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I wasn't dreaming, I noticed that he's quickly moving my phone and computer out of my bed and moving my comforter, trying to get into my bed. I start to ask him who he is, what he's doing there, and just generally confused, as I was still slightly high from before I went to sleep. The only thing he said to me was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point I begin to panic, as my mind obviously goes to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random Tinder guy over, and that he'd gone to the wrong room. But the more I questioned him, all he had to say was, I'm just trying to get in bed. I own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I'd accidentally left them on a shelf that the guy was standing in front of, 
so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get out of here now, I will scream, and they will be here within seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare him off. I don't know if he'd brought something with him or if he stole something from me, but I saw him grab something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left my room, I shut the door and locked it. I tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere, but then quickly realized that between my room and the front door is the room of my friend that was home. As scared as I was, I was terrified that the guy had maybe gone into a room, so I grabbed my stun gun and a pocket knife, counted to three, and ripped open my door. I ran into my roommate's room, and she was fast asleep. There was no evidence of the guy. I told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw that our front door was wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone and finally found it hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I'd left it. That sent a chill up my spine as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and room while I was sleeping and long enough to hide my phone, which only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at that point believed me. We barricaded ourselves into the room and called 911. Within minutes, there were police cars swarming our street and yard. They yelled for us to quickly leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen police officers came running in and searched every inch of our apartment. They woke up the girls upstairs and searched their apartment to ensure the man had left. The officers then had me write a statement, and I gave them a description of the man. And to this day, I haven't heard a single thing about the case. I feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation, but the thought of his intentions terrifies me. And additionally, the fact that he was never caught scares me, as I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear that I did. I will add... There is a chance that he was on drugs or mentally ill and had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I will never know, and my mind will always assume the worst. I've worked in restaurants for almost 10 years. I'm accustomed to getting out late. One night after finishing a double shift at a ramen spot, I had my usual beer and decided to get an Uber home. My Uber arrived. I checked the plate and all, and the gentleman even confirmed my name. I spent half of the ride almost dozing off. As the ride progressed, I noticed the driver kept staring at me through the mirror. He never said a single word, no expression. It was just a blank stare. I figured exhaustion and the beer had gotten the best of me, and he was probably staring because he thought I was drunk. Later on, I also noticed that he had taken a different highway, and that we were making our way through Rikers Island. It was a route I wasn't accustomed to, but he had his ways app open, and I figured he was trying to take some sort of shortcut. We kept getting further into Rikers Island, and the area had become full of trees and construction machines, neon cones and cracked cement. He came to a sudden stop. My car just broke. Get out and call a new Uber. I was confused. There hadn't been any indication that a tire had popped or that it had run out of gas. I got out, and before I asked anything, he stepped on the gas and sped off. The car was perfectly fine. Alone by a construction zone, I started freaking out and called another Uber. When he arrived, his first question was why I was in the middle of nowhere, especially so late. I told him about the other Uber driver, and he urged me to report it. I reported it, checked the profile. 4.8 stars, 
same license plate, but it was not the same man in the picture. The report never really got anywhere. I can't help but feel I encountered something nefarious. This happened to me eight years ago. It was my first month on the job, and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. For the record, I still work there, and have more strange stories possibly to tell in the future. I'm a 38-year-old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life, and the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years, so... I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. In other words, I don't scare easily and hardly ever go into panic mode when a crisis comes up. The place I currently work at is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartment with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers and real estate agents, and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It's located in a well-known tourist town in the US. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor, the doors are locked at 11 p.m. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in, or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you're at. It will ring the company's cell phone, and I answer and come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on the first floor, are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a coat to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's not really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I'm the only security person here at night. My co-worker, who is leaving, told me the side iron gates that lead to the parking lot are open on one side, because they're stuck. This is nothing new, they do often get jammed. She told me the repair would be tomorrow sometime to fix them, but to just do some extra patrol out there that night. This place sits across the road from a public park, and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to breed druggies and homeless at night, who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We're simply eyes and ears, and to call the police if something comes up. Of course you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases, if you're in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I'm to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office, which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3 a.m., I had just sat down to eat my lunch when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, Thanks for calling Bluestone. This is Security Officer James. How can I help you? 
All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of arm reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked, how can I help you? The man started to breathe heavier and laugh, and then silence. It was one of those laughs you hear in a movie where the lunatic is about to do something terrible. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office and to the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number two, which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you and you're gonna die. The voice said in a raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. The phone rang again. This time I picked it up. And before he could speak, I let him know that the cops were on their way. And to leave the property now as he's on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. This guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they're a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you. Are you ready to die? The cops won't make it here in time, the guy said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver, and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness to the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police, but honestly, the location of this place, it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here, and I figured this guy was just some tweaker from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked to the back lot, just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case, but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. About a half hour passed. I had finished lunch and just was about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked it up and said my normal line. Where are the cops? I don't see them, but I see you, the voice said. Fuck, it was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and didn't see anything. I went to the front door to look out, and there was nothing but darkness and a few floodlights on. I know you're alone, and you're going to die soon, he said. I basically told him to get fucked and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. Next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office, which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40, with long stringy hair poking down and these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest damn butcher knife I've ever seen and made a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy and probably on drugs. He continued slamming his body against the glass, trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window, but managed to bust his head open, so the window now has blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for the cops as this guy was out of control 
and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him. And the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones, which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on meth or something, because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores, but this is the last thing I need with this nut job running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones. He would at least be trapped or it would slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yelled the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl, and then held up that knife again before running into the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly, and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang, and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't. And while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time, his hood had fallen back. He was bald-headed, with wild, long, stringy and crazy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge, and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, Die. Die. While making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About five minutes later, the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looked like, and I told him I had camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone, and he'd driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if the guy came again. It was now nearly 5 a.m. when the cop left. I waited until 6 a.m. when it was broad daylight and people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. The guy literally took all 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8 a.m., I told her what happened, and she said they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for two weeks after, but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or found out who he was. Sophomore year in high school is when it started. That would be 2003, I believe. His name was Michael D., but he was called Blueberry by our circle of friends. I have long forgotten the story behind the moniker, but I imagine that it was selected mostly to distinguish from the many other Michaels around. He was a tall, gawky, acne-afflicted junior who had a hands-in-his-pocket angry walk, a deep dimple in the middle of his chin, and an absolutely unintelligible manner of speaking. 
unintelligible to the point where his second nickname was Michael Mumble. I don't remember anything particular about that meeting really, just a few passing words, a mutual friend stepping in to wave an introductory hand back and forth while repeating our names to the other in quick bursts like a sneeze on a rifle. Gracie, Michael, but we call him Blueberry. Blueberry Mike, Gracie. I was a spunky 15-year-old discovering a whole new diverse world out there, and in retrospect, I see how my giddy naivete left a door wide open for Blueberry to step through. He would talk, well, more like mumble to me before first period. I struggled to understand what was said behind his tight lips that hardly moved, so our interactions were usually brief and consisted mostly of me smiling brightly and nodding along before politely excusing myself. I often picked up on his awkward anger and aggression, stuffed so deep and snug inside his six foot three frame. All teenagers are angry. Hell, even spunky me had my moody sprees, but Blueberry's anger was different. It was a warped, twisted, stubborn, narcissistic, permeating, calm kind of anger. I remember thinking to myself that it just burned the air around him. Being 15, I had no car, so I took my lunches at the subway that sat two blocks away from school. Sometimes I went with friends, but more often I went by myself. I liked the quiet and chance to regroup from school's chaos. He appeared one day, mumbling away across from me in a booth while I pasted on a slightly puzzled smile, lips tight over my mouth full of food, wondering what on earth he was saying. Then the letters came. My best friend, Christy, and I wrote tomes of notes during our class periods to fold up into neat squares and swap with each other in the halls. This was how we plotted and schemed before the advent of text messaging. We had designated hallways where we would hand off our paper squares. One of these hallways was where I would also see Blueberry. One day, I just slyly palmed Christie's note in my hand when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder and paper slid into my other hand. It was Blueberry, staring fixedly at me with a slight smile. With a surprised chuckle and nod of acknowledgement, I took Blueberry's note into my purse along with Christie's. I soon found out that not only was he Michael Mumble, he was Michael Muddled. While his handwriting was neat and printed, and I was far from illiterate, I could not make head or tail out of his train of thought. He wrote as he spoke, in a mashed, inverted manner, where the subject matter was vague at best. All I could make out of the letters he would give me from that day on was that I was part of the subject matter. Something about my considerations or me not seeing. Filling up the paper margins were badly drawn frogs, babblings about druids, and more frogs. I got these letters often, usually daily. I probably wrote a short note back to him once, maybe twice at most, but they came steadily as ever. As spring wound down, I began to get more than uneasy around him. To the group, Blueberry was Blueberry, just a normal oddball in the background. I began to avoid him, but he seemed blind to that. In retrospect, at the age of 25, I can safely say people pick up when you're avoiding them, but not Blueberry. The lunchtime interceptions and notes continued when he could manage it. And then came the gifts. I was a writer back then. I always had notebooks that I constantly filled up with any scribblings that came into my head. I wrote in the cheap, smaller-sized spirals that you can pick up at any drugstore. I knew better than to buy nice, fancy ones. They'd last me a week at best, but it was a fancy, heavy-bound journal that Blueberry gave me one day in the hallway after school. I didn't know what to say. It was an odd gift from someone whom I barely knew. There was something tainted about the journal. It was beautiful. A plush notebook etched with the design of an ancient map of China. And I swear the covers were of suede. It was expensive, enchanting, and it gave me the chills. The first ten pages consisted of yet another letter he had penned to me. The first several paragraphs talked of how I was the only one who, 
understood him, and he loved me. I stopped at that point. I could never bring myself to ride in it or throw it away. Instead, I tucked it in a keepsafe box that slept underneath my bed, along with all the other notes and trinkets. I told myself I was giving off the wrong signals. I told myself I was being silly and overreacting to someone who was perfectly nice. Christy told me, you're lucky that someone buys you something nice without even trying to sleep with you. Friends told me, ah, Blueberry's just a goof, but he's alright. I was grateful when the summer rolled around. Junior Year When school started back up, I had a boyfriend named Adam, brightly dyed red hair and a red car, so Blueberry inevitably faded into the background, whether he liked it or not. He had no driver's license, eschewed the alternative of a bicycle, and walked everywhere. Looking back, I realized that this made it harder for him to intercept me at lunch. When I zipped off to meet my older boyfriend at home for the hour-long break, the only times I would see Blueberry was when I was pulling out of the parking lot and I would see him doing his brisk, frustration-fueled strides in whatever direction. His eyes were always either angrily fixed at a point in the distance and his chin set in a tight line of frustration or seemed to be searching the area of high school students flooding the parking lot. Every now and then, he would spy my cherry red Volvo station wagon, which was embarrassingly hard to miss, and he would stare. As a side note, I used to dye my hair red. I loved it. Then I read what he put in the first four pages of the second journal he left on my windshield at school. I didn't dye my hair red again until I was 22. For the most part, humans can get a decent read on others. This wasn't the case with Blueberry. I could make neither head or tails of him and his behavior around me, and eventually my teenaged hormones finally said, fuck it. And by fuck it, I mean, I made no more efforts. I decided the best way to fix the situation was to not give a shit. If he talked to me, I would respond with short sentences, then bluntly turn and walk away. I didn't avoid him. Neither did I approach him or wave at him in the hallways like I had the year before. He was just another guy in the background. Let me add that in the meantime, the letters never stopped. The gifts came almost like clockwork. A journal left on my car with the first four pages scribbled with the words that I never bothered to read. A bouquet of daisies or roses given to me in the hallway that I promptly gave to a lonely looking freshman as I turned the next corner a book of fairy tales on my birthday, also with inscriptions inside. The journals, books, and letters were hardly ever actually read nor used, and all found a home in that keepsake box underneath my bed. I could never explain why I felt compelled to tuck them into the keepsake box, but I just did. At times I would feel guilt, and I would look for anything that I was doing to lead this insane boy on. What on earth compelled him to buy things for a girl that just didn't care? But in the end, my teenage psyche always lost interest and went back to scheming over how I was going to work around curfew and catch that wicked show happening at the local music venue on a school night. My junior year of high school wound down much like this. When school let out for summer, I was just happy to be able to be with friends and not worry about Blueberry. I came home one afternoon and sauntered into the kitchen to grab a snack. My father had just come home from work, barely beating me by five minutes, as I could tell by how he had already taken off his suit jacket and brought in the mail. He was leaning against the kitchen counter and plucking the bills from my mother's overflow of catalogs when I came up to peck him on the cheek and offer one of the two apples I'd retrieved. Hey there, hun, he mumbled, taking the apple. Whoa, hold up, kid. You've got mail. Lucky you. He flipped a rectangular manila envelope towards me and I took it. Who's sending me snail mail? I think to myself, popping open the sealed flap. Maybe it's grandma. Oh, does it feel like a check in here? I start to hum a Smith song as I pry open the brats that anchor the flaps. Girlfriend in coma. I pull the letter out. It's a single page of lined notebook paper. I shake the page. 
my eyes focus on the first line. I don't really want. Shit. I know that handwriting. Blueberry. I remember yelping in surprise and dropping the letters as if it had burned me. I remember grabbing the envelope and flipping it over to where the address should be, but I don't know why. I already knew it wouldn't make me feel better to see the street numbers I called home, along with my name carefully printed in the center. It did make me feel better, however, to see that a city in Colorado was listed in the top left's return address. Blueberry had left Texas, or so I hoped, because it sure made me sick to see that there was no postage stamp. He had to have hand-delivered it to my home, which he had somehow tracked down. The letter frightened me, in both its contents as well as the fact Blueberry had found out where I lived. I grilled all of our mutual friends, and they all swore that they hadn't been the ones to give out the information. In the letter itself, he sounded almost angry with me, or upset that I hadn't made good on some sort of agreement. Who knows? Thankfully, that was the last I heard of Blueberry. For several years, anyway. Fast forward to spring 2008, where I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but preparing to move back to my hometown to kick a nasty drug habit and get a fresh start on life. I'd taken a break from packing up my apartment and headed to the library to clear my head and check my space. Ah, 2008. There was a friend request waiting for me when I logged in. Yeah, the cliché reappearance that the protagonist soon ruse. It was Blueberry. Still, to this day, I have no idea what possessed me to accept the request, but I did. Immediately I got a message from him. It was quite civilized actually. He asked how I was doing and even offered an apology for his behavior in high school. I was pleasantly surprised and appreciated the gesture and sent him a response saying so, along with a brief synopsis of my plans on moving back home. By the time I clicked send, my allotted time on the computer was up, so I logged out and headed back to my place to prepare for the move back home the next day. Three days and one state later, I was back home and finally feeling human as the bumps and bruises of the move subsided. It had been a busy few days, and I gladly sat down in front of my father's laptop to check my email and social media. I logged into MySpace and began to work through the stack of accumulated messages. I opened the reply from Blueberry. It had been sent almost immediately after I'd sent my reply several days ago. Well, that's a coincidence. Blueberry was moving back to our hometown as well. Godspeed to him in all of his endeavors was all I thought of it. I didn't think I would be running into him often, as our old group of friends had long since disbanded to get married, move away, or get locked up. I just picked up a job waiting tables at a 24-hour diner chain, Denny's, and enrolled in a summer college course. Life went on, but not for that long. I had just started the swing shift at work, and I was at the counter, filling up salt and pepper shakers, and setting up the floor before the dinner rush hit, when he walked in. I knew who he was while he was still in my peripheral. He slid into the swivel chair and mumbled what I can only imagine was a hello. Then he put his right hand on mine, which was wrapped around the salt tumbler I'd been refilling. Terror and confusion paint my insides. Another spike in blood pressure as he squeezes down hard, if only for a second before releasing his grip. He stares and he mumbles. I just want to quickly pause for a second. This is the part of the story that I find myself taking the longest time to write because I keep exiting my word program and distracting myself with unimportant busy work to avoid writing about what comes next. You see, this is the part where I left the door wide open for him to step in and catch me off guard. I could have prevented all of this had I just done something different. It's something I'm still angry with myself over. It's never easy to talk about, so I'm probably going to skip out on a lot of details and deliver the bare bones. I've dragged my heels through this story to this point, so use all the details you know about me and Blueberry that I've given so far to put together the big picture. 
This is going to be the first time I've ever told this story in its entirety, much less the final chapter. I may or may not be able to finish. And now I'll get back to the story. I should have told him to fuck off that day. I should have listened to my gut, which was screaming profanities at my rationalizing everything away brain. I knew that he moved from Colorado back down to our hometown because I was there. I knew that he'd taken my reply on MySpace as a sign of declaring my undying love to him and his twisted mind. I knew deep down that he was the same scary fuck that found out where I lived in high school. But a part of me had truly thought we'd matured past that point and all that wishful thinking. Instead, I smiled politely, nodded, and excused myself to do anything but be around him. I ended up in the bathroom dry heaving. Anxiety's a bitch. I was stuck. I was the only waitress on the floor until seven, a good three hours away, and I had a credit card payment due in three days. I couldn't leave the floor. I remember talking to myself like a crazy person. He'd only said one word. I was being ridiculous. Nobody is twisted enough to do that over a girl that's barely spoken to him or returned any affections. Ludicrous. And who knows what he actually said back there or what he meant by touching my hand. He could just be surprised to see me. So who's really the crazy person here? It must be me. But then why had he looked at me as if he was gloating, as if he was hungry? I dry heaved to the porcelain gods again, dart off to the floor, stay busy, stay away from the counter, and especially stay away from Blueberry. Unbeknownst to me, while I went about avoiding him, Blueberry applied for a position as a dishwasher. He was hired on the spot. I found out the next day as I clocked in and saw him carefully studying the employee schedule. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't have time to think either. I managed to somehow change clothes, tie my apron, dry heave yet again, from anxiety several times, before my shaking legs found their way onto the floor. Like I said before, so much of it is a blur. I'm typing this as fast as I can to get to the end of this nightmare story. I don't remember many specific incidents leading up towards the end. I remember Friday night bar rush when he yelled at a 65-year-old man, a regular of mine that I'd come to think of as grandpa because he thought he was looking at me with pervert eyes. I remember how many times he tried to stop me while I was neck deep in the weeds with drunk and hungry customers catching my arm to make me stop and look at him. The last time, he grabbed me so hard, a bruise bloomed in place of his fingers the next morning. I remember the look of pure hatred and frustration that he gave every one of my male customers, and I remember how he said he would slit them from ear to ear if they ever touched me. I remember when my shift ended, and I held all of it in until I made it to the walk-in freezer, I just let out half a sob when the freezer door swung open and Blueberry had himself in front of me. I remember the metallic taste of fear as I looked up at him. What next? He was looking forward to the talk we would have after work, he said. Oh, the talk about us. Oh, God, no. I remember wanting to scrub my forehead with lye from where he bent down and kissed me before exiting the walk-in. He made me sick being so close to me. Dirty. I remember the desperate need to leave. I clock out, knowing that he won't be off until hours after I am. I can escape. I pull out of the parking lot and stop at a red light two blocks down. Find a friend to stay with. Figure all this out. God, I need my job. I think to myself. The passenger door opens. Fuck. It's him. When the hell did my passenger door not lock? Fuck. Did he? He broke my lock. He's in my car. I'm numb. He acts like this is a normal thing for us to do. My logic freezes. He gives me directions to his house, telling me how happy he is that I came around after all of these years of denying that what was between us was real. 
and I can't breathe. A part of me is giving up. A part of me is so mad at myself for being so weak and unable to stop all of this. Wait, I'm not completely numb. There's still some anger in me. I'm starting to get angry at this person who repeatedly refused to take no for an answer, who intentionally came back to our town with the narcissistic, presumptuous intent of claiming me now that I had supposedly come around. He came into my job and made sure to move in fast, hard, and aggressively because he knew this is what I would do. The only words I'd ever heard him speak clearly and without any mumbles was a threat to slit my customer's throat from ear to ear. He walked out of his first night on the job just to follow me and got into my car as I was at a stoplight. Fuck that. As I had the opportunity to sit and process the absurdity of the situation, I became temporarily lost in a fugue state of memory, realization, and gritty resolve. We reached his place and I snapped back to reality. Immediately, I saw that the front lawn was teeming with drunken partygoers. His roommate had thrown a keg party that drew enough people to fill a high school stadium. To this day, I consider this the only reason I felt brave enough to do what I did next. There were too many people around to see and hear things. I knew it, and he knew it, and he didn't seem happy with it. I followed him into the house. I let him take me to his room. I stood in the open doorway and balked as he tugged on my wrist to pull me into the room, for God knows what reason. And it was like another person was speaking through me. Stay the hell away from me. I have never and will never be interested in you as a friend or anything else. You know what the hell you've been trying to do, and you've been trying to do it since I was 15. Don't come near me again. You need professional help, you son of a bitch. Then I realized how quiet it was. I swear to God, everyone in that party stopped and stared at us. It was so quiet and all the blood in my body was pumping in a war dance of fear disguised as rage. I saw him falter, and we locked eyes. I could tell he was grasping, and then I tried to pull away. He was strong. Then he screamed. God, I'll never forget how angry he looked. He wasn't mumbling. He screamed so clearly. Just fucking lay with me tonight. Why won't you just lay down on the bed, you stew? He lurched forward like a tension-bearing spring to drag me into his room. It was at this point the bodies flew at him. Several of them. They tackled Blueberry to the floor. Beer was flying everywhere. The froth was landing in my hair. My shirt was wet with a faint scent of fresh hops. They were screaming. Hands on hands. Girl hands. Nails digging into Blueberry's iron fingers. I could feel my blood slowing at the pockets where he had me firmly. My arms must be blue, I thought to myself before I saw the girls. Three of them, blonde and red. Run, come on, get away from him, they yell. His fingers are slipping claws, but the long solar nails of three women are too much. He flinches with a jerk that forces him to let go. He disappeared under the heaps of bodies. My legs worked again. I ran to my car. I ran the fuck away. I still don't know who the men who tackled him were. Neither do I know the names of the women who scratched their own nails into Blueberry's skin so that he would let go and they could flank me in protection as I ran to my car. Still to this day, I don't think I've ever been faced with a truer definition of solidarity than the act right there. They didn't even know who I was when they all dove in. I don't know what kind of spiritual force is out there roaming the purple evenings with those who are alone, but more nights than not, I say a little thank you to the skies, hoping at least one of them hear me. I owe those strangers a great deal. Now that I've said that, the thing of this part of the story is, it's not over. It hasn't gotten bad yet. Not by a long stretch. The final part was the hardest to write, and I still get sick to my stomach 
thinking about it at times. At this point, I wish I could say it's over. It's not. Stalkers are persistent. They don't think like you and I do. What I had done the night I told Blueberry no was something good and bad. Good in that I had acted loudly enough to become a person to him, not an object bad in the sense that I'd set down boundaries that conflicted with his intents, and I had done it in a crowd of people, embarrassing him. I knew that where he had just seen me as a living doll before, he would now see me as someone to be punished. This is what I thought to myself as I stared at the ceiling. I'd barely slept after crashing through my front door and quickly, desperately checking each window and door's lock in my father's house before collapsing in a heap by the bed. My father wasn't home, as he usually stayed over at his new girlfriend's place. I didn't mind, it was nice to see him in love. It took years off of his face, and I didn't want to put those years back on with my predicament. I didn't want to see the look in his eyes if he saw the branches of broken blood vessel blossoms that ran up my arm in dull spirals of pain. I didn't want to see him and Blueberry in the same room. I didn't want him to feel disappointed or upset with me. I'd kicked the habit and worked diligently on my decision-making skills, but my helplessness in dealing with Blueberry seemed to me a return to a life I thought I'd left behind. No, better to figure this out myself. He'd spent enough sleepless nights worrying about me. I was suddenly thankful for my parents' recent divorce. My mother stayed behind in the house I grew up in, and my father had rented out a lovely house in an adjacent neighborhood. Blueberry couldn't possibly find me here. With that comforting thought, I pulled myself out of the bed and dressed. I remember picking a shirt with sleeves to cover the bruises he'd left. I didn't even care that it was easily a hundred degrees outside. Anything to keep me from seeing and remembering his brand on me. I padded towards the kitchen stopping at the large glass window panes that faced the open schoolyard across the street. I pulled back the blinds and took in the grassy, sun-drenched view. I liked the house. It was open. I could see anybody coming, but it was quiet for now. In the kitchen, I stepped into the cupboard and plucked a fresh bag of chips. I was starving. I had just started to pull open the bag of chips when the banging started. Boom, boom, boom. They were a parody of polite knocks. I had no idea how he had found me. Still to this day, I still don't. But it doesn't matter how, just that he did. But I knew who was behind the door. Just as that person knew that I was hiding in there somewhere. At the very first echo of Blueberry's fist hitting the front door, my legs turned to dust beneath me. The bag of chips burst as I collided with linoleum. My body's momentum transforms the potato shards into a million traders echoing every move. I was sobbing silently. Hiding behind the fridge and watching the shadows slide along the floor to where I'd just been seconds ago. Gazing out the window with that false sense of safety. Boom, boom, boom again. Then there was silence. My phone buzzed on the counter. I stretched my arm upward and clutched that little electric beacon of freedom. A text from 303 area code, Colorado. Him. The text illuminates the screen. My dear, I know you're in there. Let me in. I have your favorite subway sandwich for you. And a surprise. Jesus, how did he get my number? My sleeve had been pushed back from the reach for my phone. I see the bruises again. A friendly reminder from Blueberry. Some of them are in the same shade as his name. The knocks have been quiet and there is no more shadow on the wooden floor by the window. I remember that there was a click in my brain at that moment. Something finally connected. My survival instincts are finally triggered, and I shift from frozen into overdrive. I am no longer human. I am a gazelle running from the lion. Chips crunch under my shoes as I snap up to my feet. 
keys and phone in hand, and I run for the sake of everything I love in this world. I hear metal creak behind me back in the kitchen just as I slam the front door open. All that sunlight outside charges every cell in my bruised body, and from the front steps, I dive into my car from through the open passenger side window. I leave a perfect arc of rubber marks on the driveway as I reverse, swivel my head and scan the yard for him. There is nowhere to hide in this wide open neighborhood. Nothing. He is unseen. The gas pedal is one with the floorboard. I'm thankful the students of the elementary school across the street are not out for recess because I would braid them into the sticky tarmac without a second thought if they'd stood between me and safety. That is the level of my fear. I keep driving, blowing through all yields and stops. I wonder if I'm crazy. My phone buzzes with another text from that Colorado number. No, not crazy. Scared. Not of death. Not yet, anyway. I'm scared of what he'll do to make me return to his normalcy. I am a doll to him. What happens when dolls start to speak? When they run like a gazelle away from his playroom rules? What happens if the lion catches the gazelle? I dry heave and sob at once. Oh god, the fear. I feel like he's with me right now, watching. It does occur to me to call the police, but what do I tell them? They would look at me like I was crazy just like everyone else had assured me that Blueberry was fine. Just odd. So very odd. Maybe I still am the crazy one. I'm going 55 in a 25 after all, but I know that I can't be alone at this moment. I pick up my phone, dial the number for Brandon. He lives the closest. I have to redial twice. Blueberry keeps texting, and the alerts make me exit my keypad. His messages tell me about the lack of appreciation for the things he does for me. I dry heave again. I'm still going 55. Finally, I'm able to input all seven digits. Hello? Brandon's voice is an angelic sound. I cry. All that comes out is the name of the street I'm on. He directs me to park a block away from where I am. I see him. He sees me. I leave the keys in the ignition, but turn the car off. I run across the green field to him. I feel like I can't do anything but run for dear life. Brandon catches me, holds me tightly by the arms with two big hands. My bruises hurt under his palms. My lungs are on fire. I can't stop my legs from twitching. I babble. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He found me. Please don't tell him where I am, Brandon. Please. I collapse on the soft grass. Brandon tells me later on that he pieced the story together from what he could hear me say, curled up in a fetal position on the grass, babbling about blueberries, bruises, and being an object. He wasn't sure what to make of it, and admits that he thought I was back on the shit and was having a bad come down. Then he goes to retrieve the keys to my car from the ignition. My phone is on the front seat, still lighting up incessantly with messages from a 303 number. Brandon sees this. He opens my phone and reads several of the 52 messages sent in the last half hour. He said he couldn't bear to read anymore after seeing the one that included a photo of my open underwear drawer. It dawned on Brandon that Blueberry is inside my home and enjoys letting me know. Brandon hugs me and talks to me until Carly and Kate get to the park. Carly and Kate will take me to their house, where we will call the police. Brandon has warrants so he can't be there with us, but before he leaves, he hugs me so fiercely and reminds me that I'm real and not plastic. He whispers into Carly's ear and advises her to check the messages on my phone if she doesn't believe. She makes it to the messages where he tells me that he will shave my red harlot's hair off if I don't come back and be good. My phone rings. Carly answers. It's my father. Kate drives my car home. They stay as I hear what's happened. 
the next door neighbor had been in her kitchen when she saw me run out of the door and peel out of the driveway. The clue, she said, was how I'd thrown myself into the car through the window, as if I couldn't waste a minute without opening a door. She went closer to her window to watch the scene. As my car faded away, she looked at the front door of the house. She saw a tall, thin man coming out of the front door and staring into the direction I'd gone. She said he looked angry and I looked terrified. She called the police. My father, unaware of all of this, came home soon after the neighbor placed the call. Blueberry was back outside on the porch by then, perched on the step, watching and waiting. My father stared at the strange boy on his steps. He saw the tire tracks and absence of my car. Blueberry calmly looked up at my father, met his gaze, and blankly said that he was thinking about getting me a vanity for my birthday. My father tells me that Blueberry stood up and placed himself between my dad and the door. My father was a criminal defense attorney for 30 years. He's a stoic, tough man who's defended countless killers, thieves, addicts, people who have sexually assaulted, and the truly innocent before a jury of peers. Not much shakes him, yet the tremor in my father's voice is perceptible as he tells me this. He stares Blueberry down and simply says, Do you pay for this house, boy? I don't answer to you. Get out of my way. Blueberry moves. My father goes inside, disturbed by the boy on the stairs and glad that I'm not here. In the kitchen, he sees the crushed bag of chips on the floor, the mess in the kitchen. He can see the signs of frantic movement etched in the carpet of chips. He can see that the back door is wide open. I would never leave it like that. He also remembers that the front door had been unlocked. He and I share a paranoia of unlocked doors. And it was then that my father knew something was very wrong. He feels sick. He sprints to the front door. Hey, kid. He roars at Blueberry's retreating back. He'd taken off down the street when he heard the sirens. The police cars called by the neighbor pull up at this point. One patrol goes in pursuit of Blueberry. The other stays to talk to my father, who is calling my phone, and our astute neighbor, who relates what she'd seen through the window. The police ask if I know this man who was on the stairs. Carly gives them my phone as an answer. My father sees over the cop's shoulder, turns pale, and closes his eyes. I see the years go back on his face. I can't stop crying. I can't get a word out. All I can do is lead them all to my bedroom, where Carly holds up the bed skirt as I reach underneath and pull out the three keepsake boxes that I have filled with the last five years' worth of Blueberry's gifts and letters. Carly brings me a yearbook. I cry harder and harder as I open up the page with his class photo on it and point at his full name. I'm crying this hard because it's over. I'm crying this hard because it could have been over long before this point. The officer bags up the contents of the boxes and the flashes of cameras capture any traces of what had happened that afternoon. I give a short statement once I can speak coherently. They don't find Blueberry but my father secures protective orders quickly with the connections he has. He looks so tired. It must have been so easy to protect me when I was small, when he could be the barrier between me and the monsters he dealt with on a daily basis. But that time has long since passed. All he could do now was make phone calls and pray to a god he did not believe in. He did not tell me about the journal left on the doorstep until years later. The one that he didn't turn over to the police. The one that had photos of me sleeping. Photos of me naked and fresh out of the shower. Even some of me kissing my ex-boyfriend. Adam's face in these were scratched out and left hollow. All of them taken at times when I had assumed I was alone. I arranged to stay the night with Carly. She tells me the next morning that I'd started screaming in my sleep and did not stop until she crawled into the bed with me 
and wrapped me in her tiny arms. I'm grateful to her. I think her touch is what kept me from remembering any nightmares I had that night. It felt so good to just sleep. We moved soon afterwards, my father and I. We spoke of the incident only once more when I walked into the kitchen of the new house and saw my father at the table with a tumbler of bourbon in hand, flipping through a mound of papers with the other. They were the letters from Blueberry. He had retrieved them after evidence processed them. He intended to put them in his safety deposit box. I'll never forget the grim reasoning behind his voice as the lawyer in him spoke. Well, if you ever turn up murdered, at least I'll have this and that fucking journal to prove exactly who did it. I haven't seen or heard of Blueberry since that day. It's been five years and it's taken two weeks of writing to get all of this out. There's so much to this story, and it's so harrowing, yet it's relieving to be able to put this all down together in chronological order, and know that I lived through it. Thanks. I needed this. My story begins summer of 2012. The first encounter happens before I'm leaving to go out of town for a summer study program. At the time, my mom didn't have AC, which meant we would leave the front door open as we watched TV before bed. Not smart, but the breeze was nice and we were naive. My friend was over as she was coming to drop me off and we fell asleep with the door open. We both woke up and discussed how we had weird dreams of a large man walking through the house. That's all we remember. Next thing you know, my friend is missing cash and cigarettes. Now, no one in the house smokes, and we destroyed the house searching for both cash and cigarettes. We were terrified to tell my mom that we forgot to shut the door, and my mom felt awful that my friend's cash went missing, so she replaced it, and we just forgot about it. I returned from the program about two months later. I was in my room. It was around 2 a.m., and my mom habitually fell asleep on the living room floor after working a long shift. I was texting a friend about a fight I was having with my boyfriend at the time, and then I hear something odd. My mom has jingles on the back door at this time because my sister and I at the time would sneak out, and it's how she would catch us. I listen to the jingle start shaking, and I realize that the back door is opening and closing. I start to freeze and text my friend. I think someone just walked into my house. Now, my mom's house is a ranch in a suburb. Small, cozy house, and you learn everyone's footsteps. My mom's are light, quick, and shuffled. The person walking through my house from the back door has heavy steps and they're trying to be quiet. I hear them open, look through a drawer, and scatter metal in the kitchen. I worry and think to myself, did they just try to search for a knife? I don't have the courage to scream or face the culprit. I text my friend to call 911 immediately. She thinks I'm teasing or being dramatic. I stop texting and listen to the person go into my sister's room. I can see from my window they had flicked on her lights for what felt like forever. Thankfully, she was at her friend's having a sleepover. I began to worry that they were going to open my door and come into my room. They didn't. This whole time, my heart is racing and I'm frozen. They walk over to the living room where my mom is still asleep on the floor. And from what I remember, I think they just watched her. Eventually, they left. I immediately call my mom who was feet away from me and ask if she was just walking around. She says, What? I immediately start to have a panic attack, scream for her to run to my room, and frantically explain what happened. Finally, the police department call me because my friend did call them, and they asked if everything was okay. I shout on the phone what happened, and they sent over some police officers. The police did a search around my house and saw footprints in the mud, 
right outside my bedroom window. They asked if my mom, sister, and I had partners or exes that may want to stalk us. We all hadn't at the time. I did admit to what happened two months prior, and it could have been the same person preying on us. We were all so freaked out about the incident, but it doesn't end there. Months later, my mom again has fallen asleep with the TV on in the living room. By now, we have a paranoid system of making sure the doors and windows are locked. We have thick window curtains too, but sometimes with the sun setting, you forget to put them down. My mom is half awake watching TV when she noticed a reflection in the window. She stares at it and thinks it's the TV glare when it waves at her. All of a sudden, I hear her screaming and stomping out the door. You fucks. Fuck you. I chase after her. She's out the door, chasing a giant white van. The culprit got away. My mom chased them. I had to yell at my mom it was probably not the smartest to number one, not call the police immediately. Number two, open the door to them. And number three, chase after them without any protection. Because who knows? But luckily they left her alone. We never found out who it was, and since then we've never had another incident. That we know of, at least. But whenever I visit home, there's always an eerie, unspoken paranoia. Back in 2008, I was in a hiking slash sightseeing tour with a well-known rugged travel outfitter. The tour started in New Delhi, India, and ended in Kathmandu, Nepal. Halfway through the tour, we meander our way to Varanasi, where there were rumors of strikes in Nepal, mainly Lumbini and the Chitwan National Park area. So instead of taking a bus to the border to get to the park in Nepal, we took a plane. Crisis averted, right? We landed in Kathmandu, and of course the baggage handlers decided to strike. We had to wait about five hours to get our bags. We stayed about a day at Kathmandu, and that's round where the strike ended. We proceeded with the trip to Chitwan National Park and staying at a homestay for a few days. After a few days of getting our fill of elephant riding, hippo watching, and tiger tracking, there were rumors going around in the village about a huge strike happening the next day with travel on the roads potentially barred with the threat of death. We all decided to head out extremely early so we would not be stuck in Chitwan for potentially days. So around 3 a.m., 11 members of the group, our guide and I and the driver, decide to head out into the dark and on to Kathmandu. It was quiet for about the 15 to 20 minutes of driving in the dark. Lots of meandering turns around small villages and lakes. However, that was stopped short. We saw a small minibus torched, fires burning wildly, and soon we were stopped by these masked villagers holding sticks. One of them came to the driver's side and pulled the driver out. They proceeded to repeatedly smack him in his face over and over. Another masked man tried to open our passenger door. Luckily, it could only be opened by one side and luckily it was held tightly closed by a burly Australian member of our group. While this was going on, another masked man broke our back window. This resulted in a few of us crying in fear. My cousin, a few other guys, and I were thinking of breaking out of the car and tackling these masked men with skirts. We figured the combined arms of a few Americans, Aussies, and a German would be able to take them down, right? No sooner than we thought of that plan, motorcycles started roaring in close by, carrying Molotov cocktails. Shit. Our guide and the driver started pleading with them, saying that we're tourists, there are women in the bus, and that we will go back in peace. Just let us go. They eventually let us go. They told us to turn around and not to come back until the strike is over. To this day, Every time I hear glass break, I cringe and remember these events clearly.
Just for context, my boyfriend and I are homeless and we live in our car. There is a road that leads to a quiet beach on the bay near some train tracks, and there's only one road to exit, so not a lot of people come down this way. Unless it's for beach access, people going to work in the industrial plants on the road, going to AA meetings, or if they're sleeping in their cars as well. Nothing in the area was open except maybe a couple of bars, and even those were a good three to four blocks away. Most of the stretch of the road has eight-hour parking signs, so there are usually at least a few other people camped for the night, most of whom we have seen before. But tonight, there weren't as many. There were just a few vehicles taking advantage of the overnight parking. We parked a little further up the road than we normally do, hoping to get better internet connection. It was a little after 12.30am, and we were relaxing, watching YouTube with the dogs, starting to get sleepy when we heard a car pull up behind us with their lights off. We completely cover our windows so nobody can see in, but we can peek out if we move the blanket and we can see headlights from cars passing or approaching. My boyfriend said it was a van. We didn't think much of it and kept trying to watch our show, annoyed with the spotty Wi-Fi connection. There was a few words exchanged on what sounded like the other side of the street, not behind us where the van pulled up. It sounded like there were three or four people. A little while later, the van drove off. Then we heard a knock on my side of the window. We shut off the volume on the laptop and called out, Yeah? There was silence, so we called out, Can we help you? But again, there was nothing. It was then that I realized that my door was unlocked, so I quickly locked it. After about 30 seconds of quiet, I pulled open the cover and no one was there. There are sometimes homeless walking around. They could have thought we were someone else. It was silent for a while. Then we could see in the light of the street lamp through the crack on the sun reflector covering the front windshield the silhouette of someone walking around the front of the car slowly. It was another solid minute after we saw the movement before we heard a quiet tapping on the passenger side window. This time, my boyfriend pulled the cover down almost right away, and again, we didn't see who it was. Right after this, there was a knock on my side again. It was right about then we realized that there was still more than one person around the car. There was no time for one person to get from the passenger side to my side between the second and third knock, and we heard more than one voice prior. I started to think that maybe not everyone had gotten back inside the van before it drove off. So after the third knock, I pulled my window cover down again almost all the way, really annoyed and on edge by now. There was a skinny white guy, probably in his mid-thirties to early forties, holding a flashlight and something else scooped awkwardly in the other hand, almost like he was keeping it under his sweatshirt, but we couldn't make it out. The windows were steamed up from us breathing inside with the windows shut tight, so it was pretty difficult to see outside. He said, Hey, I need a jump. Interesting, since there are no stores nearby. There's no reason to be down here at 1am. Sorry, we're just about to take off. We're in a rush. The guy got frustrated and whined. Come on, I've been down here for hours. Okay, if he had been down here for hours, why did he not A. Ask us to help him out about 45 minutes prior when we pulled up, parked, let our dog get out to eat and go to the bathroom, and then got our bed set up, or B. Attempt to start the car at any point. We never heard a motor rev up, an attempt to turn the engine on or even the jingling of keys. Another reason that creeped me out is that I could only see him. He said, I need a jump. I have been down here for hours, when I could clearly hear that there was more than one person around, but we couldn't see them. For one reason or another, they were standing out of view, not making themselves known. After this, he grumbled and went across the street to a white car with black rims that we had seen before but not associated with. I got this awful feeling in my gut 
and even though all the windows were steamed up, I started the car and told my boyfriend to start wiping the windows so I could see, and I just started driving. We could feel that there was something sinister about the whole situation. For one reason or another, they were trying to get us to open a door or window. When that didn't work, they didn't respond because they didn't have a good reason made up yet. So after a couple of attempts to get us to open the door, they gave us the sob story, hoping we would get out of the car so they could either steal the car while we were trying to help them, get to my boyfriend, or they were trying to rob us for the laptop which I'm sure they could hear and see the glow of the screen. The possibilities are unsettling and endless. Or, maybe he was just a guy who happened to need a jump at 1am, nowhere near any stores or houses, and I'm that asshole that left some poor guy down there on the side of the road, right? Well, we drove to McDonald's to eat something, and parked in the back driveway of someone we knew, so that we weren't right out in the open anymore. The lock on our trunk recently broke, and it's only held together with bungee cords, with most of our belongings inside, so it worries me that it could make us an easier target for thieves. The next morning, we were down there again and the white car with black rims was still there, only now the back window was busted out, and the man was nowhere in sight. I think it was never his car to begin with. I think all of those people came in the van and one of them drove off, so that the rest of them could rob someone outright, or so they could break into the parked cars on the side of the street when no one was in them. It was really stressful, and my boyfriend has been rattled for days. We are nervous to park in the same spot, so we're now looking to rent a residential driveway to park at night, where we won't be so vulnerable. My boyfriend teased the dogs for not barking, but I think it was very intuitive of him, because if we needed to pretend we weren't inside of the car, we would have been able to do so. Maybe it would have scared them right off. I like knowing he will wait and watch me to know what to do in stressful situations. I'm just so relieved that I was not down there by myself. Even the two of us together were pretty nervous, knowing that we were likely outnumbered. But if it were just a 120-pound female like myself in the car alone, I'm worried that they may have been a bit more aggressive about getting the door opened. Sometimes I think I watch too many murder investigation shows and conspiracy theory videos, and that may make me paranoid. Maybe it's the fact that my grandfather was a sex crime and homicide detective for 30 years in the same area, and I grew up with him constantly warning me of the dangers that lurk in the dark and what can happen to a person. He taught me that real monsters are not boogeymen. They are just plain men. A series of events started to happen when I was very young. I was around eight to nine. There is a chance the series were not connected. My feeling is... It's all connected to one disturbed man. The first event was that the phone started ringing almost every night, between 2 and 2.30 a.m. Being a light sleeper, it woke me constantly. My parents didn't ever appear to be bothered, probably because they were both drunk almost every night and passed out, even when I did complain. They would just respond by saying it was probably the wrong number or something along those lines. It gave me a bad feeling every night, hearing that loud rattling landline phone ringing in the kitchen. One night, out of curiosity and frustration, when the phone rang, I decided to answer it. I heard some distant music in the background, and some heavy breathing. Now being older, I can say it sounded like someone was sitting in a bar. Eventually, my parents changed the number. A few months after my parents changed the number, I was awoken again by a different sound. There's something creepy about hearing noises at night in an isolated country house. Every little sound can be heard. Every sound lingers. You can feel it. So when I heard the car slowing down on the road in front of our house, it woke me with an unsettling feeling. 
I remember I could hear how the tires drove over the gravel in the driveway. My heart sank. I looked up at the wooden square clock in my bedroom. It was 2.17 a.m. For reasons I cannot explain, I crawled out of my bed and walked out to the living room and glanced out the windows that hung above the driveway. I kept my distance from the window so he couldn't see me. I stared down at him through the sheer curtains. A man in a dark-colored Buick Century sat in the car facing my house. I couldn't make out the distinctive facial features. I could see that he had light-colored hair with a bowl-cut style. If I had to guess now, I would say he was in his early to mid-thirties. He just sat there. He stared up at my house in a trance. I don't even remember him moving. I waited to see what he was going to do. I was filled with fear. Around 15 minutes, he just sat there. Then he very slowly backs up and drives away. He kept his eyes on the house as he drove. So maybe it was a wrong house or he was drunk. Who knows? Then I think he visited again. It was a Sunday evening and I was in the front yard playing with my siblings. I still remember that dreaded feeling of returning to school the next day. A car pulls up and it stops in front of the mailbox down the road. Our house was on a little hill with a back road in front. The mailbox was down on the road. We stopped playing and watched down in curiosity. We knew it was Sunday and the mail doesn't come on that day and it's not even the regular mailman's car. The man continued to sit there, staring up at us. At one point, he reached his arm out to the window and acted like he put something in the mailbox. He then drove about 50 yards up the road and stopped and sat. My siblings told me to go check the mailbox. I don't know why they told me to. Maybe it's because I was the youngest. I walked down the little hill and opened the mailbox and nothing was in it. Suddenly, I hear the tires screeching and the car was flying towards me in reverse. I screamed and we all ran into the house. He drove off very fast. We told our parents and they thought we were confused and minimized the situation. That night, while lying in bed, it clicked in my head. That man was the same man that came that one night. It was the same car and I remember the blonde hairstyle. An unsettling feeling sank in. About a year after that, one day in school, I heard teachers telling kids to avoid a dark-colored Buick. They said a man was trying to kidnap kids at their mailbox after getting off the bus. I moved out of that town a few years later when my parents got divorced. Every once in a while, he comes to me in my dreams, but I haven't heard anything about this man since. Yesterday, I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area. For some background, the last time we went was about a year ago. A car drove by and screamed, Nice ass, at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location. Due to the lake's reputation, I'd made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4 p.m. without him. Now on to the story. My 12 year old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up at our favorite fishing spot. A small pond on the opposite side of the road is the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if there were fish in the pond. I replied that we'd just gotten started, so nothing yet, but that we'd caught fish in the pond on plenty of the other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. About 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son. Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky, and I could tell we weren't going to have any luck. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. 
As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, Sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him it's no problem and we're simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mom taking her kid fishing, how you don't see that very often, that kind of thing. I get this a lot so I'm pretty used to it. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault, so I answer his question. I tell him I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25. He tells me he's 38 and I'm too kind, and I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers, so they always guess well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work, and I stupidly tell him my city. It turns out he lives there too, and he starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program. Weird flex, but okay man. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle, and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take a hint and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean, it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now my alarm bells are blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typical dad thing with my kid. Now he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left, but I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite even when we're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes he'll see I'm not some meek, submissive woman who's going to agree with him. After all, I'm a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes he'd leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated, I tell him, oh, well you wouldn't like me at all. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean, it's okay to be loud I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know. I say, my man doesn't tell me shit, I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, Yeah, say that again, honey. This distracted the creep long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe, though. Unbeknownst to the creep, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks, but at least they're the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice. Nothing. Of all the times for my car to act up, it chooses now. Panic has now set in. As I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he now takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life and I peel out of there. Only then do I let my composure crumble and have a long talk with my son about what just happened. To the older gentleman who took notice of my discomfort and provided a distraction, I'd gladly meet with you again any day. To the younger misogynistic creep, I don't know if I was actually in any danger from you, but my gut said I was. Let's never meet again. Oh, and to my dad, I'll make you a new deal. I'm never going to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. Last November, my brother was visiting us from Dundee with his three-year-old son. Since my brother had moved from Glasgow, we didn't get to see him or his family too often. 
so we cherished it any time we got to see them. His wife, unfortunately, could not travel down due to work, and only a day into his visit, he was called back for an emergency. His nephew wanted to stay as we bought him tickets to the football the day after, so I agreed to take him back to his dad in Dundee after the game. The only train I could get was a fairly late one, and it was therefore the last one of the day. So I took my nephew to the football and headed straight to the station afterwards. The train was fairly busy, but I'd booked us two seats. Just as we were about to board the train, the man standing next to me made an odd comment. Like sardines, aren't they? I hate sardines, he said. I found this fairly odd, and I just laughed it off awkwardly. As we made our way to our seats, I noticed an old couple sitting in them. I told them it was our seats, but they were fairly rude and told me that old people shouldn't be made to stand for a journey. I've always hated confrontation, especially in public, so I just left. There were no two seats together anywhere on the train, so me and my nephew were forced to stand for about an hour until many people on the train finally got off when it stopped in Perth. Me and my nephew sat down, and I mistakenly fell asleep as I was so tired after a fairly long day and standing for an hour on the train. As my nephew was only three, he obviously fell asleep as well. I awoke just as the last passengers were getting off at Dundee. I jumped up and tried to get my nephew off the train as quickly as possible, but he was too slow and I had to stay on the train with him, meaning we missed the stop. As the train was delayed slightly, it was now going straight to Aberdeen, which was about another hour or so away. I sat down and tried to phone anyone I knew, but I didn't have any signal. I began to panic as I knew that there would be no return trains from Aberdeen at this time of night likely meaning I would have to stay the night there in a hotel. I tried to compose myself and looked about the train to see if there was anyone who could maybe help me. My carriage had more or less cleared out by this point and there were only three people left. An older woman sleeping a few rows in front of me, a young man reading a book at the opposite side, and a third man behind me. I told my nephew to go back to sleep, and I started trying to plan what I would do when we got to Aberdeen. As my phone had no signal, this was obviously fairly difficult. I decided I should ask the man behind me for any help. I looked in the window's reflection at him, and noticed it was the same man who made the sardine comment earlier. He was a middle-aged man, fairly average build and height, and there was nothing to suggest he was in any way dangerous. Except one thing, he was staring right back at me. I looked away for a minute, thinking maybe he was just looking about the train as I did only a moment ago. But when I looked again, he was still staring. His stare didn't seem to break until he got up, presumably to go to the bathroom. I debated switching to another carriage, but before I could gather my stuff and wake up my nephew, he returned. Only this time, he sat in a different seat, facing me directly. A few uneasy minutes went by before he made his first comment. Someone's sleepy, he said, nodding to my nephew. I laughed awkwardly and put my earphones in to avoid having to talk to him, even though my phone had just died. Must be some set of earphones if they can listen to music when your phone's dead, he said. My heart dropped. I'm only kidding you on, he said. But I now had no excuse to avoid conversation with him. So are you going home or visiting someone, he asked. I made the mistake of telling him what had happened and that I'd missed my stop. That's quite the situation. You won't get a train back at this time. I nodded and said I'll just find a hotel for the night. He then approached my seat and sat across from me. Hotels will all be booked out, and even if they aren't, they'll charge you a fortune. I've got a place not far from the station. You can stay there for the night and get the train in the morning. I'll stay out the way of you and your son, don't worry. I explained to the man that he was not my son, and that I was happy to cough up the money for a hotel. 
and I tried to stay polite by saying I didn't want to be a nuisance for him, even though I really just wanted to tell him to fuck off. Oh, believe me, you won't be any nuisance to me, he said in an overly friendly tone. I was now feeling extremely unnerved but still tried my best to talk myself out of the situation. This conversation carried on for another ten minutes or so, and he was increasingly insistent that I stayed with him. I didn't have any idea what to do. I felt completely helpless. I told him I needed the toilet in an effort to get away from the carriage. This is when he grabbed my wrist below the table. You are not going anywhere, he said in a hushed tone. You're staying with me. I'll keep you safe. He said in an extremely chilling voice. I couldn't even bring myself to scream out in the situation. The only other passengers on the carriage were at the opposite end, and I was terrified that if I screamed, the man would hurt me or my nephew. He wouldn't let go of my wrist and repeatedly began saying, Just act natural. The remaining part of the journey seemed to last a lifetime, and I knew even then there was no light at the end of this tunnel, as this man would not let me go. The train finally reached Aberdeen, and the man told me to wake my nephew, not to alarm him, and tell him we were staying at this nice man's house for the evening. He held my hand as we got off the train, and my worst feelings were coming true as I knew what would happen when this man got us back to his house. All of a sudden, I was knocked to the floor in a heap of bodies. The police had tackled the man and were arresting him. As I got to my feet, I grabbed my nephew's hand and ran only a couple of yards before completely breaking down. The police comforted me and told me that the young man who was reading his book at the other side of the carriage had noticed what was going on. He had sent a text to the British Transport Police, whose number is all over the walls of the train on posters. It took me a couple of minutes to process everything, but I managed to gain enough composure to thank the police and express my gratitude towards the man who had sent the text. I only managed to say a few words to him, but I will be forever grateful to him as he saved me from what would have been a night of terror and very possibly saved me and my nephew's lives. The police very kindly took my nephew and I back to Dundee, where my brother and his wife were extremely relieved to see us. It is now some time since the incident, but it has had a lasting effect on me, and I always make sure that when I'm traveling late at night that I'm accompanied by someone and never run the risk of missing my stop ever again. So this story took place when I was 12. It's more than half my lifespan ago, but I still get really uneasy when thinking back to it. I tried to block it from my mind and not guess as to what could have happened, if not for two kind strangers. I was walking home from school one day. I was alone, however. At one of the intersections I cross, there was a tall, dirty-looking man that noticed me. I would guess his age was early 30s, being a kid back then, I struggled telling the age of adults. He started following me and trying to strike up a conversation. He kept telling me that I was beautiful and that he wants us to be friends. He asked me where I live and if my parents would be home. He asked me so many questions, but I tried to just shrug him off and be polite. I didn't answer any of his questions. I just increased the pace at which I walked. When we were nearing the block on which I lived, I started becoming really uneasy. He wanted to follow me home, and I did not want him to. I felt he gave off a weird vibe, because adults did not usually speak to me that way. The only way I could get rid of him would be to give him my cell phone number and agree to answer when he calls. Because this situation made me uncomfortable, I gave him a fake number and hightailed it out of there. A few months passed without me running into that man again, so I completely put this out of my mind. He was probably just some random weirdo. However, as you can guess from here, things did not stay that way. 
One day, I found myself walking home after school again. I will admit that I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings. It wasn't until I heard what sounded like footsteps running up behind me. I turned around to look, and it was the same creepy man that I'd encountered before. He slowed his pace as he reached me, but he was yelling the entire time. He figured out that I'd given him the wrong number, and he was furious. He kept yelling and yelling that I think I'm better than him. That's why I gave him a fake number. I was terrified in that moment as he was very aggressive. I was afraid that he was going to hurt me, but I couldn't grab the attention of any motorists. I sped walked to the closest gas station with him following behind me, still yelling at me the entire time. When I got to the gas station, I immediately got the attention of two burly men standing next to their pickup truck. They must have seen the terrified look on my face, plus the man following me, as they immediately ran over to ask if I was alright. I was too scared to speak, just shook my head frantically as I tried to get behind them. They immediately demanded to know why the man was following me. He fed them some bullshit line about being my brother. I just silently kept shaking my head. I guess they figured out what was happening at this point as they started yelling at the man, accusing him of something. I did not stay to find out. I took the opportunity of him being distracted to start running away. The man noticed that I was leaving and tried to take after me. The burly men really took offense to this as they immediately tackled him and threw him in the back of their pickup. He was screaming at this point. They sped off with the guy at an inconceivable speed right past me and just kept going. I was happy that they took him away, but I did not stop running until I reached home. I had no idea what to make out of this entire exchange, but it really shook me. I don't know where they took the creepy guy or what they did with him after. In all honesty, I didn't want to know. I told my parents and altered the route I walked home from school. I never saw him again, and I'm thankful for that. Even though I could not say what I needed in that moment, those two kind strangers saw that I was in distress and dealt with it for me. Even after all these years, I still remember the sheer terror and then relief when they took him away. This happened back when I was 11 or 12 years old. It was the beginning of summer and I begged my mom to go to the water park in the next town. She couldn't drive, so she arranged for her friend to drop me off and pick me back up after. I was a decent swimmer and had been alone a couple of times before. My mom had given me the money for the admission and a little extra to get a drink and snack from the vending machines. I arrived and got changed, putting my bag in a locker and strapping the key around my ankle. I couldn't wait to get on the slides. There weren't too many people there as it was early evening, around 6pm, so I got on all the slides relatively quickly. My favorite was the River Rapid slide. On this slide, you would slide down small sections of slide, splashing into small pools in between. You were supposed to use a rubber ring, but most kids, and some adults, did not bother. No one ever worked on the slides anyway, so it was a bit of a free-for-all. I went down the river rapid slide for the fourth or fifth time and splashed into the first pool. I mucked around for a bit here before wading towards the next section of the slide. I was completely alone on the slide, or so I thought. The next pool after this section of slide was a dark and closed section. I like to sit in there sometimes and relax before finishing the ride. However, this time, someone was already in there. A larger woman in her 30s or 40s lay on her stomach with her feet over the last section of the slide, her head peeking above the water. She was cackling loudly, a hysterical, guttural laugh. She looked me in the eyes and pushed herself down the last section of the slide, still laughing as it echoed off the slide walls. I was thoroughly freaked out and waited five minutes before sliding down 
so I didn't encounter her at the bottom. Presuming it was a random freaky coincidence, I went straight back on the slide. Again, no one else was around. I rode the first section normally before apprehensively sliding the second section into the dark cave pool, and I heard it again. That creepy, genuine, hysterical laughter. There she was, the same woman from before, grinning and laughing while staring straight at me. She again flushed herself down the slide, leaving me alone. I decided I wasn't going to ride the river rapid slide again that visit. She petrified me. I decided to go on the black hole next. It was a one-person slide. You're supposed to wait for the light to go green before sliding, so I figured I would be okay. I say supposed. I flung myself into the black abyss of the tube ride. However, I heard a second thud behind me. I turned around. And in the darkness, my worst fears were confirmed. I saw the shadowy figure of an overweight, middle-aged woman following me down the slide. And once again, she started laughing loudly and hard. The kind of laugh where you can barely pause for breath. As if you've seen the funniest show or meme you could imagine. I've never been more terrified in my life. I panicked slamming my hands down on the floor of the slide and pushing in an attempt to make myself go faster. It worked a bit, but she was never far behind, cackling away. When I reached the bottom, I threw myself out of the landing strip area, grazing my knee. I ran to the changing room, not looking back. I locked myself in a stall and removed the key from my ankle before running out to grab my stuff and went straight back in. I got changed and bolted from the building and called my mom. She sent her friend to pick me up right away. This happened a few years ago around mid-November. My mother and I loved being outside and going for walks. This night in particular was freezing but we decided we wanted to go out for a quick walk. As we walked back home, we went down this one street that we use all the time. It's a neighborhood street that leads to the main street, then back into our neighborhood. We get halfway down the street when I hear a dog bark over the music on my phone. I turn it off and turn to look for the dog because I love dogs, and I wasn't aware there was a big dog on the street. For a bit of context, I know quite a few people on this street, and I know which houses have dogs. Most of the people on the block have small dogs or cats. This came from a house that didn't have a dog, let alone a big dog. I spun around and saw a big dark mass just feet from me. If he stepped two more feet, he would have been able to grab me. I immediately felt weird and started speed walking back to my mom, who at that point didn't realize I stopped. I turned off my phone and whispered to her that I thought we were being followed. She turned around and grabbed my arm and told me there were two men right behind us. We started walking in a zigzag pattern and sure enough they followed our every step. Once they caught on that we knew, one of the guys started to make chit chat with us. Awfully late for y'all to be walking, huh? I swear, his voice sounded like the definition of the siren's voices, luring sailors to their doom. He continued questioning us. My mom kept walking and replying with quick replies. From the sound of his voice, I knew we were in danger, so I went to dial 911. Instead, my mom told me to call my dad, as he would be able to get to us quicker because we were almost home. We got to the busy street, and looked behind us to see them speed walking to us. We decided to risk it and ran into the middle of the street as cars passed on either side of us. We ran across again and met my dad on that side. We looked across the street and both men were gone. We got into the car and searched the streets, but these guys just disappeared into what seemed like thin air. I asked my mom if we would have been kidnapped if I hadn't heard the dog. She asked me what dog. 
I asked her how she didn't hear this massive dog bark, especially with how good her hearing is. I still have no clue what it was I heard, but I do know it most likely saved my life. I'm a former medic. We responded to a car wreck in which an SUV had run off the road and into a ditch at a high speed, causing the vehicle to flip end over end several times. There was a family of four in the car. The father, who was the driver, was unbelted and was ejected through the windshield, after which the vehicle landed on him before continuing to flip. He was dead on the scene when we arrived. The mother was in the passenger seat and she was belted, but the belt somehow malfunctioned and she was thrown forward far enough for her head to hit the windshield and put a hole in it. She was alive when we arrived, but barely. The vehicle was severely mangled and we were unable to extricate her quickly. We had to work a trauma code on her while she was still in the seat. By the time the rescue squad could get the vehicle access to remove her, she had been without pulse for nearly 10 minutes. The second arriving unit continued CPR on her during transport to the ER, but she was declared dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. The back seat contained two children. My recollection is that there was a girl of about 12 years of age and a boy who was about 8. They were both properly restrained, and other than obvious scrapes and bruises, neither appeared to be seriously injured. Their vitals were in good shape, and other than being in shock, they seemed to have appropriate levels of consciousness. Because of the difficulty getting into the vehicle, they were trapped, but they could see all of our efforts to resuscitate their mother. Because of her condition compared to theirs, the main effort of extrication was to get the mother out first. The children were safely removed after she'd been removed and transported. They were taken to the same ER as the mother. Once back at the ER, the two children were thoroughly checked by the physicians and by radiology for any internal injuries or anything we may have missed. Neither had anything significant. What stuck with me the most was what I saw and learned as we were restocking our unit to go back on the road. One of the cops had let us know that the family was from out of town and they'd been on vacation. The closest family could not get down to be with the children for at least two hours. Soon after learning that, I was leaving the ER and I looked into the room where the children had been put after their trip to radiology. They were both on the same bed and the girl had her arms wrapped around her little brother. Both had thousand yard stares. I don't know if or how anyone had told them about their parents, but you could tell by the looks on their faces that they knew. I will never forget that day. I often wonder how those kids turned out and how difficult it must have been for them. I grew up in rural Appalachia so I grew up hearing all kinds of superstitions and legends about ghosts and other creepy things. Of course, as an adult, I realized they were mostly made up by people trying to scare their kids from wandering off into the woods, and they were passed down over the generations. I was told to never respond if someone called my name in the woods, and if we heard whistling outside at night, it meant the devil was close. Of course, there's real truth and valuable advice in some of those stories, if a stranger is calling to you in the woods or whistling outside your house at night, you probably should be afraid, especially as a child. I never experienced either there in the mountains. The scariest thing that ever happened to me wasn't supernatural and happened in New Mexico. My mom died when I was very little, and when I was 20, my dad passed away, leaving me without immediate family except my brother. My dad didn't have much, but he left his house to my brother and just enough money to me that I was able to buy two acres and a nice used camper. My boyfriend, now husband, wanted to move back home and be close to his mom, and we planned to eventually build a house. It seemed like such a cool adventure to me at the time. 
It was literally in the desert, a dirt lot off a dirt road, with no electricity or water access, and surrounded by other identical empty plots. Until very recently, you could still find land like that for a little bit of nothing, because it's inconvenient and expensive to truly live comfortably out there. We had to haul water from my in-law's house and use a generator for electricity. My husband worked nights as a security guard, so I was alone in that camper almost every night. Honestly, it was boring, and it felt safe enough to me then, because I have a big bear of a Rottweiler named Zeus, who would have defended either of us to the death. Obviously, though, as I'd find out, it wasn't really that safe, dog or not. It was a normal night like any other. I'd been outside watching the sky while I smoked a bowl and came back in to get ready for bed. I just undressed and climbed into bed when I heard whistling and felt the camper sort of shift like a hard gust of wind had hit it. It wasn't that unusual because sometimes the wind really blew hard out there so I would have ignored it if Zeus hadn't started growling like the devil himself was outside. He was crouched down toward the doorway, ready to attack. I was terrified, and it suddenly seemed so foolish to have assumed I was safe out there alone, with a thin aluminum door between me and whoever or whatever was out there in the dark. I couldn't help but think about the story my grandfather told me all those years ago, about hearing whistling at night, and while I'm not a very religious person in general, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't pretty unnerving in that moment. The sound of it was so unnaturally high-pitched that it almost sounded like the wind, but not quite, because it had a sort of sad melody to it. Besides that, my dog had never growled at the wind before. I remember thinking how crazy it was I could hear it over the generator, and I couldn't tell where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere. I tried to work up the courage to go peek outside, but I was frozen to the bed. Zeus was going crazy now, growling and snarling and pacing. He rarely barked, but when he did, it was intimidating as hell, and once he started barking at the wall like he was possessed, everything sort of stopped. It was like the tension in the air just slowly dissipated. Zeus was just as freaked out as me and couldn't settle down until I finally let him out about an hour later. He sniffed the back of the camper where the bedroom was for a good minute before reluctantly turning away and coming back inside. But I was too chicken shit to go outside myself. Cell service was spotty. This was a long time ago where everyone still had flip phones and I was without a way to leave or call for help. When I told my husband the next morning, he was convinced it was traffickers, or worse, trying to break in on me, and Zeus had scared them off. It was somewhat plausible to me, but I didn't feel that was the explanation. No one had actually tried to break in. That would be some strange kidnappers to just stand outside whistling. Then he told me he heard rumors of a small cult who lived somewhere out there, and maybe it was some of them trying to scare us away. That was more terrifying to me in a way, since I figured if that was the case, they might come back. But in the daylight, with my husband there, it also seemed a bit silly. I remembered how Zeus was sniffing at the back of the camper, and we decided to go look around. The dirt out there is soft and sandy, and it looked like it had been trampled around in by multiple people with different sized bare feet the dirt that was right under the small window over our bed. The weirdest part is how there were no tracks leading off in any directions away from the camper, just the ones outside the window and one set halfway around the backside wall, right around where Zeus had started barking. Suddenly, that crazy cult rumor didn't seem very far-fetched or silly to me. And that's how I ended up living with my mother-in-law for over a year. Because fuck living in fear of being harassed, or worse. We still own the lot where it happened, but we bought a place in town. The desert is beautiful, and I love hiking in it with other people. But at the same time, I've noticed something about it. 
it also really seems to attract crazy folks. I grew up on the top of this mountain that was mostly abandoned since the 60s when an old ski hill burnt down. There were two other full-time residents up at the top where we lived. The rest of the houses stood empty the majority of the time or were abandoned. The history of this mountain dates far back, hundreds of years ago, before the colonization of Canada. There were two native communities at war. One lived on top of this mountain, one lived in the valley below. At the base of the mountain, the two communities were supposed to meet for battle. During the journey down, the valley tribe snuck up behind the mountain tribe and slaughtered all their women and children. When the mountain tribe returned home, they were apparently slaughtered too. On the entire mountainside, these vining wild strawberries grow, and it's said that they grow from the spilt blood of the mountain tribe. Many people have died on this mountain. When I was growing up, there were hundreds of old crosses littering the twists and turns of the mountain. My father later became one of those crosses. In a small meadow surrounded by trees sat a small cottage, no driveways and only an overgrown pathway to lead you to it. If you looked inside, their breakfasts sat still prepared, oatmeal and eggs untouched for years. The man that lived there was supposedly a fugitive, who disappeared further into the mountains when the police came up and found him one day. We had these weird neighbors who would come two weekends a month from the city with their daughter, who was my age. They would bring friends over, get high, drunk, and naked, and have orgies in their yard or the forest. There was this eerie feeling you had while on this mountain, which was aptly named Forbidden. I stood looking out my bedroom window at night, I swear I could see things moving in the forest below. We had the highest concentration of mountain lions in the world, and I was often stalked home. One night, my mother woke to the sound of the sliding glass door opening and closing. She walked downstairs, and my sister was standing there sleepwalking, whispering over and over again, Here, kitty kitty. My sister had never been a sleepwalker until this, my mother grabbed her, closed and locked the sliding door, then flicked on the lights, and right there on the deck, pacing back and forth, was a cougar. My father also became a violent sleepwalker while living up there. He would have screaming matches with the wall, and sometimes ended up throwing items around. This wasn't something he did until the last few years of his life. My father was a skilled driver, and he'd driven up this mountain many times. A few months before the accident, I started having waking nightmares of my father's death. Something was telling me he was going to die. I remember waking up frequently and looking out the window into the forest during this period, and feeling like something was communicating with me that he would die. He kissed me goodnight one night and went out the door to go to town with his friends. They left in separate vehicles. Him first. From the accounts of what happened, it was a freak accident. They were driving below speed limit down a straight stretch nearing a cliff slash corner when my dad's truck suddenly lost traction and started skidding sideways towards the cliff. My dad opened the truck door and jumped out, and the truck suddenly veered the other way and flipped onto him on the ground, something that physically shouldn't have been possible. It crushed almost every bone in his body. He survived for eight days in hospital after being airlifted. The day he died, I knew again. I knew he was dead, and it was like this feeling that something was communicating this to me. I didn't need to be told. I was so sure of this feeling that I collapsed onto the ground the second I got it and started screaming, He's dead, isn't he? He's dead, isn't he? Over and over again. I was eight. I had never experienced death before. There's more that went on up there to a lot of different people over the years. It's known locally as a haunted and weird place. Nothing good ever happens there. P. 
People do weird and crazy out of character things. They commit heinous crimes, die, or just lose their minds. We moved when I was nine. I never felt that feeling again anywhere else. That feeling of something insidious all around you. I've only been up there a handful of times since, and every time I'm there, that feeling returns. I usually don't care about graveyard shifts, but now I'm terrified. I work a graveyard shift as a security guard for a recycling yard. I've been on this site for two weeks. Basically every hour I make rounds across a giant recycling yard, covered in various precious metals that are broken down and sold. During my shift, I scan various checkpoints and ensure nobody besides me is in the yard or facility. One of my other tasks is to go through some grassy and bushy terrain and over a set of train tracks to take a photo of the warehouse far across. This is to ensure it's safe and clear. I have to use a flashlight with 2K lumens so I can see my way through pretty much the entire yard. Well, just an hour and a half ago on my round, I went through the grass and over the train tracks. I took the picture of the warehouse and submitted it. All of a sudden, I get this intense feeling that I'm being watched. The hairs on my neck stand up, and I freeze. My flashlight is still on and pointing at the warehouse. I slowly turn around and point my flashlight behind me. I kid you not, about ten yards away, I see a skinny, old, wrinkled white man with a large white beard sitting on a chair. He was looking directly at me. He had dirty jean overalls and what I think was a western style cowboy fedora on. Now, I'm a 6 foot and 220 pound man, but I screamed, fuck, at a pitch that was embarrassing. I accidentally dropped my flashlight out of shock. Mind you, there are thin, tiny metal shards literally everywhere on the ground. I can't see a damn thing now as the flashlight is facing away from my sight. All I hear his quick paced shuffling and clanging of metal from footsteps quickly running towards me. Once the metal crunching footsteps are within five feet of me, I hear them quickly veer to the left and past me. Within three to four seconds, the metal clanging is gone, followed by the faraway sound of rustling bushes. I then grab my flashlight from the ground and pointed it to the sound. The old man was gone past the bushes to who knows where. I was shaking from adrenaline and fear. I managed to catch my breath and called several emergency contacts. When they arrived, the old man was gone. I believe maybe he was there just to watch the active trains move across. I say this because the metal chair was facing the tracks. It's still there. I took a photo of it more as a memento, if anything. I'm now in the office, still terrified and alone, and tomorrow I'm doing another 11-hour graveyard. I won't quit as I need the money. I just want it to get this off my chest. It chills me to this day when I think about what happened, or should I say could have happened, to my sister and I in 2007. I was 25 and she was 23. We were living in Phoenix and living a pretty wild life. Lots of partying. However, she could keep it in check. I was a blackout drunk. We were out with some friends at a party. I was particularly stupid that night and took my friend's car key to go pick up this couple I'd met earlier in the night. Needless to say, I was wasted and reckless. My sister called me while I was out, all upset because our friend discovered that I took her car. I went back to the property and was promptly screamed at and kicked out, rightfully so. My sister was so embarrassed and crying, she was really intoxicated too which wasn't a normal thing for her. I remember we were walking to find a taxi or something. It's all pretty hazy to me. 
The next thing I know, we're in the back of a car at a gas station on Grand Avenue. This street leads off into an old Arizona interstate highway. The random couple I'd met earlier were trying to open the door and get us out of the car. They happened to be at this gas station at probably 1am. I don't even know how they spotted me. They must have sensed trouble. I have hazy details, but I know they were frantic and insistent about getting us out of the car. From what they told us, the man driving the car appeared to be a total creep and no one I would seemingly associate with. I have no recollection of how we ended up in his car, who he was, where he was taking us, and why he needed to fill his tank. Sometimes I think the mysterious couple were angels sent to look after us. Both my sister and I were missing our phones the next day. I'm certain the man had taken them. There's a number of other things that could have happened that night, and I feel lucky that we are still alive. It racks me with guilt that I put my little sister in that situation, and any time I feel like picking up a drink, it's one of those memories I play back to remind myself where alcohol takes me. About eight years ago, my girlfriends and I would download plenty of fish and meet random guys to take exploring with us. Definitely not the smartest, especially since we were out in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. This one night, we met a guy called Todd. Todd was an odd guy. He seemed socially distant, and when he slid into the back of my SUV, I instantly got the feeling of regret. We were going to a place called Ronnie's Point. Todd wanted to stay in the car for a bit to scope out the area while us girls went ahead to explore. Red flag. I was so sure he was going to try and steal my car. We went into the abandoned hospital and out of nowhere, here comes Todd around the corner. He scared us so bad we let out a slight scream. Todd started making comments about how his great-grandfather was a security guard at the asylum and that his grandfather told him stories about how they would shoot at the sick individuals for fun. He laughed and said, How much fun would that be? We continued to explore and Todd just hung out in the background. We eventually left and Todd insisted on sitting behind me in the car. I needed gas so I started driving to the nearest gas station. Maybe two minutes up the winding road, I felt his slimy hands creep up and start massaging my shoulders. I kept leaning forward to give him the hint I was not interested. As he is massaging my shoulders, he's telling my friends and I how stupid we are for inviting random strangers out, how we never know who's getting in our car, and how they might hurt us and whatnot. He started laughing again, and I will never forget the tone of his voice or the grip of his hands on my shoulders. He said, Maybe that person is in the car with you right now. I pulled into the gas station and demanded he got out of the car. He did, and I left him there. We got back home, and my friend went on to plenty of fish to block him, but he already blocked her or deleted his account. We never heard from him again, but we did stop inviting random people to urban explore and ghost hunt with us. My dad and I drove to his hometown in Mexico a few years back. We knew not to drive at night because of the cartel situation, so we timed the trip to have us arrive no later than 5pm. The problem was, this time, the border crossing took us hours compared to the 30 minute smacks we've experienced before. My anxiety was at its limit, with knots in my stomach, thinking about the worst possible scenarios from the moment we reached the border and every hour that passed without us crossing made me nervous. Now we're 10 hours away, putting us at 11 p.m. arrival, meaning we would be driving about 3 hours or so in the dark. If that wasn't enough, our GPS decided not to work in Mexican territory. Luckily for us, we made this trek enough times in my youth that my dad knew the cities we had to go by 
so we would just follow the signs. Guess whose job it was to navigate. Don't get me wrong, I'm a great navigator by any means necessary, so it wasn't hard. But knowing that our lives were literally in my hands was absolutely terrifying. One wrong turn wouldn't just be an oopsie turnaround moment. I'm very glad to say that we had no missed turns or wrong exits or anything. What did happen though, once we entered the city that bordered our town, was that the cartel lookout started following us and taking down our plates, radioing each other to watch for us and figure out where we were going. One of them even tried to get us to stop, but that's the last thing you should do. Our family told us later that there was a curfew in place, so no one was supposed to be out past sundown. They saw that we stopped at my grandma's and watched us until she let us in. We were safe once they found out who we were. A few other scary things happened in the three weeks we were there, but nothing was as terrifying as the drive down. My husband and I were doing renovations in our house, and we had no window coverings in our front room. The front room was completely gutted and had just a ladder. In the middle of the night, my dog started barking a warning bark. Now, I immediately get out of bed and started to scale the wall to peek downstairs. When I looked around the corner to the front room, I saw someone looking in the large window with a flashlight. My dogs ran to the front door, barking. I went into one of the spare bedrooms that overlooked the front yard and saw a cop car. What was odd is that the cop didn't knock or announce himself, so they must have been looking for someone, right? I got my phone and called our local dispatch number and asked if someone had been called out to my area or if there was a search underway, and they said no. I thanked them and hung up. So I wanted to let this cop know that, yes, people lived in what may have looked like an abandoned house, but something just didn't feel right, so I didn't want to open the door. So instead I turned my porch light on and off repeatedly to see what the cop would do. He sprinted to his car and took off. I don't know what he was doing at my house or why he was looking in my windows, but I know he broke protocol by not calling it in and he was by himself. I told my husband about this, who slept through all of it. He said it was just a cop. Me, on the other hand, I know something wasn't right. A huge thanks to my dogs for letting me know. I've wanted to tell this story for years, and now I finally have a way to share it. This is going to be long, but it will tell you about the scariest experience of my life. I was 15 years old, living in a medium-sized city in North Florida. There were about 60,000 people, but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything, more like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area and condensed shopping centers. I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a hard time controlling, so that meant I basically snuck out constantly and was always riding my bike around the city all hours of the night with my friends, fighting and constantly causing trouble. For reference, I was probably 5 foot 10 and 150 pounds. My next door neighbors were my best friends, Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us, probably 5 foot 5 and 140 pounds, and Tim was 5 foot 8 and easily 210. Nick and Tim were brothers only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1am, asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so he can get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was, but Tim begged and begged me to go out until I agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue a ticket and bring you home. That meant we had to be careful about being seen by cars going by. Well, 
The bike ride to her house went by without any issues. We took our time, joked around and smoked a little pot, and genuinely just enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little pot we had on the way and finally got to his girlfriend's house. After what felt like an hour, Tim snuck around the back to go in and Nick and I just sat on the electrical box and talked. Maybe 30 minutes went by and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house, bragging about his time in there and says we should head out. Annoyed at how long it took and nearly sober, we both agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but things changed. We had just passed a decent sized shopping center and a church. We rode by it slowly, in zero rush at all. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals on each side. The road name is Jefferson Parkway, two lanes on each side separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle. Sidewalks on both sides, and on the right side, another road that connects to the parkway. We were riding on the right-hand sidewalk. Off in the distance, we saw a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a streetlight on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us as there were no lights over us and there were sprinklers going off in the median. I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground and mumbling. He was dragging his feet, almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something underneath it. The mumbling was incoherent and frantic. Honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach knot up. I couldn't understand anything he was saying, and the only way to get home was to go by him. Nick said, Yo, let's go across the street and get onto the other sidewalk. Tim and I agreed. I remember this so distinctly. We crossed the landscape median, and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face and got into my mouth and eyes. It smelled like sulfur and tasted horrible. On the other side, we could hear the mumbling and scraping of his feet clearer. I could now see more details about him. He was smoking a cigarette and was probably six foot five. He had on a huge green backpack, was extremely skinny, he had long gray hair, and was wearing combat boots and blue ripped jeans, and he also had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across from him. We all had our eyes locked in his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking, and scraping his feet. He looked up from the ground and let out this god-awful screech. It was like he tried to say a hundred words at once. None of us knew what he tried to say. After the initial scream, I could make out, what the fuck are you doing? It startled us. We were now 25 yards away from him, and then he screams, what the fuck are you looking at? I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to say something smart and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said, don't say a fucking word. So I didn't, and in hindsight, I'm so glad I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction, and we kept riding. The further we rode, the fainter the screaming got. Then it stopped. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us on edge. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure he wasn't following us. We talked briefly about it, how strange it was and whatnot, but we were glad it was over with, or so we thought. Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought I heard something behind me. I turned around, and there he was, maybe an arm's length away, headed directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned. This guy was standing up on his mountain bike, pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes and he started screaming. And I mean screaming. He screamed not words, not any language. It was a constant scream as loud as he could. I have the chills riding this even now. As a 25-year-old grown-ass man with a wife and a baby, if someone ever illustrated that image and I saw it, 
I would probably have a panic attack. I screamed, he's right behind us, and stood up, pedaling as hard as I could. I think we all did, and he was right behind us the whole time, screaming. Every so often, he would get right on top of us, screaming and trying to knock us off of our bikes. I don't know how long we rode with him behind us, but it felt like eternity. I think age played a factor, because he must have gotten tired and let us get ahead a bit. Exhausted, we pulled into a neighborhood and started cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off our bikes and all just decided if he's chasing us, we were going to make our stand together and fight. It was like a hive mind decision. All too tired to keep running, it was our only option. We waited for him, but he never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall when we lost him. I called my house phone, waking both my parents up in the process, and told my dad about the situation. He told me to get home and figure it out. I asked to talk to my mother, and she yelled at me on the phone and refused to come pick us up as I stood in the middle of the street, hoping this crazy guy didn't come and kill us all. I got home with Nick and Tim in tow, who asked if they could crash in my room. Of course I said yes. I think we all still have some weird feelings about that night, and we never really spoke of it again. I don't know what he wanted. He was clearly on drugs, but it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us, or worse. In this case, I was working the graveyard shift at a call center. We were an inbound and outbound call center, contracted to handle the call center loads from various companies. The clients ranged from banks and moneylenders to budding cellular companies that were just forming then. I was handling a call for a man in New York. His name was John. John called technical and policy support because for some reason he wasn't able to text anymore. Texting was still pretty new at the time at least in terms of the capacity we know it to be now. The man seemed pretty chipper, all things considered, and we chatted away about random stuff while I walked him through the troubleshooting script on my PC. Here I have to comment that if the cell phone people had was of excellent quality, and my PC was running great as well, I could hear somebody mowing the lawn across the street, even if the windows and doors were all closed. We're talking amazing levels of details, in this case, this was a boon, but in general, it's annoying given how many people had the TV on in the background. It's real distracting to troubleshoot phone issues while I'm hearing the news somewhere in the back. Due to this level of detail, I could hear some sort of vehicle break hard outside. The man was distracted and attempting to describe what was happening to his phone since starting troubleshooting. I heard what sounded like the front door get violently kicked in and John let out a startled yelp. I told you to stay away from Heather. Four gunshots ring out. They were so loud I actually had to toss off my headset. My ears literally rang because of the amplification software in the PC, making it feel like I was in the room with John when the shots rang out. Once my hearing returned to my one good ear, my supervisor flags me over to his office we called Air Traffic Control due to the angled windows literally resembling an airport control tower. I was sat down while my supervisor called 911 in John City. Since he had access to what I was working on, he knew where John was, complete with the address. Police and first responders arrived and found John unconscious but alive. While he'd taken all four rounds, not a one had hit anything critical. I'd find out later he took one in his left collarbone, one in the right shoulder when he twitched in response to the hit in his left shoulder bone, one in the left hip, and one to the left thigh. The kinetic trauma was enough to knock him out cold. When the after action report came out, John had been taken to the hospital where he was stabilized and treated for the bullet wounds. As for our gunman, here's what led up to the shooting and what happened after as it was explained by my supervisor. 
The gunman was the older brother of a woman named Heather. John was very sweet on her. The gunman and John had met previously since all three went to the same bar. For whatever reason, the gunman didn't like the look or vibe of John. From my perspective, even for a New Yorker, John seemed like an amazing guy. I'd even go as far to say I'd date John if that was his thing. The gunman approached John and said point blank he didn't like him. He said he felt John was a creep and warned him to stay away from his sister. John hated the warning, at least in visible public. John had already been given her number and the pair chatted over the phone. This led to clandestine rendezvous at motels as they began to entangle romantically. Oh yes, those two got it on. Apparently, it was also part of the thrill that Mr. Gunman could find out and rage. That's exactly what happened. One of the gunman's buddies spotted the pair leaving a motel, known for quick dalliances, and told the gunman. The gunman waited until the next morning so he could catch John at home before work. He plucked his 38 revolver out of his gun box in his truck and invaded John's home. The police were curious why only four of six shots were loaded, suggesting the gunman had shot two rounds before this incident, but never reloaded. They'd never find out, and neither would we. To paraphrase Joan Rivers, Mr. Gunman, who are you wearing? Oh, is that state penitentiary? The gunman would eventually be tried and convicted of charges ranging from firearm violations, menacing and intimidation, assault with a deadly weapon, and attempted murder. We didn't find out what happened with John and Heather, but we presume that despite the trauma, they either got and stayed together, or they split up for good. My boyfriend was driving me home last night around midnight. I was on my phone pulling up something to show him when we parked. He suddenly whipped around and asked me if I saw that out of his window. I said no and asked what it was. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood. We have some deer and other small wildlife. The most dramatic human activity was several years back when a car was speeding and crashed through the living room of the house at the bottom of the hill. He said there was a girl on all fours in the driveway, waving her hand and phone light at us as we drove by. We slowed down to discuss if we should go back, is she hurt or in trouble, trying to flag help for someone inside or filming a TikTok. I was worried that this was some ploy to make a stop so someone else could jump out. We both thought it was weird and decided to go back in case she needed help. Our window had been down to get some fresh night air, so we rolled them up when we went back. When we went back, she was no longer on the ground. She ran up to my window very quickly. She looked like she was in PJs and was in her teens. My boyfriend noped out of there, swerved around her, and drove out of the neighborhood as another car was driving by and passed by her. We were both pretty rattled at this point. It was so unusual and we decided that we'd do another loop back. This was the only way into the neighborhood, so we didn't really have a choice. If she was still there after that other car had driven by, he would talk to her since she'd be on his side again. We drove back down, and she was just standing in the middle of her driveway, waving her arms with her phone light again. He slowed down with his window down and asked her if everything was okay. She said yes, and started running at the car again, almost in front of another vehicle that was driving by. We were at a loss and feeling very uneasy about the whole thing, but we figured there was nothing else we could do at that point. She said she was fine, and she had a cell phone to call 911 if something was going on. He dropped me off, and said that she wasn't there when he drove back out, so I have no idea what that was all about but I found it very unnerving.
This is something I've never really told anyone about, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, so here it is. A few years back, in 2015 to 2016, when I was 18 to 19, I used to work at this little cafe inside of a car parts factory. It was basically a full-out but compact restaurant kitchen and lunchroom for the workers to eat there. Well, this one day, I get a call from my best friend and co-worker. She's all kinds of upset because of this creepy new temp worker that made her feel severely uncomfortable by asking her a bunch of personal questions. Things like what she drove, where she lived, if she was single or had any kids, when she got off of work, those kind of things. She didn't want to walk out to her car alone. Mind you, she was my age too, 18 to 19, and this guy was mid to late 30s, if not already in his early 40s, and we're in Flint, Michigan, so we weren't about to take any chances. I drive up to the parking lot, find her car, park next to it, and she has a security guard escort her out. We didn't see the guy then, but she described him to me in the guard, and that was that for a few days. Someone found him and told him to stay away from her, and he did, but then he met me. I knew exactly who he was as soon as he stepped up to the register to place his lunch order, just from the description I'd been given and by the creepy vibes he was giving off. He pulled the same intense Q&A on me that he'd done to my friend too, but instead of telling him to fuck off or calling security or anything like that, I just told him a bunch of straight up lies. I told him that I drove a blue 2012 Honda Civic, which I knew for a fact was one of the second shift manager's vehicles who always parked near the front of the building, and so I knew that it was going to be there until second shift ended at 11pm. I also told him that my shift ended around 9.30, which was really the time that I usually slipped out for a cigarette break. So when 9.30 hit later that night, I walked outside to smoke my cigarette, and I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. That stupid creep in the parking lot, close to the area that the Honda Civic was sitting. He was just pacing back and forth behind two vehicles that were parked a few spaces down in the same row, playing on his phone the entire time. At one point, he glanced up and saw me staring at him, but I had my big leather winter coat and hat on, so I don't know if he recognized me at first from a distance or not. I finished my smoke and went back inside and explained the entire situation to the security guards, one of which was the original guard that had escorted my friend out to her car a couple of days before, and they were dying laughing at the fact I'd pulled one over on the prick, and it actually caught him being shady. I'm not sure what exactly they did about it, because I went back to work after that, but I do know that they immediately went out and confronted him in the parking lot and that the guy was fired that same week. To this day, I still don't know what his intentions were, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it couldn't have been anything good. So ultimately, the moral of the story is always have your friends backs and trust your instincts, because if you don't, you could end up cornered in a parking lot and possibly attacked or abducted by some creepy guy who asked one too many questions. I recently moved from the US to the Balklands for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up to a gym close to my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, endorphins on a hundred, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I stopped was staring at me. Now this isn't really uncommon as I found out in my new home, and I've gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares, but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I knew that he knew I saw him. I hoped that would be the end of it, and then I turned my head away to continue down the street, 
trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I knew, about two minutes later, I'm at the crosswalk, about to cross, when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me, he continued staring at me, but I tried not to tip him off to me noticing this. I took off as fast as I could when it was safe to cross the crosswalk, and naturally, he matched my pace, a step or so behind me, still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. It's a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? I've been followed many a time before, sadly, and so I have found that the best way to handle it is to try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me that they aren't doing what I fear they're doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him up to where I'm going. Trust, but verify. So I decided to zip quickly towards another street, not my own, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He followed me down this random street choice, where there is truly only residential buildings. No stores or restaurants he could be headed toward that could explain him choosing this street, unless he lived nearby. I did something I've done before, when followed, to test the other person. I slowed down and sped up my pace randomly to see if they will match mine, or like a normal person heading somewhere, try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so, I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring, but not only that. With every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also suddenly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point and we were walking towards a part of town that I didn't know as well. The spirit moves, and I decided to make a break for it. I slowed down as slow as I've gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking in my peripheral, and jettisoning myself across the street until I got onto the other side. Once I get across, I look back once more, to see that he was now staring across the street, and moved toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster, and I reached for my bag, as if to suggest that I was reaching for pepper spray or something. He noticed the gesture, made eye contact, stopped, and then he turned his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street, like he was lost or looking for a specific spot, as if he hadn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past ten minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. His acting was 0 out of 10 for capturing the innocence of somebody definitely not creepily following women half his age back from the gym for 20 plus minutes. He continued to pretend to look around, glanced back at me, looked around some more, glanced back at me again, and when he looks away for the third time, I decided that then is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns as I have when I've been followed before. Eventually, when I checked out the whole street and felt confident that I'd lost him, I finally calculated my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who's a local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version the smallest size that can easily fit in a purse. The pepper spray's brand name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madame, which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. I 
I got lost on a 14-mile hike because of a faded sign and poorly marked branching trails. It wasn't a high-traffic hiking trail since it was mid-July and hit temperatures of 105 degrees Fahrenheit at high noon. We left early in the morning to avoid the afternoon heat, so getting lost put us four miles off track. So once we got back to the right trail, it was perilously close to noon on a moderately difficult return trail. My friend and I had enough water for the normal trail length, but nowhere near for the extra time we spent out in the extreme heat. Heat exhaustion swiftly set in, and our water went quickly. We would move from shaded spot to shaded spot when we could, but there was little tree cover for the last seven miles. Eventually it got so bad, I collapsed in a semi-fitted pool of standing water to cool off as best as I could. I remember sitting there, nauseous, shaking, and barely able to stand, thinking we were going to die out there because we'd read the wrong trail sign and got off course. Thankfully, a group came down the trail, saw us, and immediately offered water and assistance to get us the last couple of miles out and back to our vehicle. What was supposed to be a four-hour hike turned into a ten. I lost thirteen pounds, my feet were covered in blisters and sores, and I was so weak I couldn't get out of bed for days. So yeah, that was terrifying. I was in bed asleep at 7am when I heard a loud bang. I thought nothing of it because of the large cat tree I have downstairs that's always getting knocked over. So I rolled over and tried to get back to sleep. Not long after, my elderly cat comes running into my bedroom, jumps up on the bed, and tries to hide under the blankets. This immediately woke me up because that old fat cat hadn't ran nor jumped on our bed for years. As I came to, I see two men coming up my stairs. At that point, it felt like time stopped and somehow ran incredibly fast at the same time. I jumped out of bed and started screaming, get the fuck out of my house, and I remembered thinking while chasing these guys through my house and screaming again and again at the top of my lungs that my voice sounded exactly like my brother, and I wondered how strange that was. I tackled one of them on the front of my lawn, but he struggled free and got away. I saw the getaway car and tried to keep repeating the license number, but it faded away in my mind as I was repeating it. I remember vividly being so mad at myself that I couldn't remember seven numbers and how stupid I was for not grabbing my phone. Looking back on the situation, there are so many things that happened that I never noticed, like how I fractured my arm from slamming into the wall at the bottom of my stairs and that I cut my feet up on the splintered wood on my front lawn. The adrenaline rush of a true fight-or-flight situation is something so strange, it's almost impossible to accurately describe. The sense of time, not being aware of pain and injuries for hours, and the hyper-focus on some details, but the complete loss of others. Luckily, I wasn't seriously hurt, and nothing was stolen but I installed cameras all over my house the very next day. My parents went out of town for the weekend. I was 16 at the time. We live in a pretty rural town of about 1,500 people. I was streaming my game and having a blast, I'd ordered pizza and the night was going great. Now, ever since my parents would leave for the weekends, I knew where my stepdad had a pistol, a Ruger 9mm. Whenever they'd leave, I felt safer having the pistol with me. So when this all first started, I learned and got trained in pistols. It's about 11.30 to 12 at night when I hear a loud bang and the floor beneath me shook. Coincidentally, there was a door to the basement below where my desk sat, so I calmly told my stream I'd be back, grabbed the pistol, and flagged the door from our kitchen that led to the basement for about five minutes. 
Nobody came up, so I got to the basement door and really quietly opened it up. I hear whispering and shuffling of things. I flicked on the light to the stairs of the basement and said, I'm giving you till 10 to leave this house, or you're not going to like the outcome. And it turned pin drop silent. I started counting from 10, and once I hit 5, I racked the slide to chamber around. And as they heard that slide rack back, all I heard was shuffling and stuff being dropped, and they ran out the back door. I'm thankful they left because I didn't want to shoot anyone, but I wasn't going to let someone steal from my family. I come to find out it was a relative that was privy to my parents' departure, and they figured I wouldn't be around. This story is about the most terrifying night of my life, and why I can't stand fireworks. I wasn't the most social teenager. I had my group of friends and spent every free minute gaming. After school and on the weekends, we'd play, and I'd talk to them through my headset. So, unsurprisingly, when the 4th of July weekend rolled around, I was 14 and my parents had been invited to what I deemed to be the world's most boring party. I flexed my independence muscles and decided to stay home and have a gaming marathon instead. All week, my best friend Alex had been goading me about how much better he thought he was on COD than I. Time to prove him wrong, I thought. I'm an only child, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit my mom worried about me and it hadn't been that long ago that she would insist I had a babysitter on the odd occasion that my parents went out. My dad, however, was from a larger family with three siblings, and he thought that my mother smothered me. He was all about teaching me self-reliance. So, much to my, honestly, relief, they started leaving me home alone more, and I had the house to myself a handful of times by this point and I think you can guess what I mean by handful. Aside from hounding the hub, I did what any self-respecting 14-year-old would do and round up the snacks and soda and settled in to play some cod with my friends. I was having a blast. After a few hours, my friends from school went offline to fix something to eat. I decided to grab another drink and realized the fireworks were starting. I hadn't even realized it had gotten dark. I went to the kitchen, which had a big window across the entire width of the wall, and the blinds were still open. My mother had asked me to close them when it got dark, before she left. I'd been too absorbed in my game to care, but I figured I'd better do it before I forgot, to avoid being yelled at. After I got my snacks, I headed over to the window to shut the blinds. I noticed there were fireworks going off down the street and a few houses over. As my dumbass stood there, I suddenly heard a tapping on the front door. Not a knock, but like half-heartedly tapping something, I'm not sure what, against the door. Instantly I was freaked out. Like why not knock properly? And anyway, no one had a cause to knock. I knew that my family were at the party and wouldn't be back for hours, and they wouldn't knock anyway because they had the key. I would have seen their Uber pull up. No Uber no car. Shit. Tap, tap, tap. The staircase was opposite the front door with a mirror on the right side wall as you went up the stairs. There was a small glass pane in the top of the door. I could see from where I was standing in the reflection of the mirror that there was a moving shadow behind the glass pane of the door. For the first time of my life, I understood what it meant to feel chills at the back of my neck. My first instinct was to run upstairs to safety, but I knew if I did so, the person at the door would see me. I stood there, not moving for what felt like forever. I was hoping whoever it was would go away. Out of sight because of the angle, but still able to keep watch on the front door in the mirror, I kept my eyes fixed on the shadow. Eventually it disappeared and I heard footsteps receding on the gravel driveway. I held my breath for a moment, and when I thought it was safe, I bolted up the stairs. I guess I felt safer up there. I laughed at myself a little, 
sure that it was someone we knew and that I'd overreacted, I hopped back on the chat and told them what had happened. A few of them teased me for it, but some of them told me I should call the police. I kind of felt stupid and told them at this point I hadn't actually confirmed that it was someone trying to break in. It was just someone tapping on the door. Mind you, the tapping was insipid, and if someone was trying to get the attention of the homeowner, they would knock harder. So I decided to creep to the top of the stairs and see if I could see anything. The shadow I first saw illuminated by the streetlights was not there. I was sure they'd left. Again, I brushed it off and again laughed at myself. I went back to my desk and eventually got sidetracked by some news of an upcoming video game release. The fireworks were still popping outside, but every now and then there would be a gap in the displays. It was while there was relative quiet outside that I suddenly heard crunching footsteps below my window. I froze, and I mean I was terrified. Someone was in the backyard. I knew for sure now this wasn't one of my parents' friends or a neighbor who needed something. Whoever was in the backyard had hopped the gate. I knew it wasn't either of my parents, because they always turned the side light on whenever they went back there at night whoever it was back there in the pitch dark. I sat there dead still, listening. I decided to go to my parents' room so I could get a look out on the backyard through their window. I kept the light off so I wouldn't be seen. I couldn't see anything, but I could still hear footsteps on the gravel. A firework went off. Bang. I heard three hard thuds below me, which I swear did not sound like fireworks right below my parents' window. I realized with a shot of adrenaline that someone was banging against the dining room window below me. My heart was pounding. I don't think I even took the time to compute that someone was trying to get in. I just turned and ran to the bathroom and locked myself in. I backed up to the far side and sat between the toilet and the bath, right under the window. The window was cracked because it was hot and smelly from earlier in the night, but I didn't dare close it, in case whoever it was saw. The fireworks were still going off and I couldn't think straight. I was frozen. I never bothered to turn the light on in there, and in hindsight, it's probably a good job I didn't, but the fireworks were illuminating the bathroom walls and my ears were starting to ring with panic. I finally managed to pull myself together enough to pull my cell phone from my pants. I dialed 911. I told the operator that someone was trying to get into my house and gave her my address. Is there a room with a lock? She asked. I'm locked in the bathroom. I breathed into the phone as quietly as I could manage. She told me she was sending someone out and asked me, Can you hear anything? No, I whispered. Just fireworks which in all honesty was worse. I had no idea where the guy was or if he was still trying to get in. I told her again. I couldn't hear anything. He might be inside. I don't know. He was banging on the outside window before. He could have smashed the glass already. She instructed me to stay calm and reassured me that the cops were on their way. My stomach sank into the bottom of my shoes. I figured the police were having a busy night but I had no other option than to trust that they would get to me before the intruder did. She told me to stay as quiet and as calm as possible and reassured me that whoever it was was just probably looking to steal something and they would not be searching for me, that I should stay hidden until the cops got there. I figured she had a point, but it didn't make me feel much better. As I sat there without hearing a sound, all I could think was, that my parents had finally thought I was old enough to be left alone, and now I was cowering in the corner of the bathroom. Though the operator was on the other end of the line, I had been trying to remain quiet, and I hadn't heard anything for some time. My breathing had slowed some, but then, through the open window, I heard what sounded like someone treading on glass. I told the operator, I hear glass, he's broken the window. Officers will be with you soon. Stay where you are and try to stay quiet. I heard footsteps in the hallway downstairs, 
It always was incredibly echoey. I was absolutely terrified. I was too frozen to even tell the operator what I heard. The cops were taking too long. This guy was surely going to come up and search all of the rooms and try the bathroom door. When he realized it was locked, he was probably going to work out that it's a bathroom and that there was someone hiding inside. I tried to make a mental inventory of all of the valuable items in the living room and the garage that he would take before coming up the stairs. Thankfully, despite listening as hard as I could, I didn't hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Instead, I heard sirens. The operator confirmed that the police were nearby. I heard the glass crunch again and eventually heard an officer announce himself. I think they're here, I told the operator. I thanked her and she hung up. I couldn't move. I was just frozen in fear. I heard several pairs of footsteps coming up the stairs and carry on along the hallway to either side. I heard voices outside the door, checking the bedrooms I presumed. Kid, are you here? A deep male voice introduced himself as Officer Matthews. I gingerly cracked the bathroom door open. Sure enough, it was the cops. Still, to this day, I have never felt relief like it. A few officers asked if I was okay. They could see I wasn't hurt, but they made me sit down, checked me for signs of shock, and we got in touch with my parents. At some point, I asked if someone was in the house. They realized how terrified I was and told me, He's gone. The garage hatch was open when we got here. The officer asked me, as if for confirmation, how many cars my parents had and if they were in the garage tonight. I said two and explained that my parents had taken an Uber. There's a Ford and an Alfa Romeo. Well, he's taken the Alfa Romeo, he said, nodding. My dad was going to be livid. My parents arrived shortly after. My mom apologized to me profusely for leaving me alone, even though it had to happen. My dad was angry about the car and the damage, but he was ultimately glad I was okay. The police said that they would keep us informed, a little old lady who lives across the street and is friendly with my parents knocked on the door the next morning. She said she'd seen a car pull out of the garage and thought it odd that my dad didn't close the garage door behind him. Then she saw the police arrive. She tends to sit by the front window and watch the street. Not really realizing that my mom was out and I was alone, she figured whatever it was was in hand and there wasn't much she could do. She came by to see if everything was okay the next morning. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to make out who was driving the car, and it presumed it was my dad. The cops didn't find the car or the guy. Unfortunately, we lived in the suburbs at the time. It was mainly residential, and there wasn't much CCTV. They said the guy could have taken it back to a garage or hidden it on their property to resell, and probably had the tools to remove the VIN number. My parents installed security cameras after that, and we didn't live in that house for much longer. I'm grateful to the 911 operator and the cops that came that night. I still have PTSD when the 4th of July comes around, and every time I hear a firework, my chest gets tight and my heart begins to race. I will never forget that night as long as I live. I'm a male in my early 30s, and about seven years ago I dated a girl called Amber. Amber seemed pretty normal at first, very beautiful with long glossy black hair, and if anything I thought she was a little clingy, but I put it down to a lack of dating experience as she was only 20 at the time. We dated for a few weeks before things got physical. She wanted to take it slow and I respected that. The red flag started flying when the day after we slept together for the first time, I got an unexpected delivery to my workplace. I worked in construction at the time and was working on housing developments, so obviously I was on the same site for some time, but when the project would finish, we would go to the next site. Anyway, that day my friend John shouted up to me while I was working on the roof. I couldn't tell what he was saying, 
but glancing at my watch and realizing it was about lunchtime anyway, I headed down to see what he wanted. He told me I had a package. This was more than a little odd as it wasn't normal to take deliveries on a site and I didn't know anyone who would be mailing something to me here. I figured the guys were playing a prank on me. Amber had made me a packed lunch and delivered it to the building site. A pretty sweet gesture, I thought. There was a little note in the bag which read, I can't wait to make you dinner when you get home, honey. Home? Did she mean my place or hers? I just kind of shrugged it off. When I got home that evening, she was waiting for me on my doorstep, looking kind of impatient. When I said, Hey, you okay? You've been waiting for me. She blew out a frustrated breath and said, Yes, of course. I was supposed to make you dinner. Don't you want me here? Of course I do, I said, while internally wishing I could just drop down on the couch with an ice-cold beer, actually but I wasn't complaining about the company or the prospect of a home-cooked meal. I smiled at her, and her face transformed from pouty to beaming in a second. Okay, I thought this is getting serious, but it wasn't enough to turn me off her yet. I kissed her and thanked her for the packed lunch, then asked how she knew where I was working that day. Oh, you told me you were on a site in Taos. I just asked around for the development site. Okay, thanks, I said. Didn't you like that? She replied. Oh no, it was sweet of you, thank you. I answered back. I didn't want to deal with anything I might start by telling her how I really felt about it. She made me dinner and spent the night again. The next day, I got another lunch bag. Was she driving here every day to deliver me lunch? Huh, that's a lot. It was July 3rd and I was planning to go to my buddy's barbecue that night. A lot of my friends were out of town visiting family on the 4th and he wanted to have something for the construction crew, so I headed home to shower and change. When I got home though, there she was, waiting out front again. Hey, did we have plans? I asked her, worried I'd forgotten about it. What else would you be doing? She said. I told her I was sorry, but I promised the guys from work that I had an event to attend, that I had promised to take some plates with me, thinking, why am I playing it down to this girl? I like her, but I don't think we've even discussed being an item yet. I decided it was probably my fault and that I'd given her the wrong impression, so I said, hey, I'm sorry, honey. We've been planning this for a while. I decided to talk to her about it properly tomorrow. She didn't seem too pleased, but she stomped off to her car and said kind of petulantly, Have a good time then. The next morning I woke up and instantly regretted the extra shots of bourbon I had the night before. I grabbed my phone to shut off the alarm, but I realized it wasn't going off. It was Saturday. No work for me today, thank goodness. But as soon as my head dropped back to the pillow, I realized what it was that woke me up. It was a knocking at the door and the bell was ringing. I sat up, head spinning, wondering who could be pounding at my door this time on a Saturday morning, until I swung it open to find Amber standing there with a bakery bag and coffee. Before my dry mouth could find the words, she said, Hey, and brushed past me into the hallway. I brought you breakfast. Always with the food bribes, I thought. Oh, thank you, I said as she walked into the kitchen and I trailed behind her. I was getting worried. You didn't text me last night. What time did you get back? Who was there? No, it was really late when I got back. I thought you'd be asleep. It was just the guys from work. No, I couldn't sleep because you didn't text me. I was worried something had happened to you, she said. Well... I'm way too hungover for this, I thought, but I needed to talk to her before this gets any weirder. No, nothing happened to me. I was just having fun with the guys. Hey, Amber, thank you for the breakfast. It was really sweet, but I'm so hungover. Did we have plans for today? Well, it's the 4th of July. 
couples do things on the 4th of July. You're expected at my mom's this afternoon. Are you spending it with someone else? I was dumbfounded. Had I missed the invitation? No way was I ready to meet her family. And besides, I had plans with my own parents. I was starting to get serious Glenn Close vibes by this point. So I told her as kindly as possible that I needed some time with my own family to have a happy fourth and that I'd call her tomorrow. All day she spammed me with messages, asking me what I was doing, asking why I wasn't replying to her messages, that kind of thing. Her folks must have been real pleased that she was glued to her phone. By Saturday night she was asking, what did I do wrong? Are you breaking up with me? And call me a dick, but I was feeling weird about the whole thing. Never once had we discussed being together or put any kind of label on it. I checked myself because I was wondering if I inadvertently let her on. But no, in all honesty, I don't think I had. I decided I probably wouldn't call her the next day after all. Maybe I give her some space and take her to a nice and quiet but public place on Tuesday and tell her that I was sorry, but it's not going to work. Yes, I made up my mind to take her to dinner on Tuesday. I know it seems like an asshole thing to do in a public place, but honestly, I thought if she came to my house, she might try to convince me to stay. Sunday, I messaged her and invited her to dinner. The quiet local Italian restaurant was about three quarters full, but not overly busy. I didn't want to make a scene and embarrass her. I told her I think she's a wonderful girl, but that I don't think I want a relationship right now. I felt like an ass for the lie, but it was the kindest way I could think to let her down. I totally could not have expected her reaction. She slammed her cutlery down on the table and started bawling and I do mean bawling, so that a few of the other patrons turned to see what was going on. I tried to say that I was sorry and placed my hand on hers, but she yanked it away, screaming, Don't touch me. Oh, hell. A very concerned waitress then came over and asked if everything was all right. I was about to say, Yes, everything is fine, thank you. When Amber started sobbing, He's done with me. He's found someone else. He's a liar and a cheat. By this point, everyone in the restaurant was staring at me. I was pretty sure my mouth was hanging open, and I just said, What are you talking about? Why else wouldn't you want to be with me? I knew there was someone else after you ditched me on the 4th, she said. I was dumbfounded. I tried to tell her, and I guess the waitress, who was looking at me with a righteous expression, that no, there was no one else, but she wasn't hearing it. She continued to make a scene for a good ten minutes before getting up and stomping out of the restaurant. I settled the bill and headed out to find her, as I was pretty sure she should not have been driving in that state. But when I got outside, she'd already gone. Those tears must have cleared up real quick. Well, that went well, I thought. A couple of days went by and I was relieved. I thought I was in the clear, but on day three, John came up to me on the site and handed me a lunch bag. Jeff said to give this to you. Said a little lady dropped it off. Come on, I thought to myself. I took a seat and opened the bag, half expecting a steaming pile of shit or a death threat, but it was just another packed lunch. Honestly, I had no appetite, not that I thought she would poison me or anything, but I just didn't fancy this twisted gesture. Instead, I tossed it in the trash and opted for my own sandwich. I somehow knew she was going to be waiting for me that night when I got home. This time, I told her she needed to leave, that I was sorry, but she's getting too pushy. She sneered at me and asked if I had another girl coming around. No. I'm going to lay on the couch and watch TV. I'm tired and I want you to go. She then basically cursed me out before leaving. For the next couple of weeks, I got lunch bags on and off with notes of apology inside, asking me to please forgive her and telling me she loves me and wants to start a family with me. Honestly, I'd had enough. 
They stopped when I moved to the next site, but still every night upon returning home, I expected her to show up at my door. If she ever did, I drive straight to my buddy's house for the night and call the police. She never did show up again, but I got messages for months after that until I finally blocked her number and social media accounts. But I still got the occasional friend request from the duplicate Facebook accounts as well as messages. This went on for about six months. I didn't date seriously for a while after that, and I kept it casual. About five years ago, I met a girl who I quickly fell in love with. She's honestly the best. A few weeks after we'd been seriously seeing each other, and a matter of days after I'd updated my relationship status on Facebook, she asked me if I knew a girl named Amber. Yeah, I said, and I asked her why. She told me she received a friend request from a Facebook account with Amber's name and picture of her. She then tells me how she got a message from her reading, You are only temporary. You can be easily erased. It just made me feel cold all over. More than anything, her choice of words seemed to be sinister to me. Even though I'd never really suspected Amber was dangerous, she was just a little crazy. I told my girlfriend everything that happened with Amber and insisted we go to the police. Luckily, she didn't take much convincing. To me, it read like a threat, but in the end, the police said it was too ambiguous and probably wouldn't be considered a direct threat. Shortly after this, I moved into my girlfriend's apartment, seeing as she had a nicer place, and thankfully, we haven't heard from Amber since. Although I did get another friend request from a dummy account, there was no picture and it was just a few days ago. And I'm certain it's her. This happened back when I was in my early 20s. It was the beginning of 4th of July weekend and my friends, Nikki, Dean, Jason and I decided to embark on a camping trip to celebrate our freedom in the wilderness. We grew up together, but life had gotten busy. We had to make time to meet up. Our answer to this were weekend camping trips a few times a year. We were all big into the outdoors. Our destination that weekend was Eagles Creek State Park, renowned for crazy beautiful landscapes and good hiking. Setting up camp was a lot of fun. We were laughing and joking. We passed around bourbon as we fixed dinner. We could hear the crickets and the occasional owl. It was so relaxing. We talked for hours, catching each other up on everything we'd missed. As it got later and later, we got sleepy, and it was soon time to head to bed. Inside my tent, I lay listening intently to the sounds outside. Having grown up camping with my dad, I'd always found the sounds from the woods comforting. It didn't take me long to drift off to sleep. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping for, but I woke suddenly. I didn't know what woke me, so I listened, but I couldn't hear anything. I figured it was probably an animal, expelling any irrational fears as they came into my mind. I must have drifted off to sleep again, because I again was woken by a noise, but this time I knew exactly what had woken me. I heard a scream. My first instinct was fear for my friends, but I heard muffled exclamations from my friends' tents nearby. I grabbed my heavy flashlight and my knife and scrambled out of my tent to find my friends coming out too. We scanned the darkness for any sign of who had screamed or any immediate danger. Did you hear that? Dean whispered. He was on high alert. It could be an animal. I reassured him, trying to sound composed despite my racing thoughts. I had pretty good knowledge of the wildlife in the area and the sounds they made. My friends weren't convinced. They knew their stuff too. In hindsight, this may not have been the smartest thing to do, but at the time, we felt concerned that someone might be hurt or in trouble. And as a group, we decided we would see if we could find them. 
We were all more than a little freaked out, but we had weapons, and there were four of us. We knew many other people camped here, so I guess we underestimated the danger. We headed towards where we heard the scream. We heard more screaming, and this is when I felt the lead weight settle in my stomach. Jason told all of us to turn off our flashlights in case we needed to stay hidden. The moon was big, so we could see our footing. This terrified me, though, and I remember clasping Nikki's hand. We suddenly heard footfall in the undergrowth. I can't accurately describe how terrified I was in that moment. I just froze and jerked Nikki to a stop with me. Jason, who at this point was in front, suddenly turned his flashlight back on, and as he did so, we saw the source of the screams. A woman, disheveled and terrified, was coming towards us. Aside from scratches and a few tears in her clothes, she looked like any one of us, around our age, a normal camper. Oh, thank goodness, please, she said breathlessly as she came close to us. She had tears streaming down her face. I got separated from my friends and something chased me. We tried to calm her and ascertain what happened, but all she kept saying was something chased me or someone. She was concerned for her friends. She had no idea where her camp was, but she said she'd been running for what felt like so long. She was sure it was far. We asked her how large her group was, and she said she was here with six friends. We reassured her that they would be safe as a group. It took some convincing, but we told her to come back to camp with us, that there was no sense trying to find the camp in the dark, and that we set out first thing in the morning to search for her group. I slept in Nikki's tent that night, and let the girl, Aubrey it turned out her name was, sleep in mine. We helped her clean her scratches before we went to sleep, and made sure she wasn't in shock. She had tripped over tree roots and got her shins pretty good. It scared the living daylights out of me that she was in this state and still kept running. When I had a quiet minute with her, I asked her again what happened. She was calm enough now to explain it to me. Apparently she'd felt watched all day, and when they set off on a hike that afternoon, she'd been distracted by the view. She'd taken her camera with her to take some photos of the scenery. She was taking a shot, and heard some rustling behind her. Presuming it was her friend, she said, Isn't this amazing? But there had been no reply, and she turned around to see no one there, and she could not see her friends. She guessed that they hadn't realized she stopped and just kept walking. She said there'd been a sense of unease. She had an even stronger sense now that she was being watched, and as she tried to find her friends, she would hear the rustling behind her only to turn around and see nothing. As she went further, without any sign of her friends, she got more and more uneasy and started walking quicker and quicker. The rustling got more and more frequent. She said she just had this sense of danger, and by this point, she was stumbling forward desperately, hoping her friends would be over the next brow. She said she could swear she heard footsteps behind her, but she couldn't see anyone. This is when she broke out into a run, and so did the footsteps. She just kept running. She'd been frantic for hours until she found us. As rational as I tried to be, telling myself it was probably an animal, I was spooked, and I went to bed clutching my knife. First thing in the morning, we fueled up and set out to find Aubrey's friends. She told us which part of the park they'd set up camp, and in the daylight, we were able to find our way there. As it turned out, it wasn't far away. We made it to the spot they'd set up camp. This is it. I can see Mitch's tent. As the site came into view, Hey, Aubrey shouted, I'm back. Rushing up to the blue tent that she just pointed out, no response. It was unzipped, and there was no one inside. Are you here? She called. Nothing. She turned around to us then, and looking down at the ashes of the fire, her face fell. I noticed then that the fire had died, but it was still glowing. 
It had not been entirely put out. Empty cans were littered around the fire. All of the tents were unzipped. She went from tent to tent, but none of her friends were inside. And as we caught on, we started looking around. They wouldn't let the fire die like that, she said. And we always put it out when we leave. They wouldn't leave litter. Their packs are gone. I... She was visibly upset. Dean being Dean asked her if maybe they'd left in a hurry. Which obviously wasn't the right thing to say because Aubrey started panicking, convinced that something had happened to them. Maybe they were worried about you when you didn't return and went to look for you, I said, trying to be reassuring. But she was clearly still worried for her friends. I think it's time we went to the ranger station, Jason said. If they went looking for you, there's a good chance they informed the ranger. We'll find them. We ended up finding Aubrey's group there. They were so relieved and sharing long hugs. She explained to them how we helped her. When she told them what had happened to her in the forest, they all turned visibly uneasy. I noticed one of her friends looked like she'd seen a ghost. It turned out they decided to look for Aubrey in the morning, but when they'd gone to bed that night, they all heard strange noises outside their tents. Every one of them had heard footsteps. The friend that had looked ashen when she heard about Aubrey's ordeal said she'd heard footsteps circling her tent for hours. She was sharing the tent with another friend. Whoever was outside had begun to pull on the zipper of her tent. She had shouted, I have a gun, and her friend who had just started to wake up bolted up and started shouting every cuss word under the sun. She says she just felt like she had to intimidate whoever it was. The others in the group heard the commotion and came out of their tents to see a figure running off into the trees. The man had been pacing around her tent in circles for hours. They were all scared shitless and went to sleep the rest of the night in their vehicles. None of them were able to get much sleep through worry that Aubrey was alone in the woods so at first light, they headed to the ranger station to report what had happened and to get help searching for Aubrey. The ranger was about to head to the camp to see if Aubrey had returned when we got there. He ended up escorting us there to retrieve our belongings, and we decided to head back to civilization early that 4th of July. We said goodbye to Aubrey and her friends. They thanked us for letting Aubrey stay at our camp that night, and I still have Aubrey on Facebook. The traffic was awful, but we were glad to get out of there. I still go camping, but my dad makes me carry my Glock when I do. I don't know what that guy wanted, but if he was the one chasing Aubrey, I can only think his intentions were sinister. Many years ago, I used to work night shift at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. During the season, it wasn't so bad, mostly families and stuff. We had on-site security then too, however, in the off-season, the winter months were different. The cheap weekly rates we'd offer attracted a lot of creepy people. The idea was supposed to be to make money in the off-season by renting to what is known as snowbirds older retired people who came to the beach for a month or more through the winter. It did not always work out that way, though. The cheap rates made it possible for a less than desirable element to become long-term residents. I have discovered more than my fair share of meth labs, broken up physical assaults, and more during the winter months. Working third shift, I would meet some interesting people. The cold weather would mean some homeless people would come in and get warm and grab a cup of free coffee. I wasn't supposed to let them, but it's not in me to be cruel. I would let them grab a coffee and get warm for a minute, as long as they didn't cause trouble. As you can see, night shift in the winter made for some crazy and sometimes creepy stories. I have a lot, but this one is one that stands out, because it didn't end well for me. I had a great night up until this point. I'd gone to an indie wrestling show with my best friend before work. In fact, I had agreed to come in an hour early the next night for the young lady that worked second shift in exchange for her working an hour late for me on this night so I could enjoy the wrestling show. 
Ironically enough, I met Terry Funk that night, a wrestling legend known for his hardcore and bloody matches. Little did I know I was about to experience this kind of violence for real. I was supposed to be there at midnight due to her working over an hour for me. I normally came in at 11pm. I counted the register and she briefed me on her shift as to what had happened as per usual. As she was leaving, my friend Andrew pulled up. He worked second shift maintenance at this hotel and the other two hotels are company owned. He would regularly stop by after work and grab us some food and we would play World of Warcraft on our laptops after eating for a while due to business being slow. He was just getting my money and order for food and getting ready to leave. I was excited, telling him about how much fun I had at the wrestling show and was showing him my Terry Funk shirt that I was so proud of. I was just walking into the back office to put the shirt up when I heard the doorbell indicating a customer had entered. It is true what they say, ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I turned around when I heard someone say something loudly, but I couldn't make out what they had said. I had just reached the doorway when I saw Andrew just fall down in front of me. The next thing I know, a guy walks around the corner and punches me in the head with a short steel pipe in his hand. It staggered me and I went to one knee. The next thing I know, he hits me in the head with a pipe. After that, I hear another guy who I hadn't noticed to this moment, saying that he got away and got a cop. They left out the door. I was finally able to get to my feet. I tried to call the police from the phone in the back office, but it was having issues. I slammed it in frustration. I was hurting and scared. I was really freaking out. I realized that they could come back, so I ran and locked the door. I didn't know where Andrew had gone and that worried me. I called 911 about this time. Blood had started pouring down my head. I told the operator I'd been attacked and needed an officer and ambulance. I then called the other hotel we ran to let the night manager, Travis, who was over all three properties, know what happened. He thought I was messing with him at first, because when we got bored, we would prank each other. I finally convinced him I was not joking. He was going to lock up and come down. The police and ambulance pulled up and I opened the door. It was at this point that I found out that after they'd sucker punched Andrew and knocked him down, he was amazingly able to jump over the desk and escape, just as a cop was driving by, which he managed to flag down for help. I ended up in the hospital ER where I had to have 10 staples in my scalp, and they gave me morphine for the pain. I had no way to get home after being treated but the doctor and nurses took pity on me and paid for a cab. My plan was to go back to work because this was December and Christmas was coming. I had three kids and needed all the hours I could get. When I got back to the hotel, the IT guy Ted was there with his wife, Barbara, who also worked the front desk. She was shocked to see me. She thought I would still be in the hospital. I thought I'd only been hit in the head once after being punched but the video which Ted was pulling for the police showed a different story. After I went to one knee, the guy had hit me not just once, but ten times in total. I kept trying to grab the pipe and get up for some reason. I don't remember that. I guess I was out on my feet. He kept punching me and hitting me with the pipe, until his friend tells him Andrew had gotten away and then proceeded to get the cops. The two of them then ran out. I was given a room at the other hotel we own, and Ted and Barbara gave me a lift there as I was in no condition to drive due to the morphine. They also gave me a paid week off to heal. They switched me over to the other hotel on night shift for a month, just in case they were after me in particular. We never found out why they chose to attack me. The police thought it might be a failed strong-armed robbery due to Andrew getting away and me just not going down. It shook me up though, not knowing. Even though I was at our other hotel when I came back to working night shift, I was still nervous. Every time the door chimed, I tensed up. I couldn't afford to quit though. As I said, I had three kids I was supporting. They never caught the guys as far as I know. A detective stopped by about two months later when I was working second. He showed me several mugshots and asked me if any of them looked familiar. I never got a great look at them as it all happened so fast. 
I had seen the video, which wasn't the best quality. Even so, two of them looked very familiar like them. I pointed them out, and he asked how sure I was. I told him honestly, like 85%. He then yelled and asked me if I wanted someone to go to jail for attempted murder on 85%. I was stunned into silence. I was the victim. I was attacked for no reason, and he's yelling at me like it's my fault. I was busy being attacked to get a good look at them. I no longer work at a hotel, and I don't do night shifts, and I'm glad, because it's just too dangerous in this area. This happened to me and my girlfriend I was dating back in the summer of 2014. This all took place in South Carolina, and my girlfriend and I wanted to take a camping trip. We initially tried to go to a place 45 miles from our hometown, but they were going to charge us double what we thought we were going to pay for. We decided to head back, and it just occurred to me that there's a spot very close to where we live. Now I will say it's more boondocking and off-grid. We didn't have to pay for anything, we just parked the car and got out. This place is quite gorgeous. There's a historic bridge and trail, also some of the oldest railroad tracks in the south. We got there before sunset, so we had plenty of time to pitch the tent and set everything up. There were a few cars when we arrived, but they were mostly hikers and would be gone before nightfall. The only thing that made us uncomfortable was a busted up and rusted old white van with no license plate. We both pointed that out, thinking it was weird, but we shrugged it off and started walking to a good place to set up camp. After several hours, around 3am, following some quality time spent with my girlfriend and taking in all the nature and then going to sleep, we started hearing this obscure singing and walking around our tent. Any time you hear commotion that early in the morning, nothing good can come from it. I peered my head out of the tent to see what was going on. I didn't see anything or anyone, but nonetheless, I didn't want to stay in that area when we both were freaked out. Just because I couldn't see them doesn't mean it's not there. I barely did a decent walk around our tent. As we were quietly gathering our belongings, we swore we heard the singing get louder. I recall words in this song he was singing had, Now won't y'all come out, followed by this raspy laughing. Once we finally packed the tent, that was when the crunching on the leaves and his humming began. We knew this guy was close by now. We booked it. I grabbed my girlfriend's hand and threw the tent and folding chairs on my back. We made sure to run the opposite way from where all the noise was coming from. Luckily we set up camp fairly close to the parking lot because I could see the lights through the trees. As we ran and scurried away from whoever was chasing us, we noticed the lights from the parking lot weren't just the street lights, but also to our horror, it was that old, rusty white van we saw in the beginning. We hurried uphill, just hoping this guy was alone. If he had an accomplice, that would be another person to deal with. As we reached the lot, we got into the bright street lights, and I noticed my girlfriend's hand make a slight twitch, and her pace slowed down. From what I could tell, she was turning her head to take a look at her attacker. I heard her gasp loudly. Come on, don't look, we're almost there. She focused back and we continued running in unison. The guy was getting closer as I could hear the footsteps on the gravel intensify. I heard his wheezing and him barking. Don't y'all think you'll get away? As we just made it past the van, we split and I handed her the keys so she could unlock and start the car, and I can throw all the gear into the trunk and we can make it out of this place. As I frantically laid the camping gear in the back seat and head over to the driver's side, that was when my body faced forward for the first time in a while. Every noise this guy was making was close and amplified now. With the car running, I kept my head down and put it in reverse, but curiosity got the better of me. In the brightness of my headlights, this man was a behemoth with a stern wrinkled face with patchy red hair, a goatee that had dirt and crud smeared all over it. His eyes were fixated on us like a scope 
magnifying on two ten-point bucks. He was wanting to kill. Get back here, he barked, waving a baseball bat back and forth. I shook my head, and with that, I swerved out, and we were on our way out with our hearts racing. In the rearview mirror, we saw the man slam the bat in frustration. A narrow escape. We drove to Waffle House and stayed there until sunrise. My boyfriend at the time and I were house-sitting for his uncle. My boyfriend was at work and I was bathing our son before bed. I had the bathroom window very slightly cracked and heard a cough from outside. This house was in a residential neighborhood, so it could have been a neighbor, but I suddenly felt anxious and scared, and something told me to go make sure the back door was locked. I left my two-year-old son alone in a towel in the bathroom and ran to the back door. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, locking it, I came face to face with someone through the glass who had his hand on the outside doorknob. He started pounding on the door and juggling the doorknob, saying he was looking for someone, and I just told him no, they're not here. He kept jiggling the doorknob, and I ran to my son and grabbed my cell phone to call for help. Remember, I'm house-sitting though, and this was in 2004 to 2005 when they had those flip-open phones, not a smart one where you can just look at a map, so I had no idea what the address was or where the house phone was. Anyway, I call 911 from the bathroom on my cell phone, all while hearing a loud pounding at the back door. The dispatcher tells me to find a house phone, piece of mail, anything with an address on it. I locate the house phone and call 911 from that, so I have no idea how the police got there so quickly, but just as I hear the back door glass break, the guy on the phone tells me to cover my son's head with a blanket and run out the front door into the back seat of the police car. I ran out the front door and saw six or more police officers all with guns drawn and I got straight into the waiting cruiser. After they arrested the guy, they asked me if the machete on the back porch belonged to the owners of the house. The guy had a machete and had I not trusted my gut that the cough sounded a little too close and to check the back door, he would have walked right into an unlocked house to a 19-year-old female and her young son alone. Turns out he'd been robbing houses and had a backpack full of stolen things, and he was high on meth. Anyways, I'm really glad I followed my gut on that one. I was talking to a friend and remembered this creepy story from the pandemic. I lived alone. I had no cars and no shops nearby. It was 9pm and I'd got back from work and realized there was no food in the house, so I ordered a grocery delivery on Uber Eats. I asked them to leave it at the door due to the rules. There was a knock at the door and I saw a tall, skinny guy standing right by it. I shouted through the letterbox to leave it on the floor and back up. He said no and that he had to hand it to me as it had alcohol in it. I hadn't ordered any alcohol, so I told him he had the wrong order. He claimed it was correct. I told him sternly to put it on the floor and back up. Again, he refused. Stupidly, I opened the door a crack to tell him to do it due to the rules, and he stepped towards the door and put his hand on the handle. I pulled it shut and shouted to leave it or I was reporting him. He put it down and stepped back. I asked him through the letterbox to back up further. He did, but again, when I opened the door, he stepped forward. I always remember the chill that went down my spine when he said, Pretty, very pretty, in a low monotone voice. I noticed he had his phone out pointed at me, and I asked what he was doing. He said he had to take a picture, but it was pointed at my face and not the bag on the floor. I grabbed it and slammed the door shut and locked it. I watched through a crack in the curtains as he stood by the door, pacing back and forth as if he couldn't make up his mind. 
He knocked, but I ignored it. I was getting seriously creepy vibes and called my best friend for advice. She told me to report him and not open the door. I shouted out the letterbox for him to leave, but he refused and still stood there. My dog, who is normally the sweetest thing going, had picked up on my anxiety and began barking at the door. He turned and got into his car that was parked across the street from my house. I kept watching for the next ten minutes or so through my window, but he wouldn't leave. He just sat there, but I figured maybe he was picking another order to take. Suddenly a message popped up on Uber. He told me he'd forgotten a bag in the car and asked me to come get it. I checked my order and it was all there, so I messaged saying it wasn't mine. He got insistent, saying he couldn't leave until I picked it up. He was practically begging me to come to the car, saying it wouldn't take a minute and I could grab it from the passenger side. I lost my shit. I told him I'd heard what he'd said, that I knew he was taking a picture of me and not the order, and that I was calling the police. He still said I had to come get it. The entire time I was on the phone to the police, he was still messaging me, even saying, the police won't come, pick up the order and I'll leave. Why are you making it hard? The police told me someone would be there within 20 minutes and to stay inside with the doors locked. My dog was going nuts, hackles up and barking. My neighbor's husband, who was six foot four and built like a brick shed, texted saying he heard a commotion and asked if I was okay. I told him what was going on and he immediately ran out, shouting at the guy that he was a predator and to fuck off before he got fucked up. The delivery guy peeled out of there and my neighbors came over to make me a cup of tea and wait for the police. I made a report to both them and Uber, but all I got was an apology from Uber. The police never came back to me. I got a car shortly after and didn't use Uber again until my boyfriend moved in. So, to the creepy predatory Uber driver, let's not meet again. So this happened a few months ago. My boyfriend went on a short trip with his friends. The original plan was for them to go on a poker cruise, but this got cancelled because the boat didn't have a place to harbor or something like that. The boat would have gone to Norway, so my boyfriend and his friends decide to drive to Czech Republic instead. I only found out about this when they were already on their way. All they did was play poker in different places, one of them being King's Casino. He loved that place, by the way, and it really did look beautiful from the photos. Anyway, it was their way back when something terrifying happened. It happened on the drive back when they were on the highway in Germany. In the car was my boyfriend and two other friends. After quite the drive, they needed to take a piss. They decided to stop at this abandoned looking place where a lot of truck drivers stopped. It did give them a creepy vibe, but they really needed to go, so they still decided to stop there, something they'd regret very much. So picture this, an abandoned place with lots of trucks, with a dark forest stretching beyond view in the middle of the night. Quite creepy. So my boyfriend and his friends arrive there, and they get out to take a piss. While walking, one of his friends made a joke about how it's such a typical place for a murder to happen. It did make them feel a bit uneasy, but they still laughed it off. At some point, they found a good place to piss. It wasn't far from their car. After a minute or so, one of them suddenly says, Someone's coming. My boyfriend and the other friend obviously freaked out a bit, but they did think it was a joke until they heard footsteps running towards them. They were approaching fast. Someone was full-on sprinting towards them. Once they heard that, they all started running for their lives towards the car and frantically got in. They sped out of there as fast as possible. My boyfriend and the friend who wasn't driving were trying to see if they could see who it was, but it was too dark to see anything at all. They had no idea who charged them at night. This freaked my boyfriend out so much that he couldn't sleep when he got to my place. When he told me this story, 
It really creeped me out as if I went through it. Funnily enough, that was also the time I watched all of Mr. Ballin's videos about people who went to places they shouldn't have, and videos about the missing 401. So all I could think about were the horrible things that could have happened to him if they didn't get out of there safely. I also got kind of mad at him, saying, Do you want to become a Mr. Ballin video? And... Do you want to become an unsolved mystery? I was just so scared for him. We can laugh about it now, but back then, it freaked both of us out a lot. For a bit of background, I'm a dog walker and pet sitter. Some of the dogs I walk have reactivity, as did this one dog, a pit and lab mix. She used to be a bad puller, along with being incredibly reactive to other dogs on leash as soon as she'd see them. Through lots of work and training with her, she's come a long way with her reactivity, to the point it's really not an issue anymore. Even when other owners' carelessness allows their dogs to get too close for comfort. On this one walk, she was a dream the whole time. She passed multiple dogs without issue. She would just look at me for a treat she knew she'd get if she was good. We turned down a side street that looked completely vacant at the time, so I could give her some more relaxed walking time, and all went well for a while. Not a soul in sight, until there was. Well, I'm usually very good at keeping my head on a swivel, as some of my walks are not in the safest areas of the city. This guy took me by surprise. I don't know how he did it, but he got about two to three feet behind us without my dog or me knowing he was there. And all of a sudden, he shouted something unintelligible. I could only make out the last two words. Your dog. Immediately, my dog, with no prior history of human reactivity, got between us and started growling, snapping, and lunging aggressively at this man. I'm a smaller woman at 5'3", and I guess this guy was 6'7", at the very least, and he was incredibly muscular. As soon as he saw my dog trying to attack him, and me struggling to hold her back, he threw his arms up and bolted across the street without another word. He disappeared shortly after around a corner. I've never praised a dog for reactivity until that moment. I gave her all the treats I had left in my pocket, took her home, and told her owner what had just happened and how her dog might have saved my life. Of course, I hope I'm wrong, and the guy was just slow with social cues, but neither the dog nor I got that impression. Needless to say, she's by far my favorite client dog, I go on walks with her still every week, but we haven't gone down that street again while there are no people about. I'm beyond blessed to have her and get to walk her weekly, but I do hope I never meet the, your dog guy, again. Last week I received a call from an unknown caller. My first thought was that someone wants to sell me anything or something like that. Normally I wouldn't answer, but I was bored and thought I might prank the other person. A male voice that didn't sound familiar to me said, You proved that you're a real fighter. You didn't let life defeat you. I will call you again in a week, and then it will start. I thought nothing about it, and I assumed it was a harmless joke. Until yesterday, when a week passed by. I was on my way to a job interview and was waiting at a bus stop for the bus, which was already in sight, but stood in front of a red traffic light. My phone started to ring, and again it's from an unknown caller. This time I didn't want to answer, but all of a sudden this guy who was sitting at the bus stop said, didn't he mention he would call you again? At first, I thought he was on the phone because he had AirPods inside of his ears. But then he looked straight in my direction and asked, Don't you want to answer? I asked him what he means, but he didn't answer me. Then my bus arrived, 
I was in a hurry, so I just got on and left. I did my job interview and went home, and I haven't left my apartment since. Sometimes I look out of the windows to see if anything or anyone seems strange to me, but so far I haven't noticed anything. There have been no further calls. I'm a bit scared now, and I don't know what I should do about it. What do you think about all of this? For context, I'm a 27-year-old male, 6 foot, and about 210 pounds, and definitely don't frighten easy. So a few months ago, I made a trip up to the local gas station to grab some beer. I walked in like usual, and noticed a new guy working the register. He says hello in a friendly tone as I walk past, and I do the same in return. I go to the back and grab my beer and walk to the front. Very typical, nothing out of the ordinary. So I set my beer on the counter, and this is where it happened. I made eye contact with the new guy, and instantly my blood ran cold, and my adrenaline rushed. My fight or flight was triggered, and I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. It almost seemed time slowed to a crawl, and this guy was just staring through my soul. I can barely describe the instant sense of danger and impending doom. Every part of my being was screaming, You're in danger. Run. Now. All of this was in the span of a couple of seconds, but it felt like an eternity. And the silence was broken when he said what my total was. I was unable to break eye contact. It was impossible while I fumbled with my wallet. I set a $5 bill on the counter and quickly walked out, not even waiting for my change. I had a massive panic attack in my truck, and almost crashed on my way home. I told my wife what happened. She chalked it up to, a guy scared me. I told my friends about it, and they thought I was insane. I stopped talking about it, but the feeling and the image of this guy were stuck with me. A week or so after that encounter, I had a low tire on my trailer, so I stopped at that same gas station. I had change on me, so I wouldn't have to go inside for any reason. While I'm crouching down, airing up my tire, I start getting the same intense feeling. That feeling of danger, the feeling of panic, and that I need to run. Confused yet alert, I lift my head to look around. This guy is glaring at me from the window of the gas station. Blank expression, just staring me down like I'm being sized up or something. He watches me get in my truck and drive away. And I swear, I didn't see him blink once. The next day, I've had enough, and I'm getting to the bottom of this, damn it. So I decide I'm going to talk to this guy and figure out what the hell is going on, because this isn't right. I get to the gas station, and it's the usual lady working. I asked her about the new guy and when he'd be back around. She told me he actually quit working there that day. I was relieved and confused at the same time but I figured I could finally forget about all that strange shit and move on. I haven't seen that guy since, but that feeling and that face still remains burned in my head like it was yesterday. I still don't go to that gas station, just so I don't have to think about it. Anyway, has this ever happened to you guys? I've tried talking to people, and they always give me the same shit about it. If anyone has a clue on what could have caused this, Please let me know. Thanks for listening. A colleague of my mother's told her this story, and I got instant goosebumps when I heard it. My mom's colleague lives alone. No partner, parents, or children just a dog to keep her company, but every year during the summer holidays, she invites her cousins to spend an evening with her. They then watch movies, play games, and eat candy. The children absolutely love it. As she lives alone, she only has one bedroom. When she's having a sleepover with the cousins, she lets the children sleep in the bedroom, and she herself sleeps on the couch downstairs. 
So last summer, she organized a sleepover with her cousin as usual. It was fun, and she just put the children to sleep in her bedroom. Tired but satisfied, she dropped down on her couch and soon fell asleep. Around 3 a.m., she was woken up by her dog barking restlessly. This was quite abnormal because her dog never barked at night. Still half asleep, she got up from the couch and walked over to her dog to see what was going on. She bends down to pet her dog and says, Hey, what's wrong, buddy? As she says this, she hears someone behind her in the darkness respond, I don't know either. She started screaming and immediately ran upstairs to lock herself and the children in the bedroom and call the police. In the end, it turned out to be just a drunk man who'd entered the wrong home. But man, I would have shat myself if this happened to me. My son fell asleep on the couch around noon, and I thought, perfect, I'll go nap too. About an hour or so later, I woke up to him crying. This in itself is pretty unusual, since he's a very happy little boy, but I comforted him, and he clung to me like he never wanted to let go. After about 10 or 15 minutes, I untangled myself and turned on Donald Duck for him to watch. He was happy and snuggly like usual and some time went by. I was laying on the couch with him, just reading stories about possessions on Reddit when he gets up. He walked toward the kitchen through the hallway when he suddenly stops, turns around and looks at me, eyes locked. He slides one finger across his throat in a very well-known gesture. He doesn't make a sound, nor does he have any expression on his face. A few seconds pass and he turns around and walks into the kitchen. About 30 seconds later, he comes walking into the living room and seems to be his happy self again. A couple of days ago, his mother was watching him here. She wrote me a message on Messenger that a door opened by itself, and she felt something or someone touch her. I definitely believe her. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here, but I ignore it to the extent that it almost becomes ridiculous. I have many spooky stories to tell, but this actually freaked me out enough to acknowledge it. He's just three years old. Almost a year ago, I was fresh out of college and had just moved into an apartment with my high school bestie and her fiancé. This was after a long period of not seeing her in person, my bestie and I had a long and great relationship with a few rocky periods. I didn't know her fiancé well, but I had met him a couple of times. He came off as rude and kind of loud, but mostly nice enough. I let a lot of little annoying behavior slide because she was so in love with him. I really just wanted to spend time with my best friend. Over the course of a few months... I slowly discovered that she was trapped in an abusive relationship with the most classic example of malignant narcissist imaginable. Their fights escalated to the point where he was completely trashing the apartment, breaking her phone and laptop, hiding her car keys, blocking the door, and grabbing her arms so hard she had bruises, all while hurling out the worst insults he could fathom at the top of his lungs for hours. This man is about a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier than me, so there was nothing I could do other than give her a ride somewhere else away from him until the next morning. He didn't like it when I did that. Once it reached the point of physical harm against her, I put my foot down and demanded that he move out or I would call the cops. He wasn't technically signed onto the lease, so I could have kicked him out. He begged for time to find a new place, he was extremely drunk and high the night he heard her, and he promised to stay sober until he moved. Not wanting to escalate things, I agreed on the condition that nothing like that would ever happen again. My friend and her fiancé broke up soon after that. Three weeks pass and everything is going great. Her ex-fiancé has found a new place, is in training for a new job, 
and while still loud and inconsiderate, he hasn't caused any problems so far. I get ready for bed early. I have an important meeting early the next day. I put on some comfortable pajamas, locking my door before I change out of habit. My best friend is out working, and it's just me upstairs in bed, and her ex-fiancé is downstairs yelling on the phone about something. I tune him out and try to sleep. He's moving out next week. My chest rattles from the booming footfalls of the stairs to my room, waking me from my sleep. My eyes snap open to see my bedroom doorknob rattling back and forth, locked. He lets out a yell of pure malice and bangs on my door. He screams my name, and it's so slurred, he sounds like he's trying to impersonate a lizard man. The hinges aren't looking so good. We lived in a shitty, cheap apartment with thin doors. I have something to do before he breaks open the door, right? I say the only thing I can think of. What the fuck? Suddenly, the banging and screaming stops. My doorknob falls still. After a terrifying moment of silence, he says flatly, Open the door, bud. Just come and open the door. I still laugh about that one. Like after all that, I just walk over and open it up. Instead, I grabbed my essentials and jumped out the window. I was on the second floor, but we lived on a hill so the fall wasn't quite that high. I still managed to fall wrong. I hobbled as quickly as I could to my car and peeled away. I called my best friend and warned her not to go home. We made plans for her to stay with a friend after she got off of work. I made it to the friend's house and passed out for a few hours. I woke up to a call from my best friend. He traveled all the way to her workplace with a knife and broke in. He assaulted her and held the knife up to her special needs client's throat and said he'd kill him in front of her. Thank God a co-worker overheard everything in another room and was able to call the police in time for everyone to come out alive. My best friend also said he was on the phone with her while he was banging on my door and he said he was going to kill me and make her listen. I was totally alone in the apartment with him, sleeping upstairs in my bed. If I hadn't locked my doors that night, would I even still be alive? If I had left my car keys downstairs, would I have been able to get away? When I returned to my apartment the next morning, my bedroom door was completely kicked in. My belongings were scattered everywhere, and the large butcher knives were missing from the kitchen, and they were instead sitting in the corner of the hallway to my room. Last year, I was living in a very rural town in the middle of the mountains. Most small western towns only have one road that goes into the big city. Our road in particular was about 50 miles of empty highway, surrounded only by cliffs, fields, and occasionally a farm. At the very entrance to this road, once you enter the city, is a huge truck stop and gas station that is always packed. My mom and I were going back home after a midnight showing of whatever movie we had decided to see, and, as per usual, we stopped to fill up on gas and get a drink for the long drive. As we were leaving, I vaguely noticed a dingy older jeep pull out the same time we did, but of course, I didn't take much notice of it. It wasn't weird that someone would be leaving the same time as us. As we started down the pitch black road, the jeep kept at a steady pace behind us. Again, not weird. Until it came flying up past us before disappearing behind a hill. My mom and I just scoffed. We were going 60, but when people knew the roads well, they often drove them at close to 100, even at night. Eventually, we came up to the jeep from before. It was pulled over, but the back half of the vehicle was in the road and what was clearly a man's arm was waving out the window, gesturing for us to pull over. Of course, we pass it. The man flies past us once more and pulls over again. He does this once more, and my mom and I begin to get very nervous. After passing him for the third time, 
he flies up and begins tailgating us. He's driving so close that we can't see his headlights in the rearview mirror, and he's honking his horn every so often, waving his arm for us to pull over. He carries on with this for 30 minutes. My mom and I are terrified. She's white-knuckling the wheel. I'm holding a pocket knife to make myself feel better. I swore at my own mom for the first time that night, begging her, don't you fucking dare pull over. If you've ever seen the movie, Rest Stop, that's all that was going through my mind. The road is a dead zone for service, so we couldn't call the police or anyone. The picture of us dead or worse on the side of the empty road was the only thing I could think about. But, as soon as it had started, it ended. The man slammed on his brakes, turned around, and went back. The ride home was silent, and I ended up sleeping in my mom's room out of fear. The next morning, we had a discussion, and came to the conclusion he'd seen two lone women traveling at night, and thought we'd be easy pickings. Which, he would have been right. Some people suggest that he'd seen us drop money or a receipt at the gas station and want it to be a good Samaritan. I think that's ridiculous. Nobody following two women home in such an aggressive manner has good intentions. We moved out of town a few months later for unrelated reasons, but just before we did, the same car was reported following a group of four men on their way to work. So, maybe he just likes to scare people. Either way, that night was easily one of the scariest of my life. I was essentially homeless about seven to eight years ago after breaking up with someone, among other factors. I found a room in a boarding house. One of the other boarders was a guy around my age. I remember the first time I saw him was when I got out of the shower and was walking back to my room. He stared me down, but I thought it was kind of a whoops, just looking out into the hall and seeing someone, didn't mean to make eye contact kind of thing. The next day, there was a note under my door basically saying, Hey, I'm your housemate. Let me know if you need anything or want to hang out. Having come out of a few bad situations, I was without many people so we struck up a friendship. Over time, it became apparent he had a crush on me, and it soon became very creepy. The more I learned about him, the more, off, I realized he was. He had two or maybe three kids, all with different women. Whatever, that's fine. But custody, none with any of them. One he had unsupervised visitation with. One he had supervised visitation with. And the third, his girlfriend moved to get away from him and wouldn't tell him if the child even existed or not. Due to the issues with his kids and exes, he started to self-medicate with alcohol. He did this purposefully, as he admitted this was why he was doing it, getting blackout drunk to deal with his feelings. That's when the stalking started. One night, during one of his blackouts, I thought I could calm him down so I went to his room to keep the landlady from calling the cops. He grabbed my arm, pinned them to my sides, then laid on top of me, pinning me between him and the floor. I got out and ran. The police ended up being called, but he wasn't kicked out. After that, his obsession grew out of what I can only think was some sort of psychotic guilt. Instead of apologizing and staying sober, he started tracking my movements, with this, more letters showed up under my door. A lot of them were angry. The one I remember most was him essentially accusing me of cheating on him. It was like a rambling manifesto, with things about how he knows I must be lying to him about having a boyfriend now, because he left a cigarette between my door and the door jam, and because it wasn't crushed and didn't fall out, that meant I never came home and thus I had to have a boyfriend I was staying the night with. This would then be followed by strange text messages telling me I deserve everything bad that happened to me because I apparently used him. I only lived there for about five to six weeks, but this started about a few days in and only ended when I finally said, fuck it, 
and moved into a weekly studio that was far more expensive. I'd just gotten a job and had the ability to pay for it, and since I was genuinely afraid for my safety, I made sure to leave when I knew he wouldn't be there. Oh, and the ex I mentioned at the beginning of this, he was also actively threatening me during this same period. I had him blocked on everything, but the guy found a loophole by sending me songs on fucking Spotify related to what he was mad about that day, with messages attached to them so he could actively berate me. I used to live in a three-story house with my parents, younger sibling, and our dog. We moved into this house a few months before my younger sibling was born, and that was when we first met the neighbors across the street. Lucas, who was the oldest child in their family, was always a bit strange, but there were some aspects of his personality that were more than just strange. They were straight up disturbing. It would take hours to cover everything, so I'm just going to get straight to the point. I'm almost positive that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. Our house was built on a hill, so it looked like it was only two stories from the front, and the basement was connected to the backyard. The yards in this neighborhood were much larger than they are in newer housing developments, so it would have been very easy for someone to enter our backyard unnoticed. Despite this, my family was terrible about making sure all of the basement doors were locked. My younger sibling and I would always go in and out when we were playing in the backyard, or someone would go down to let the dog out, and we would end up forgetting to lock one of the doors before bed. We also lived in a safe area where it was common for people to leave their doors unlocked. However, my family did always lock the door leading down to the basement every night, along with all of the other doors on the main level of the house. I had a fucked up sleep schedule back then, so I would usually still be awake at 3 or 4 in the morning. There are two specific instances that happened very late at night, which make me think that Lucas had been inside of our house without our knowledge. One night, I was in my bedroom on the upper level of the house. It was probably around 2.30 in the morning when I suddenly heard the sound of an angry growl coming from downstairs. Thinking that my dog had spotted a cat in the front yard, I quickly rushed down to stop him from barking and waking up my entire family. This kind of thing would happen every now and then, so I wasn't thinking too much of it at the time. But instead of going downstairs and finding my dog by the front window, I found him by the locked door that leads down to the basement. The fur on the back of his neck was standing up, and his nose was pressed to the bottom of the door. I instantly froze when I realized what was happening. There was something, or someone on the other side of the basement door. I was barely a teenager at the time, so I began to panic and started making my way upstairs as quietly as possible. I woke up both of my parents, but neither of them took me very seriously. My dad just assumed that my dog was hearing random noises coming from outside, but he did eventually go down to check things out. He said that everything downstairs looked normal, but he also mentioned that we forgot to lock one of the basement doors that night. Then there was another time that I was up late and in my room. But this time, instead of hearing my dog growling, I heard a loud bark that echoed through the entire house. The sound was sudden and intense, similar to a shot, and it almost made me jump out of my chair. Assuming again that my dog had seen a cat outside, I quickly looked out of my bedroom window and tried to spot whatever he was barking at. But my heart suddenly dropped when, instead of seeing a cat, I saw Lucas running out of our front yard in the pitch black. I watched him run across the street and back towards his own house. Before I rushed to close the curtains and duck out of sight, I remember sitting there, struggling to process what I'd just seen, questioning why Lucas would be in our yard in the middle of the night. I told my mom about it the very next morning, and she said she would bring it up to Lucas's mom. Because of these two instances, and because of other details that I can't include, 
I'm 99.9% .9 sure that Lucas had been inside of our house in the middle of the night. If you knew the entire story behind this family, then you would also find the thought of this to be extremely disturbing. I do want to mention that this all happened years ago. My family no longer lives in that house, and those neighbors across the street are doing fine. But looking back on everything now, I'm realizing just how creepy the situation truly was. I live in a small rural town in the eastern US. That being said, you end up seeing a lot of the same people if you frequent the same places. I often go to a particular gas station close to my house for snacks, gas, cigarettes, you name it. A few months ago, I was standing in line to pay, and the man in front of me, probably in his 50s or 60s by the looks of him, started to talk to me. I'm very aware of my surroundings at all times, and I don't often engage with strangers in public, especially old men. I kept my answers short. He started by asking pretty innocent questions, like what I was buying, but this quickly escalated into what I was doing that night. If I had a boyfriend, if I lived close. Thankfully, he was next in line, so the questioning stopped when he was called up to the counter and paid and left. I went on with my day, feeling just a little creeped out. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I run into him at the gas station. I have no idea how he remembered me. I look completely different as I was dressed in business casual for work this time and I was dressed like a slob the first time. He started talking to me again, again asking about if I had a boyfriend, where I lived, where I worked, that kind of thing. I mostly ignored him until he got really upset that I wasn't really talking to him and then I got scared so I started answering some of his questions with fake answers. When I left to go to the parking lot after paying, he was sitting on the curb outside, presumably waiting for me. I felt really uncomfortable, but I had to get into my car and leave as I was running late for work. I know he saw what car I drive, my license plate and everything, and it really wouldn't be that hard to find me in my town, so I was really creeped out. At this point, I didn't contact the police or anything as I assumed there was nothing they could do as I didn't have any hard proof of anything. I did tell my roommate and describe the guy to her in case she saw him or anything suspicious. A few weeks after the second encounter, I saw him again, this time at the grocery store. I didn't interact with him and he seemed to not notice me for a while. Until one time we almost ran right into each other going down an aisle. I looked away and just kept walking, pretending I didn't notice him. That's when I started to see him in every aisle I walked down, in the checkout line and everything. It was like he was following me. I walked out to my car after paying, and he was standing about 10 yards away from my car at another car, smoking a cigarette. I again ignored him, got into my car to leave, and noticed he got into his car as well. I purposely started driving the opposite direction to my house, making random turns, and he followed me through every single one, speeding up and slowing down to stay with me. I'd had enough, so I, being the true crime enthusiast that I am, started driving directly to the police station. I guess he figured out where I was going, and he made a random turn and I lost him. I got to the police station and made a report, because now I at least had a description, as well as the car he was driving. They told me, since there wasn't any hard proof, they couldn't do anything, but they would keep my report and told me to call them or visit again if I had any more information. I haven't seen him in a few weeks now, and I stopped going to the same gas station near my house. I have a feeling that I was definitely being targeted by this man but I had no idea what his intentions were. I'm scared, and I look over my shoulder everywhere I go now. I'm seriously thinking about buying a new car and possibly moving out of this town.
So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I was walking home from the store yesterday, and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow, and the man in the car was clearly watching me. When he fully passed me, I saw that he was watching me in his rearview mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed my pace down so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow, but it moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street, so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left. And when I saw he was gone, I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen, but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking, I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the fourth turn, I looked back and saw the man at the corner I just turned from, and that told me he had circled back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then, as I had just barely made the last turn and it was close to my house, I saw the man's car just turn the corner of the street, straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way, and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house, and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I live in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back, I'm out by myself again? What if there's no one home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back, I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live, especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go, but I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me. I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him, especially since if he was at the store I was at, he's definitely somewhere near my neighborhood. I was having lunch with a friend at Subway, and as we were walking in, I noticed a car driving and parking very terribly with a bit of a flat tire. I thought nothing of it and had ordered my sandwich. A few minutes later, a middle-aged blonde woman walked in. She was wearing green cowboy boots, starry leggings, a purple skirt, a red wife beater, sunglasses, and a grey puff jacket. She asked the subway employee if they still have salad, and then asked, does salad help with, like, cold? After waiting in line for like 10 minutes for her salad, she exited without even ordering a salad. Five minutes later, she came back and got in line again. She started plugging her nose between her middle and pointer fingers. She waited in line for another 10 minutes and read the menu with her finger. After a while, she got out of line again and stood at the trash can, directly behind my friend, facing me, staring at me, and plugging her nose. She scoffed at me and went outside. She sat on a chair that was missing a leg right in front of the glass door with her back to me. The subway employee told her that it was broken, and she said she felt it when she sat down, and she continued to sit there. She came back inside for a third time and she gestured to a high school-aged boy in the line behind her. She gestured for him to take his airpods out. She whispered in his ear, and the guy said aloud, That one, and pointed at me. She whispered again and promptly leaves. The kid told me that she told him she hates the girl facing the door. That was me. After we finished eating, my friend and I stepped outside to smoke. The weather was getting nicer, so we stayed outside for a good half hour. We soon realized she was the chick who parked all crazy, and she was still sitting outside watching us the whole time, with her car door open. I was scared shitless, 
but my friend was smart enough to get her license plate number in case something happened while I was frozen, trying not to make it obvious that I saw what she was doing. Luckily, I made good acquaintances with one of the subway employees, and he let me hang out in the storage room for a bit until she left. I later found out that seconds after I stepped into the storage room, she'd come back into the store, taken a quick look around, and then dipped. I didn't know what would have happened if the high school kid didn't speak up, or if she didn't park crazy, because I wouldn't have noticed her watching me. I don't believe I did anything to offend her, although I may not have been able to hide my disdain for her fashion choices. She didn't appear to be under the influence of anything, despite her sunglasses and reckless driving. I honestly hope she was under the influence, because it would be a much more depressing reality if she were just that mentally ill and wasn't being actively treated for it. I wished my friend kept her license plate number on her phone so that I could have possibly intervened with the obvious drug or mental issue at play, as some atypical social behavior puts her in danger as well by far one of my strangest encounters. For context, this story spans all the way back from middle school to now. I personally believe this girl is closer to a stalker than anything. During my 7th grade year of middle school, there was a girl in my class that suddenly took a liking to me. Her name was Stacy. It was pretty obvious she liked me, and I didn't care too much for it at all. Especially at that time, it didn't bother me. A couple of weeks passed since she's made it really apparent she had a crush on me. I'm at my home in my basement when I get a text on my phone. It's from a random number that I'd never seen before. Even weirder, I never gave out my iCloud account to anyone from my school, and the email itself was random enough that no one could have guessed what it was. Anyway, I eventually find out a couple of minutes later it was Stacy texting me. I entertained it because I didn't want to be mean and just not respond, so she would text me every day like clockwork. Now at this time, I had a crush on a girl named Amanda, and this Halloween dance was coming up. Maybe a week from the Halloween dance, I get a text from Stacy. And in this text stream, she finally confessed her feelings for me. And I tell her I didn't have any feelings for her and that I was sorry. I try to remain as respectful as possible. Stacy then begins to text me essentially how she knew it was a long shot that I'd like her back because she knew who I liked. So, in the back of my mind at this point, I'm like, what? How does she know who I like? So I ask first, how do you know who I like? And she tells me, Amanda, and that her friend had told her. And the friend that she just happened to be dating was my friend, who told her who my crush was. I then asked, did my friend tell your friend who I liked? And she said, yes. I was pissed. The next day I arrive and I confront my friend, and he swears he didn't tell anyone. And I trust him. I confront Stacy later that night to which she tells me that she lied and figured out who it was because she stared at me so much. I didn't even know what to say other than to stop talking to her. Fast forward to the summer and she's texting me every day how she needs to get over me. I mean every day. So for probably two weeks, I kept telling her how she'd find someone else who would like her and care for her and how I just wasn't the one. Eventually I get tired of this and I tell her if she's going to get over me, she's going to have to stop talking to me. She gets angry with me, and I told her to stop contacting me. I thought that was it, and I was so wrong. The worst had yet to come. Fast forward to my birthday of 8th grade, when I think all of this has blown over. Half a year had passed, and I put it all behind me until I get to school, and I see on my locker that Stacy has made a drawing for me and taped it onto my locker saying, Happy Birthday. I took the drawing off and shoved it into my locker and completely forgot about it for the rest of the day until it was nighttime and all my friends had come over to my house. Stacy texts me and asks why I didn't say thank you for the drawing. I apologized and said that I had a lot going on that day. She accepted it 
and I thought that was the end of that. I was wrong again. I woke up in the morning to multiple texts telling me how I was wrong for not saying thank you, and at that point I'd finally had enough and just blocked her. Nearing the end of the year, we were assigned an essay about a lesson we'd learned in our life. It was a pretty easy assignment, until I realized we had to present it in front of the whole class. Now my school was small, there were only about 40 kids to a grade, and each grade was split up in half, so it wasn't the worst thing to present in front of everyone, until it was. The day arrived that we had to present our, this I believe essay, and when Stacy waddles up to the front of the classroom and says her essay title is, Love is a Delicate Matter, I thought to myself, what if this is about me? It was. The whole essay, top to bottom, was about her confessing her love for me, literally no joke, and in the end, completely slandering me by calling me a jerk that was never worth liking to begin with. The worst part about this was how quickly word traveled in school. There were no secrets. Everyone knew this girl liked me all the way back in 7th grade. It was, and is, one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had to sit through. Not to mention, she got a standing ovation, people were crying, my friends were all laughing their asses off, and the teachers were too. I only had one thought the rest of the day. What just happened? Now, I thought this was the end of it. I was wrong a third time. A couple of years pass, and nothing crazy has happened since until my junior year. A good buddy of mine told me he needed to talk to me and that it was important, so I said yes, and eventually we meet up in the stairwell, and he tells me that Stacy has made a play about us in middle school. Yeah, that's right, a play to present in front of a whole crowd. I was baffled. This girl made her whole upbringing about a middle school crush. Turns out they made a video of the play, and I finally got to watch that this year. It was terrible, and I mean I wanted to pull my eyes out type of bad. I also saved her essay, and that's pretty bad too. Anyway, I just graduated, and hope that I don't have to see this person again. I live in a small town where everyone knows everyone and everything. My sister and I adore film photography, so we were hopping from park to park just this past April to get shots of the spring foliage. My school is located in the middle of the woods just off of a residential area, and down an adjacent road is a beautiful, scenic, mountainous park of about 250 acres with various recreational sections, playgrounds, and also trails. I visited the park to read frequently in isolation, but it was always fairly empty. That day would be no exception, as it was overcast and rainy, and the previous, much more popular parks we visited were devoid of people. On the way to the park, I hit a light that essentially functioned as a stop sign. I lingered just a bit at this light because people tend to cut me off, and another car to my left stopped just a hair after mine. My blinker was on to make a right, and they had no blinker on, so we were going in the same direction. As we climbed the hill toward the park, I glanced in my rearview mirror to find the car hanging back at a snail's pace. A line of cars were jammed up behind it, and I remember questioning why this guy was going 25 to 30 miles per hour when the limit was 45. As the hill crested, I made a left into the park, and lo and behold, it was absolutely empty. Perfect. We passed approximately five parking lots with their respective playgrounds and soccer fields and trails, winding through the hilly terrain before we came upon the parking lot I typically parked in Redden. It was the prettiest part of the land, with tall trees encapsulating the back and sides, and a picturesque view of the mountains and foliage in the front. But today, again, was painfully dreary looking, and although we expected to see more buds and blossoms, the majority of the trees still remained bare. I suggested turning around to my sister, 
until she insisted we explore at the end of the park. I thought it wouldn't hurt, so we continued forward, descended the hill, and came upon a dead end. The road was not very long, with a parking lot to the right, and one all the way at the end to the left. It was as we were going down the road that I absentmindedly glanced in my rearview mirror. The car. It had been following me distantly as to remain out of sight, but as we approached this dead end, it suddenly sprang into view. Thoughts began to flood. Who also goes to an isolated park on a rainy day? What are the chances that they're going back to the very dead end I am, when there were eight to nine empty parking lots before me, and when there's nothing to do down here? Who is in that car? Please be a woman and her kids. Please be a woman and her kids. Please. The entrance to the lots was the width of one car, framed by deep ditches on both sides. I kept thinking, if I pull into the lot and park, that car can block me in at the entrance, and if I try to escape another way, my car will plummet into the ditch. At this point, this is all coming out as incoherent frantic babbling to my sister. I swing into a lot, and as the car continues towards us, I quite literally floor it in a whiplash-inducing crescent and book it out of the way I came. Now, I'm creeping up the incline as this car descends, and at one point we're perpendicular, stealing a look at the individual inside. A 45-50 to 50 year old man. I frantically climb down the hill and we're now, luckily, a good distance away. The hill's elevation offers us a clear view of the car, and I instruct my sister to keep a vigorous watch as I continue driving. She reports him to pulling into the center of the last lot as if to park, remaining rather still, but still veering ever so slightly to the left, as if to turn around. I'm shaking and checking my rearview mirror obsessively as we exit the park, descending the road we initially traversed. It's when I'm nearing that very light the car tailed me from that I glance back and, in its usual fashion, the same car makes its slow, obscure approach. At this moment, my sister receives a well-timed call from my father. We inform him of the situation and he questions us, but we are absolutely certain and insistent. He remains skeptical. I turn on my blinker to make a left. The car follows adrenaline and panic surging. I begin racing down the road with the intent to sandwich multiple cars between us and expand the distance. I make multiple loops around my town to assure I'm safe, and this continues for a good 20 minutes. Until it works, I lose him. I have combed through sex offender registries of my town and neighboring ones and have attempted to identify his car, but no luck. I can find no trace of this man. I mentioned previously that my town is very small, so I'm always cautious on the road, especially when approaching that light at the same time of day. I haven't returned to that park since, but I am plagued with questions. What was this man planning to do? My car had a very visible parking pass of the school my sister and I attend, and I fear he intends to target us or one of the other students someday. After all, the school is not very far from that very park. Every time I see a similar car, my heart drops to my stomach. So, to the middle-aged man that trailed me for miles, let's not meet. Ten years ago, my ex and I were struggling for money and ended up moving into a cramped old flat in a 1920s hotel that had been converted into flats. We initially were offered the second floor flat, but despite being nicer, there was this air of dread in it. We both felt very uncomfortable in it, like we shouldn't be there. So we ended up taking the first floor flat. Within a month of us living there, a young girl moved in above us. She screamed, banged, and came in and out at odd hours. My ex would bang on the ceiling, and she'd stop for a bit before starting up again. We complained, and then three months later, it stopped for the most part. 
We still heard heavy, slow stomps on the ceiling, closing doors, and an occasional low moan. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as before, and only really happened at night, so we just gave up trying to get her to shut up. One night, we were laying in bed about to sleep, when the stomping began. It started quiet, before getting louder and louder, until it was right above our heads. My ex lost it. He went upstairs and banged on her door. No answer. He came back downstairs, and when it continued, he banged on the ceiling, shouting, Shut the hell up. We've had enough. It stopped, and we finally got some sleep. The next day, I was complaining to the ground floor resident, Emma. She looked confused, then told me the girl had abandoned the flat a month ago, just up and left during the night. I told her I must have been mistaken, but my ex and I were very confused. I reported it to the landlord, who said he'd been doing minor repairs, but only during the day, and that he would change the locks in case the girl had been coming and going. Things settled for a bit, but then weird things started happening. Keys left on the side would disappear and show up in the kitchen drawer. Doors would be open when I swore I closed them. I was having mental health issues at the time, and my ex told me I must have been doing it so I just left it. I stopped mentioning the weird occurrences because he wasn't very supportive and he always blamed me for them. Then it happened. I was alone, cooking in the kitchen with my headphones in. I remember it was stormy outside and the wind was whipping up against the window panes. Suddenly, I got this eerie feeling that I should run, so I took out my headphones and looked into the lounge. Nothing. Still, the feeling persisted, and I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I needed to pee, but to get to the bathroom, you had to go into the bedroom. Something told me not to go, to run, but I ignored it and went to the bedroom and opened the door. It was dark, but I could plainly see someone sitting on our bed. I shut my eyes, hoping it was just tiredness or my mental issues, but no. There she was when I opened my eyes. My hand was stuck on the door handle, and my whole body froze, when suddenly the person started turning their head towards me. I can see her face now, grayish blue, black where the eyes should be, a mass of long black hair down her shoulders. I screamed, ran out of the flat and downstairs, crying and hysterical. I banged on Emma's door and she let me in. As she calmed me, her husband went to check the flat, but said no one was there. I was too scared to go back up, so I sat with Emma until I calmed down. My ex came home and we went back up. He asked me why I was so anxious. I lied and said it was the storm. I felt I couldn't tell him. He would either laugh or say I was a psycho. I went to the doctor and told him about it and a month later I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and given medication. I saw the woman once more in the mirror behind me, but I just shut my eyes and walked out. I told myself it was just my bipolar and that soon the meds would work. Three months later, we moved into another house. We were chatting about how happy we were to be rid of the place and how creepy it had been. When my ex laughed nervously and said he hoped the woman hadn't followed us. My blood froze, and I asked him what he meant. He told me that a few times he'd woken up to see a woman with a gray face and no eyes standing at the end of our bed, staring at me. He was in a bad place at the time and assumed it was night terrors. I remember one night where he woke screaming and dashed to turn on the lights. He said it was a nightmare but he now told me it was because he'd woken to the woman lying above me, almost parallel, staring at me. As I said before, I had never told him about her. We laughed it off, but I was creeped out for a while. A few years ago, Emma popped up on my social media. We got chatting and the topic of the woman came up. She didn't laugh. Instead, she told me, that she heard that the flat above us used to be rented by an elderly lady decades before who had drowned in the nearby lake just days after her husband left her for another woman. 
I asked her why she hadn't said anything at the time, but she said I'd been so hysterical at the time that there was no point upsetting me further. I still think about this sometimes. I've been medicated for years and manage my symptoms well. I don't really believe in the paranormal. It seems a bit far-fetched, but I still sometimes wonder whether that woman was a shared hallucination or something much, much worse. I went camping with some new friends once, and one demanded he not share a tent with anyone because he sleepwalks. After we'd already made the plans that he would share a tent with one friend, while my girlfriend and I would have our own, we said whatever. I was kind of pissed off about it, but left it so we could still enjoy the weekend. My girlfriend and I shared an awkward tent with basically a random person. That night, I was woken up by my girlfriend who said, Chris's friend is freaking me out. So I looked outside the tent, and the guy is just walking in circles. I told her he sleepwalks, so we just need to keep an eye on him and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. About 30 seconds later, he starts screaming, hello, at the top of his lungs, and that goes on for a while, just standing there in the middle of the campsite, screaming. At this point, we're all awake and watching him like what the fuck. Then he turns towards the woods, screams hello, and points his pistol into the nothingness. Luckily, it was away from us. Now, up to this point, I didn't even know he brought his firearm. So, I went ahead and got mine out too, because I was thinking like, shit, he's going to sleep shoot us. But he doesn't. Instead, he put it down, got into his tent, and went immediately back to sleep. The next morning... I asked him what the fuck he was doing. It turned out he was not asleep, and he thought he heard coyotes, so his first thought was to wander off by himself into the night instead of waking any of us up. I never camped with him again. A few years later, he made the news for scaring the shit out of an entire campsite one night because he was running through the woods and shooting his firearm erratically because he saw Bigfoot and was trying to track him down. He was a really weird guy. This happened to me a while back. I was roughly 16 and just couldn't sleep. At 2 a.m. I heard this loud noise that made me jump. I'd never heard a noise quite like it. The sound was a cross between a giggle and a scream. I paused my show and turned on the light. There was nothing there, though. As I turned around to go back to my bed, I saw what looked like a shadow of a woman standing in the hallway. I froze. Did she see me? She began to walk towards my room, which was the opposite end to my parents' room, so I was worried that she was going to come and get me or something. As she got closer, I backed away from the door and started to go towards the left side of my bed. Next to my bedside table, I keep a bat for self-defense. I grabbed a bat and hid behind the side of my bed, praying the woman hadn't seen me. After about a minute, there were footsteps going down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief and got up, going back to close my door. As the door closed, it hit my toe. Now these doors were heavy, and back then I was a proper Slim Jim. I had no padding, so when the door hit my toe, I let out a quiet, shit. At that point, I realized what I had done. The lady's head whipped around, and we locked eyes. She came back up the stairs and came heading towards my room. I tried my best to shut my door, but before I could, she got her foot into it. Your father said everyone was asleep. Why are you up? My mouth opened but words wouldn't come out. I was terrified. The lady pushed open my door, thrusting me to the floor. You were gonna forget that you ever saw me, young man, and you're going to go straight to bed. Do you understand? Suddenly, I heard my parents' bedroom door open. I shouted out, and in comes my dad. Shh, 
Indigo, for goodness sake. You're gonna wake up your brothers. Sandra, I thought you were leaving. I stopped for a moment. You know this creepy witch. My dad gave me the, if I could scream at you right now I would look, and told the woman to leave. You were not to tell your mother about this, Indigo. Go to bed. The next morning I woke up and figured what had happened. My dad was having an affair. My mom traveled a lot with work, so he was probably sleeping with the Sandra person every time she was away. That pissed me right off. Luckily my mom was back once I woke up, and so I thought she deserved to know. I wasn't going to tell her directly yet though. I wanted to see if I could pressure my dad into it first. So dad, fun night last night. He almost choked on his breakfast. He didn't break though. My mom asked what I was talking about, and he just said he went out with some friends for some beers, and by the time he got home, everyone was asleep. In the end, he never told her. So the next time she went away and Sandra came and slept with my dad, I told her, and they got a divorce. This happened last holiday season. It was my first Christmas with my partner, so we were hanging out and telling each other our personal and family traditions so we could do them together. I brought up hot cocoa and peppermint schnapps, and he said he'd never had it before. It's hands down one of my favorite parts of winter, so I excitedly said we had to try it and offered to go just down the street to the liquor store for a small bottle of schnapps. The liquor store is less than a mile from his house, and it has an overhang in a parking spot near the door. I was just running in quickly, so I parked there. As I got out of the car, I noticed a homeless man going through a dumpster about a hundred feet away. I didn't think much of it. It's the low California desert, and unfortunately homelessness is very common. I grabbed the schnapps and walked out of the store, but as I turned to go to my car, I saw the homeless man suddenly start speed walking right towards me. I was maybe 10 feet from my car, but at this point, so was he. I freaked out and bolted to my driver's side door, and he does the same. I jumped in as quickly as I could and slammed the door as he was getting to it, but my purse stopped it from closing all the way. I felt the door was partially latched though. So I hit the button that locked all the doors and quickly pulled it closed the rest of the way, just as this man started pulling on the door to open it. He was right by my window, so close I could see his bulging eyes in the dark, and he started trying to say something to me. I kept yelling no as I started the car, and I was able to get away. I haven't gone back to that liquor store since. I just don't want to meet him ever again. I recently quit my job at a fast food chain after working there almost 10 months. This story is part of the reason why I didn't want to stay much longer. I worked the drive through from 5pm to 11pm almost every weekend. Seeing regulars was not uncommon for me, and I would even memorize most of their orders and fill it out as soon as I heard their voice. Most were very polite and occasionally tipped, but on one particularly busy day, there was an unfamiliar, weary presence. I had just started my shift, so I was running food to the window. I made eye contact with the man at the window in his car and immediately felt uneasy. I brushed it off because we were busy and I had work to do. My manager set up my cash drawer. I took over drive through orders and payments and whatnot. There were lots of orders, so I wasn't paying special attention to specific voices or menu choices. But one did catch my attention. It was a low, hesitant voice asking for a sandwich. I give the man the total and he waits in line. He arrives at the window and it's the man from earlier. I assumed he just forgot to order something. Now, his car was pretty low to the ground, 
so he had to extend his arm out to hand me his debit card. As he does this, he mumbles something under his breath without breaking eye contact with me. I'm sorry, what was that? I question. I said, you're looking beautiful today. At this point, I'm really uncomfortable. Not only do I have a boyfriend, but I'm also underage, and I'm not interested at all. Oh, uh, thank you, I say nervously. I handed him the bag of food and quickly shut the window until he drove away. I half-heartedly complained about him to some co-workers, as we usually do with weird customers, but I still had a strange gut feeling. A little while later, when the average wait in our line was about 10 minutes, I hear a familiar voice over the mic asking for a cup of water. It was low, but agitated and forceful. I saw his face through the windshield and walked away from the window so my manager would take care of him. This happened a couple more times that day, asking for straws and other free things. At this point, I was sure that he was just trying to look at me. I was so frustrated with him and the rest of my work day that I went to the bathroom and cried. I usually have pretty thick skin when it comes to this stuff, but I was just so over it. The rest of the night went on and he didn't make another appearance. I thought I'd probably never see him again, until my very last shift at the store a few months later. We weren't busy that evening, but it was much later in the day than the first encounter. I did not recognize the voice, but I immediately recognized his face and car. I swallowed my pride and took his payment, trying not to make eye contact. I called my manager, and he said that he would give the food out for me. As suspected, the man was back in the drive through not long afterwards for a cup of water. This time I knew better. I sent a male co-worker to the window to get it for him since I was busy anyway. Once given the water, the man asked my co-worker, You guys close at 11 now, right? I was so glad I was getting picked up by my mom that night. I was constantly looking out the windows and making sure he wasn't out there waiting for me. Call me paranoid, but I listen to enough true crime to be overly cautious. I lived in a duplex for a number of years, and pretty much since day one, I'd hear noises like someone moving around upstairs. Only problem, we lived in a single-story building. I figured that even in the worst-case scenario, someone was secretly living in the attic. We'd be able to hear if they ever climbed down into the apartment, as they'd need to step onto a washer-dryer and open squeaky and generally loud accordion doors. One night, our daughter threw up on our bed in the middle of the night. My wife and I slept on the couch, and I hear a loud crunching sort of noise that I can't identify coming from the kitchen right in view of the couch, but I see nothing, mostly because of how dark it was. The next morning, my wife asks if I heard the sounds in the kitchen. I spend a few more nights on the couch to see if I can catch that sound again. It happens multiple times every night, and I finally catch what was making that sound. A rat had been sneaking into the kitchen and just wondering. The noise we heard was the rat entering the kitchen through a gap between wood and metal, then walking on the linoleum. After that, it all made sense, and we started noticing all sorts of other rat noises, like the one in the attic. I used to clean movie theaters. Our shifts would start at 2 a.m. On a slow weekday night, I decided to go out and pick up the trash in the parking lot. It was around 4 to 5 a.m. The theater was also next to a really busy road, so people passing by could see into the parking lot clear as day. I had headphones in and a grabby thing in my hand to pick up gross stuff. When I suddenly get a call from my boss who's inside the building, she tells me that she just saw a truck pull into the parking lot and we weren't expecting any vendors today. 
As she says this, the truck pulls up next to me and stops as the man starts to open the door. There was a clear moment when he started to lean out, and then he saw that I was on a phone call and the grabby thing over my shoulder like a baseball bat. He sees my hands, then looks up at me and says, Looks like it might snow today. He then closes his door and drives off. I'm 100% sure that if my boss didn't call me, the man would have tried to grab me and get me into his truck. I then warned everyone that no one should do the parking lot garbage until it's light out and to always be on alert. I will preface this by saying I'm not a spiritual person. I don't believe in an afterlife or past lives or souls or anything. This experience, however, was weirdly vivid and I still think about it, despite it happening years ago. I had a dream some time ago where I died. I don't remember how, but that's not the part that stood out to me. I ended up in this purgatory slash waiting room type of place, think a dentist's office. There was a lot of white. I remember one of the receptionists trying to sort me into heaven or hell, but I kept trying to tell her this was some kind of mistake and that I shouldn't be there. I explained that I couldn't be dead because my mother, who was going back to school at the time, would miss me and all her efforts to improve our life would have been for nothing. She sent me away to try and cope. I don't remember much else of the middle then, but I do remember before I woke up from the dream, the same receptionist lady placed her hand on my shoulder and said, don't let your mother's hard work go to waste. I woke up immediately after that. Like I said, I'm not a spiritual person, but if I die and wake up in some dentist's office, I would not be surprised. I used to mess around this massive property that consisted of three gigantic factory buildings right next to a big strip mall plaza. It was pretty popular because the cops never cared enough to patrol, so the whole place was completely covered in really amazing graffiti. Once our group of nine visited, just after a tropical storm that knocked out power in most of the state, we thought it'd be cool to go stargaze up on the roof. To get up, you have to crawl through this partially collapsed passageway and then climb three stories up on an old ladder. A few minutes after we all got up, a waterlogged section of roof started collapsing and we all had to scramble on top of each other to get down the ladder, with a few people basically falling part way down. We managed to crawl out the passageway part just as some metal parts of the roof started crashing down. We decided we probably shouldn't stick around and find out how much water damage the storm had done. We still continued to visit it for several years until the property changed hands and a security guard was hired to watch over it. But we never dared to go on that roof again and definitely never went after rainstorms. I worked on ships. There was one night I was on a ship sailing through Alaskan waters. It happened to be my first night ever seeing the Northern Lights. I can't believe how awesome that was. It made the sky clear. It made the night look like it was dusk. We were able to see clearly for miles. A few buddies and I hit the roof, or what we call it, Lido deck at 1am just to gaze at it. An hour or so in, there were six of us on top nearly the entire crew now. A big white spotlight shines at us. We were near land, but where the spotlight was was above the water, and it wasn't low enough to be on a ship. This was very high up. It shined on us for about 15 to 20 seconds. Once the light turned off, we looked to see what it was. We saw nothing. No trace of an aircraft or anything. A couple of minutes go by and the same light shined on us, this time it was on the other side of our vessel, above mountains, still unable to see what it was. We all saw it. We all have never seen any aircrafts hovering above these waters, especially at 2am. 
We didn't know what it was. We think it might have been some sort of silenced aircraft that the military was probably doing drills or something with. But anyway, that was one of the weirder things to happen out on the ocean. This one is my brother's experience, not mine, but I'm somewhat partly involved with it. A couple of decades ago, when I was still in elementary school in my home country, it was just a normal day at school. I came home to my mom's clinic after school with my brother. I usually go home with both of them after my mom closes shop every evening, but this particular day, I told my mom that I'd be going home early, so I left my brother and mother behind at the clinic. I got home and dusk came and darkness had fallen. I'm starting to become curious as to why they hadn't arrived home yet. After another hour, I'm starting to get worried, wondering if something bad had happened. All three of us normally come home before nightfall, and it was just very odd that they hadn't gotten home yet. I was scared shitless, having endless thoughts of what could have gone wrong. As a kid in elementary school, I couldn't handle the stress and I started crying like crazy. Midnight struck and they were still missing. Finally, at 2 a.m., I hear a knock on the front door and I quickly rush to open it. I'm usually scared to open the door this late, but I couldn't care less. I just wanted my brother and my mother to be the two humans knocking. I opened the door and I saw two pale figures. My mom and my brother were soaking wet, barefoot, and they were shaking like crazy. I couldn't even fathom what had happened and we just stared at each other for a good few minutes until I finally broke the silence with, what happened? My mother told me the most fucked up story. They rode a passenger bus around evening time after closing shop and everything was going well, until near the end of the trip. While on the bus, they heard a couple of loud thuds just underneath the bus, making the whole vehicle shake a bit. They heard metal scratching through concrete and all. The bus had to stop, and in my country, the roads are very dark with no lighting, so they had to resort to flashlights brought by the driver and conductor. The driver was the first one off the bus with the flashlights to check what could have happened and inspect the underside of the bus. He got back inside with a face that looked like he was about to puke, and he asked everybody to get off the bus and find another way to get home. My brother and mother got off, and they peeked under the bus only to realize there was the mangled body of a motorcyclist underneath the bus. It was dark, but with the help of some flashlights, they could see flesh, brains, blood smeared on the concrete. There was a lot that meshed with twisted metal underneath the bus. My mother and brother told me the bus hit a motorcyclist, and the person went under, crushing and smearing the motorcyclist between the bus and the concrete. I could not sleep that night, and neither could my mother or brother. The next morning, just as we were trying to heal from what had happened and all the trauma, my aunt broke the news to us later that following day that her husband never got home that night. The mangled body under the bus was my uncle's. I still hurt every time I recall this story. I'm shaking as I type and share this with you all. God bless. And please tell everyone in your family you love them, because you never know what tomorrow will be like. It happened two months ago in Poland. I dropped off my friends at the airport and was driving alone back home, which takes approximately 50 minutes. It was between midnight and 1am since their flight was delayed and I wanted to make sure they boarded the plane. I live in a metropolitan area of a few cities, so the way back can go either through highway, express road or slow roads crossing the city centers. About a third of the journey on the highway, I noticed that there was a car driving behind me for a while now and occasionally getting too close to my bumper although there were two more lanes on which they could easily have overtaken me if they wanted to. I got a weird feeling, 
so I decided to switch to the slow roads in the city center. The car continued to follow me. I didn't get a look at the driver because I was trying to memorize the license plate. Still, I thought maybe I was being paranoid. To make sure, I decided at a roundabout that I'd go around twice, and maybe, if that person is also just on their way home, they'd turn on the road they're supposed to go on. They didn't. They kept following me. So to be double sure that I'm not imagining things, I did the trick with the roundabout again after a few more minutes. As they continued to follow me, I started to really freak out. My phone was dead. I couldn't call the police or even my girlfriend to ask the neighbors to wait for me in the front of the building. I started thinking about just driving as long as my car would allow it. And I noticed that luckily I have a full tank of gas. Then I thought, gas station. The gas station is not far from my home. There's always at least two people during the night shift. I know most of the workers and they have cameras everywhere. I parked close to the entrance, right in front of the camera. So did that car, but a bit further away, outside of camera range. A man got out, going my direction. I ran into the gas station, screaming that the person out there has been following me, and that I needed help. When I got inside the building, I noticed the man get back into his car and drive away. The employees at the gas station helped me calm down and get home safely a few hours later. But since then, I look over my shoulder all the time. Especially when I'm driving alone and obsessively memorizing license plate. So, to that driver, let's not meet. As a child and young teen, I lived in a very strange situation in the woods. I'm not sure if this encounter may have been some kind of entity, or perhaps something different. I hope someone can give me more information about what happened to me and my friend. I was around 12 years old at the time, and my best friend Alex must have been 10. Alex's father had purchased a large amount of forested land around 100 kilometers away from the city we lived in. It was all forest when Alex's family acquired it. They cleared a little patch to build a house, and the rest was pure, unadulterated forest. Their land was cut in two by a dirt road that, if you followed it for several kilometers, led to a few houses, and their land was very different depending on which side of the dirt road you looked. On the right side, where their house was, the forest was light and luminous. Or at least it felt that way. It was not too dense, with little rolling hills, a lovely place to play. On the left side of the road, it was another story. First, there was a deep ditch, perhaps two meters deep, which then became a quite high and steep hill. Weirdly enough, along the long road, the ditch was full of car parts. A set of car wheels here, a door there, a steering wheel way over there all old and overgrown with moss. And over the steep hill, the forest gave off a really bad vibe. It had lots of very tall, dark, coniferous trees with almost black trunks, and the place seemed somehow devoid of light or life. Climbing the hill, there was some sort of swamp there. When we were there, there was this strange pressure we sensed a kind of animal instinct that told us to leave this place. The strange atmosphere was spontaneously obvious to both me and Alex, and we playfully called that side of the road Demon's Forest. One weekend day, probably in 2001 or 2002, my family and I came to visit Alex's family. Bored by the adults, my friend and I decided to go play in the forest. Alex's father told us to watch out, there was an animal that had been rummaging in their trash bin and causing other nuisances. He said it was a dog that looked somewhat like a Rottweiler that surely belonged to someone living up the dirt road. He warned us that we shouldn't interact with the dog if we saw it, as it didn't look healthy as far as he could tell, or something was weird about it. He said it somehow looked diseased or contagious, or had patches of fur missing, I can't remember exactly. 
and so we set out on our walk. It was autumn, and the leaves were pretty and golden, many having already fallen to the ground. It was a calm, slightly overcast, windless day. The air was very still and calm. Alex and I decided to walk along the dirt road, with the pleasant section of the forest to our right, and Demon's Forest to our left. We chatted while following the road as it was rising up a slope. As usual, we were slightly creeped out going up that road because of the weird vibes of the forest to the left side. But we were challenging ourselves to be brave and trying not to really think about how unsettling it felt. A good distance away from their home, when it was already well out of sight, I noticed the first strange thing of the day. Out of the steep hill on the left side of the road, there was a very large and dark pine tree hanging over the road. Someone had attached a pink ribbon to one of the branches. The strange thing was, the ribbon was flailing strongly in the wind. Its loose ends were flapping almost horizontally. Here's the thing. It was a completely windless day. There was no wind to speak of. The ribbon was within my reach, so I even touched it as it was flailing. I even licked my finger and held it in the air to check if I could feel any wind or air current at all, as my dad had taught me. The air was perfectly still, yet the ribbon flailed. I mentioned it to my friend. He seemed distracted and he was younger than me and sometimes didn't catch on to what I said, so I didn't press the matter. We continued our climb. We reached a place where the hill on the left side of the road had a gentler slope, and began further away from the road. In fact, it looked as if the hill was kind of carved out in a way that would have made it easy for us to climb to get into Demon's Forest. It almost seemed as if the hill was carved in a sloping circle, like in a theater, and the road we stood on would have been the stage. It gave us a very clear, treeless view of the hillside, full of golden and red fallen leaves. The trees began at the top of the hill, maybe nine meters higher. We stopped to admire the view. Canadian autumns are a sight to behold. Alex suddenly got really excited. He thought he heard something in the demon's woods up the hill, and he really wanted me to pay attention. He explained that there are wildcats in that forest. They had spotted them with his dad. One of them had reportedly had kittens. Kittens being one of the most exciting things in the world for kids our age, getting us all riled up. But somehow, my hackles were up, and I couldn't really relax, even thinking about adorable wild kittens. He actually thought he had heard the cat meow in the forest, up the hill close by. He vehemently suggested that we try meowing at it to see if it would respond. Maybe it would even bring its kittens along and we could see them and play with them, he said. I hadn't heard any sounds at all, and I really didn't like his idea of screaming meows into the creepy forest. What kind of wild cat would respond to human children anyway? Wouldn't it be obvious that we are not cats by the sound of us? That seemed like a dumb idea to me. Before I could try to talk him out of it, he loudly meowed into the forest. To my utter shock, the forest meowed back. Alex was delighted. He meowed again. Something in the forest answered again. I was actually shocked. This didn't make much sense to me. It creeped me out, but I suspended my disbelief to see what would happen. He kept meowing over and over. For every one of his meows, there was one coming back in response from the woods. Something felt off to me. Feral or wild animals didn't behave that way. Even at 12 years old, I realized that, and it wasn't an echo. The cat did not bounce back any sound that we threw at it except meows, which it reciprocated immediately. And anyway, there were no hard rocky surfaces around off which sound could bounce off of. Everything was covered in a soft layer of sound-dulling leaves. Alex got even more excited. Listen, the cat is coming towards us. She's coming to see us with her kittens. To my surprise, he was right. There was a rustle of dead leaves coming from above us, from above the slope in the creepy forest. It seemed like the rustling was getting closer to us, but it was way off. 
because cats are small and light and careful with their steps. They don't make a ruckus when they walk through the woods, but here, the rustling leaf sounds were extremely obvious, along with the meowing, and in fact, it sounded more like steps, like someone with two legs walking in the leaves, and it was getting closer to us. My alarm signals were starting to go off with all the wrongness of it all, while my younger friend was oblivious. He was calling it more vehemently, noticing that it was coming towards us. Then I realized what seemed so wrong. The sound was coming towards us, but there was nothing to be seen. Right in front of us, we had the gently sloping hill, treeless and clearly visible. Anything coming from the forest should have been plainly exposed to view. There was nothing, no source for the rustling sound, nothing moving. Oh, her kittens are joining her. Listen, there are more sounds. They're coming to play with us. He was right. The walking sounds seemed to have multiplied and now came from various directions all at once, ever getting closer with nothing being visible. Something was way off. I wanted to leave, but Alex was getting mad at me. The kittens were almost here and he wanted to see them, he insisted. At this point, it was extremely tense and fight or flight was activating from the wrongness of it all. We were alone and quite exposed on this, theater stage to whatever was getting closer to us, which was, more and more obviously with every movement, decidedly not kittens. I was on the verge to force him to go run home, and then suddenly... I heard a very loud panting sound right at my feet. During the first millisecond, I got only mildly surprised. We had a huge husky at home. I was used to it panting next to my feet. But then, a sense of profound dread downed on me as I realized that, obviously, my dog was not here. And it must be another dog. A very big one by the sound of it. Right at my feet. I looked down in a panic, ready to jump away from the dog that somehow got extremely close to me, almost on me without my noticing. The only thing there is absolutely nothing at my feet, but I still hear the loud, breathy panting sound coming from there. I whirl around all 360 degrees, screaming. Where is it coming from? There's nothing at my feet or anywhere around me. There's nothing there, yet the sound is clearly there. As I whirl about in a frenzy, I look up the dirt road we were following. Around a hundred meters away, at the top of the slope, I see a lone dog standing. It looks somewhat similar to a Rottweiler, but in very, very bad shape. Extremely unkempt, with patches of fur missing, shaggy and dirty as hell, with some skin exposed where the fur is missing. It looks down at us, too. Obviously, there's no way that I could hear it panting at that distance, and the source of the sound is at my feet. And at that point, the flight instinct wins inside me. I have never run as desperately and as fast in my whole life. Thank God it was all downhill. Alex kept pace right beside me, terrified. We made it home in one piece. We never walked in those woods anymore. I went back to Alex's place several times in my life. I never wanted to walk in the woods again. We had amazing parties at his house as teens. I was often there rather drunk and having a great time. But I always had this very stressful sensation when I went out of his house. Especially at night. When I slept over there, I had these extremely strange experiences. Where, when I woke up, I sensed as if. Something was there and was observing me. In my mid-awake state, I even saw something floating near the ceiling. It had a sensation that it was not an immediate threat, though. It was observing. We never discussed what happened that day. I did some research, and I see that this land is historically Algonquin land. If anybody can help clarify what happened... I would be thankful.
So this all started when me and my two buddies went to go fish off this bank on the river in the afternoon. The layout is that you drive over this levee before you drop down into a boat ramp slash parking area right next to the river. We brought pizza, beer, weed, music, and of course our rods, hoping we'd just hang out and do some late night fishing. At this point, we're all set up on the bank with our chairs and speaker having a nice evening, and it's probably been two hours. It's 9pm now. All three of us were feeling good with some beers in our system, and then we all of a sudden hear two cars with really loud music pull up, and everyone gets out. The car must have had four to five people in each of them, because I heard a lot of people talking, but it was all in Spanish, so I couldn't make anything out. We try to ignore it, but then it gets really loud that we couldn't enjoy ourselves, so we start packing our stuff to head back to the car and just chill out while we sober up. While we're gathering our things, we start to hear what sounds like an argument go down. We start to hear lots of glass shattering and people screaming at the top of their lungs. At this point, we're just keeping quiet, and then you start to hear what sounded like someone getting punched repeatedly, and then a loud splash into the river by the boat ramp, and someone saying, Nah, leave him, leave him, which were the only words spoken in English. At this point, we didn't know what we just heard happen, and we didn't want to stick around and find out. The three of us trekked back up the steep incline to get back to the car, but as soon as we came into their view, they all got back into the two cars and quickly sped over the levee, except we spotted one of the cars just sitting on top of the levee, slowly creeping forward. When we turned our car on, that car then went fully over the levee, we realized we were the only car left in the parking lot, and it was now pitch black outside, about 9.30. We sat there for no more than 30 seconds, just trying to process what we just heard go down, and then we decided we needed to get out of there completely and park somewhere to sober up all the way. As we're going over the levee, the road goes over it and then down and makes a sharp left. Right after we take that sharp left, our hearts drop when we see four cars lined up, completely horizontal across the road, blocking us from getting through. There's orchards on our left and right, so there was no going around all of it. At this point, my buddy just gassed it straight towards their bumpers to try and split between the cars and get out of there, even if it meant damaging the front end of his car. Just as we do that, one of the four cars slightly moved out of the way, creating a gap. We flew right through it and got out of there, and they were laying on the horn while we passed through. We don't know what their intentions were, but there were clearly two cars in the boat ramp area where we just were at, and two cars on the other side of the levee blocking the road from anyone else coming in. I ended up filing a police report just in case they really did dump a body into the river, but I haven't heard anything back. It's definitely one of my most terrifying experiences. So, to the four cars who may or may not have robbed us, or God forbid killed us, let's not meet. I'm going to tell this story just to make people aware of the dangers they may be putting themselves in by selling items online. I get a message from someone telling me they want to buy a specific item, and from the get-go, the person was pretty pushy. I wanted to make some money, so I responded. The whole time I was talking to this person, something felt off. This guy, Adam, was being a little bit weird from the first message. Adam kept changing the time they were coming to get the item. Adam asked me if I had change for a certain amount, and I said no. This was before Adam got to my house to pick the item up. I told him he needed to get the change because I didn't have any cash. He ends up showing up and had parked around the corner somewhere I couldn't see the car. And I felt something was off with him because he handed me the incorrect amount and asked if I had change. I had already told him I didn't. He then proceeded to ask me to get in the car so we can go get change. I told him I don't get in the car with strangers. Adam said, Oh, I'm from Europe and we don't worry about getting in strangers' cars. I'm thinking, 
Yeah, okay, but I'm definitely not going to. He also asked me a lot of unnecessary questions about the watch. It was brand new and I'd already told him this, plus it was just an ordinary wind-up watch to set the time. Adam went and got the change, surprise surprise. So when he got back, I could now see the car and there were a few other people in it. I had a really bad feeling, so I just grabbed the money, gave Adam the watch and ran back inside. I don't know. Am I making a big deal over this? A number of years ago, I was up in the northern end of British Columbia in the islands out by Port Hardy. I set up camp right by the beach close to the shore. I did the normal catch a fish and cook it for dinner on the campfire thing. Perfect, really. A few hours pass and it's getting dark. I climb into the tent and fall asleep quickly. I get woken up by extremely heavy breathing on the beach from something big. It was coming from in the area of my fire, but the tide was in now so the waves would have covered it. My first thought is a bear, but on the islands where I was, bears were not common at all, to the point where there hasn't been one documented ever. This is blasting through my mind. But then the urban talk of Bigfoot runs through my mind. At this point, I'm like, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. So what the hell is it? I gain my courage and open my tent. I shine my flashlight around, but I don't see anything. So I get out of my tent. I'm shining my flashlight around when I hear it again. This huge breath, but followed by a small splash. I focus my light on the beach where I see a massive orca rolling around on the kelp right about where my fire was. This behemoth of a marine mammal scared the living shit out of me, but it turned into being one of the most amazing events I've ever witnessed. As I sat watching this massive animal rolling and playing yards from me, I noticed more of them just offshore, bobbing there probably half asleep. Needless to say, I did not sleep after that until they left. My grandparents had an acreage when we were kids, with a cabin my grandfather had built as a sort of getaway spot for his grandchildren. It was a really nice secluded spot that looked over a field and took about five minutes to get to on a quad. On the summer of their 50th wedding anniversary, they had all their friends over to celebrate. Most of them had kids and grandkids who were around my age, 18 at the time, so we all stayed out in the cabin. It was a perfect location to party and smoke and get into trouble for some rural punk kids. There was maybe seven or eight of us in total. Anyway, my one buddy and I stepped out for a smoke and it was fairly dark. This is in southern Manitoba, where around this time of year, it's not fully dark until 11.30pm. I had a flashlight on me and was just generally fucking around until I shined it to the left of me, just off of the porch. A bunch of eyes in the dark. Coyotes. My buddy and I were both six foot two guys, about 200 plus pounds, so I wasn't too concerned, but we knew why they were there. We go back in. Both of us had dealt with coyotes before, so this was nothing new, but it always made me kind of uneasy knowing a bunch of scavenging predators were lurking around. An hour or so later, we go back out for another smoke, and I think, hey, I wonder if the coyotes are out there still. I check again. Holy shit, yes they are. But now they're in the field in front of the cabin, and to the right side as well. We go back in and close the door and turn off the lights. We shine a light out the window and they're practically right there. As far as I could tell, the whole cabin was surrounded by them. We ended up calling it for the night, but the majority of us couldn't fit in the loft upstairs, so some of us slept downstairs. My buddy and I slept on the floor almost in front of the door. You could hear them literally pacing on the front step outside the cabin. Lots of yipping too. Nothing really happened beyond that, and I'm sure they eventually moved on. Come morning, 
There were paw prints everywhere. I'm sure in retrospect, it was just a pack of coyotes, just curious as hell as to why there was a bunch of light and noise coming from a building that was usually abandoned. But good God, was it an unnerving night. I didn't think this was paranormal, but I definitely thought it was creepy, and ended up being more than I bargained for. When I was 13, I had a small jewelry box my mom gave me that had cushions for rings. I had six rings that I kept in it. I was somewhat neurotic as a kid, and it spent an afternoon arranging my room, and I put the six rings in a specific order. I opened the box one day and noticed that two of the rings were out of order. I thought someone in my family had moved them, because there was zero explanation for this. I asked my family if anyone had touched them, and they all insisted that no one had opened the box. I was convinced someone had to have gone through it. My dad ended up going through our entire house checking for missing stuff, and the only missing things were an old bottle of hydrocodone from the medicine cabinet and some of my mom's gold jewelry from a bathroom drawer. It turns out there'd been a string of robberies in the neighborhood where thieves had broken in, but only taken prescription drugs and small gold items. None of the robberies had indications that the homes had been broken into, and things like laptops, diamond jewelry, and other valuables had been left alone. My family wouldn't have known anything was missing, aside from the fact I was so convinced something was off. It's been quite a few years since this happened, so my memory is fuzzy, but I figured I would try to piece some stuff together. This was around the summertime of 2018 or so, so I must have been about 14. My grandma had given me a couple of quarters and told me to go to the community laundry room to get a Dr. Pepper from the vending machine. She offered enough for me to get one as well, and it was still light enough that I could walk down the sidewalk and get back before the sunset if I was quick enough. Getting into the laundry room and getting the soda was easy enough, but as soon as I exited the building, a car idling in the middle of the street caught my eye. It hadn't been there when I had gone in. I was already put off by this, as I had stranger danger drilled into my head for as long as I could remember. The car had rolled down its window. The driver was a young woman with two older men in the back seat. They were looking straight at me and beckoning me closer. I immediately thought, fuck no, to myself, and quickly broke eye contact and made my way quickly back down the street. As if the car knew the complex, they drove alongside me and pulled into the parking spot next to my grandmother's car. They started laughing with each other, still looking at me and whispering about something. At this point, I was terrified out of my little 14-year-old mind. I walked quickly inside my grandmother's apartment locked and bolted the door, and I couldn't sleep for the rest of my visit. Nothing came of it, but I thank my lucky stars every day that I avoided anything more than an unsettling encounter. Now, this happened in a summer camp, but while I was actually working there and also alone in my own shack. For context, it was during the lockdown. I worked in a summer camp in Canada, and the camp, despite being opened, didn't let the kids sleep in the bungalows like it used to. But that was back in 2021, so now they've gone back to the norm, but at the time it was still just us employees who were allowed to sleep there. We'd usually be two in each bungalow, but the girl who was with me that week didn't like to sleep alone with other guys nearby because of stuff that happened to her in the past. It was nothing against me or any of the other guys there, apparently. The fact I was alone doesn't make that much of a difference, since it also affected the other people sleeping there. But being alone that night made it creepier overall. And now it's time for the story. The evening's going as usual so far. The people who stayed to sleep on campus were usually late sleepers, 
while I was more on the early side. I go to my shack, since we usually chill in a bigger building on the camp before going on our separate ways, and while my bungalow isn't the most secluded one of the gang, it's still somewhat far from the rest. Though there were two other guys sleeping in a bungalow pretty close to mine at least. At about 3am, I get woken up by some noise. I don't really pay too much attention to it, because I'm used to hearing wild animals in the woods. But this time, it sounded like something heavy walking around. I've always liked seeing deer and foxes, so I get up to check outside and, uh, someone who's not an employee is walking around in the woods. They saw me, but didn't really do anything creepy other than staring at me. I still ran outside and locked my doors, grabbed my phone and called the boss to tell her that someone's on the camp. She didn't answer the first time, so I called her again. Luckily she answered and I quickly told her about the events. That's when the guy actually knocked on my door, and also the moment I actually freaked out. It happened while I was on the phone with my boss, so she definitely heard the knock. She told me to stay in the bungalow and that she'd call the police right away. I turned on the lights and flashed my phone light outside the window to try and see if I could see his face, but the guy ran away before I could. I'm assuming it was a guy because the person was well built and had short hair, but who knows, they could have been a woman. Police arrive about 10 minutes later, I'll skip the details, but they just searched up the area and didn't find anything. They questioned me, I told them as much as I could remember. But I learned about a year later from a friend working there too that they didn't find anyone who could potentially be the intruder. In the end, we all went to sleep at about 5am. The next day got cancelled because everyone had barely slept that night. Nothing of the sort happened again after that. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keaton, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, 
Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.